Unity is really the search for history and the search for definition. And if I might just have a, blue, a few preliminary words, I'll, I'll get on the, on the way. I want to know um, our, our personal laws in a voice like John Killen and then a voice like James Baldwin. I want to know it's because a people need spokesmen and they need people who search out what is needed and what John Killens called long distance runners. People who can go all the way and go that extra mile. Both John Killens and James Baldwin were unique as writers. John Killens always chose subjects for his novels neglected by others and mostly Baldwin. Baldwin did something in his novels that made him a monumental figure in the literature of this nation. He restored the personal essay as a literary form. The personal essay had gone out of style in literature. No one was writing the personal essay well enough for it to hold up <coughs> as literature. In writing about his personal problems, he wrote about universal problems. And yet the vantage point from which he wrote was James Baldwin growing up in the Harlem community, trying to resolve the difficulty of being black in a nation that promises so much to his people and delivers so little. He died at home, away from home. And his death in Paris, raises, his death in France, raises a question why so many of our writers, Richard Wright, and so many of our artists, Henry Tanner and others, why so many of them have to leave the United States to find enough peace in order to write. In one of my last conversations with him at Cornell University, he said there's something about the United States that eats into a person's manhood and he don't feel a whole man in this country. And he have to leave the country to find an intellectual home in order to put his writing down. Sometimes he thinks out things in America but and leave America in order to write them. Nearly all of his books were written abroad where he had enough peace of mind in order uh, uh, to write. All right, now after this lecture, the last lecture, and I will be here for it, will be called The Lonely Nation Away From Home. It will be solely about black America. And what is so unique about black America and what is so misunderstood because the black American is really the loneliest of African people outside of Africa, the most misunderstood people outside of Africa, generally misunderstood by other African people because the nature of the oppression in the United States had made something cruelly unique 
about the plight of the black America that other African people have not only not understood but hadn't even sympathized with. And so many times other African people join with whites in condemning or passing judgment where judgment is not in order, where understanding is in order. We inherited, and I've said this before, the worst of the oppressors. I've also said that Europe dumped its human garbage can into the Western world and this nation got the worst of that garbage can. The other oppressors, first place, they'd been oppressors before, and they developed some style and technique in, oppress in, in oppression. This nation still has no style and technique. It's very crude and no manners. And the black American had to face something that others have not had to face. Years ago, when I first went to Haiti, and I felt a liberation, I said, at last I'm in a country where black people rule. I can sit any place I want to on the bus. The fact that it was some of the most uncomfortable buses I've ever sat in on my life didn't matter at all. The important thing, I could sit in the place I pleased on an uncomfortable bus, and it wasn't uncomfortable to me because I could sit in any place I pleased. I could look at a policeman, he was black. The fact that they were some of the most corrupt, head-beating policemen in the world, I didn't know. And, I didn't take into consideration they were just as brutal as any other police in the world. But the fact they were black intrigued me. When I came out of the South, every white person was a policeman. Any white person can beat your head. Now this is not generally true in the Caribbean Islands, not generally true in Africa. I'm not saying that there's no oppression there. There is oppression there. It's of a different nature, but it's still oppression. Slavery in the Western world, African slavery, started in the Caribbean. In fact, the slaves were taken to the Caribbean to be broken before they were sent to the United States for well over 100 years before America began to develop the kind of shipping that would go directly to Africa and pick up slaves other than to buy them from that market. All right. Now, indirectly into the subject, I have been preparing all week a short history of Pan-Africanism, which is a history of unity. And I have been examining a lot of interesting phenomena that I have been looking at through the years and talking to the creators of it through the years. Fortunately, of the three great Pan-Africanists who came from Trinidad, I knew two of them personally, and one's still alive. And I talked to him, I argued with him, no later than last year, C.L.R. James. I knew Padmore in Ghana when he was advisor to uh, Nkrumah. In examining the trends of Pan-Africanism that actually started in the Caribbean, and yet, though it started in the Caribbean, Pan-Africanism had, uni had, uni had unified one island in the Caribbean. Although the theory starts there, principally because the greatest theoreticians the Caribbeans have ever produced are generally driven out of the Caribbeans and they generally function away from home. Now, at the conference on Marcus Garvey in Jamaica a few weeks ago, I delivered a paper on state formation 
in the 20th century as advocated by Marcus Garvey. I was pointing to his finest gift and why he became popular and other men advocating approximately the same thing did not inject that one ingredient, the control of a state or uh, the state. And he, he introduced the concept of state formation. And introducing the state, the concept of state formation, he also dealt with how we lost the nation state. This is what I began to talk about tonight's lecture. The nation state and how we lost it. And if we're ever going to have unity again, have a correct perception of our history again, we're not only going to have to know what the nation state is, but how we controlled a nation state without any assistance from other people and how we were not only lost the nation state but how we lost the concept that we once had the nation state and were programmed into dependency. And this came principally through the laws of the history of a people. And one of the things Marcus Garvey was trying to restore was that concept of history that made you believe again in your ability to control the nation state. Now, I said in my talk in Jamaica, it angered a lot of Jamaicans, except the Rastas, because the Rastas agree. I said, Marcus Garvey is 47 years dead. We are hailing him as a national hero. If Marcus Garvey were alive today in Jamaica, there are some Jamaicans who would stone him to death. And so some of the intellects said, no, 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 no. The same day they announced over the radio that they were giving medals to the Jamaicans who participated in the invasion of Grenada. Nothing could be more anti-Marcus Garvey than for one black nation to crush the freedom of another black nation. That single eye was so anti-Garvey, it was figuratively stoning Marcus Garvey to death, taking him out of the grave. Because I had said in a previous lecture, <coughs> and almost had to fight my way out of the hall, <coughs> I said, with the election of the Bostonian con man, the best thing you can do for Marcus Garvey, the most honorable thing you can do for him is to go to King's Park and take his bones out of that grave and throw them into the sea. Because you have dishonored him by saying of all the brilliant minds produced in Jamaica and in the Caribbean islands, there's not one that I think is worthy of ruling over me. And then, soon after, some of the followers of the Bostonian called and said, we know who you are, and if you ever come to Jamaica again, be prepared to go straight from the airport to a Jamaican jail or to a Jamaican undertaker. So years had passed and I had not been in Jamaica again. 
I wasn't prepared to go to a Jamaican undertaker or to a Jamaican jail. <laughs> I arrived happily surrounded by my beautiful and wonderful Jamaican friends, arguing over who I was going to have dinner with the first night, giving me all of the beautiful island hospitality that I had grown accustomed to years ago. finding all the warmth and the gentleness that I had when I lived in Jamaica. I felt no fear at all that anybody was going to do anything to me at all. Went to the university. The Rasta brothers were there, talking sense and nonsense as usual. <laughs> And as you you said, we rascals never been. <laughs> I'm listening as usual with some degree of respect and <laughs> in wonderment. But I wonder how did such a country of wonderful and beautiful people got so mixed up politically when it could be the political jewel of the Caribbean Sea. And I think pr principally because it lost its concept of history. There is a story told about Suma, and an old man years later comes upon the idea, see there's nothing left of the great Sumerians then he asked another, what happened to them? He, and the other old man asked answers. They lost their history and they died. And when a people lose their concept of history, they die politically and culturally. They are in confusion. All right, now let's go back and see what kind of nation state we had before we lost the state. What kind of universities, what kind of scholars. It is hard for you to conceive with all the anti-African propaganda that you were once the masters of a nation state, not only the equal to Europe, but had a university system better than the Europe of that day. Let's go back now to the 1400s when Europe is coming out of its vine after the Crusades. It was a drain on European talent, drain on European money, drain on that treasure although they were rapers and robbers and brought a whole lot of wealth back into Europe. But the cost of the crusade was so high, the net loss was far in excess of what they had gained. Now, this period is over. Famines, plagues have taken one third of the population of Europe. The European had not discovered or developed the regular use of soap and water. You think he is antiseptically clean, always been that way. You should study a book called Dirt, which deals with the history of sanitation or the lack of it in Europe. All right, now, when Europe learns how to build ships again, when they go out into the world again to replenish their food supply, their energy supply, they have to take it from other people. The other people being unsuspecting are surprised and are defeated. 
Now they have to create a rationale, a reason for having done so. Because you cannot successfully oppress a historical people. So you've got to take most of the world out of history. So you have to forget what they did for you. You have to try to forget a rationale, a rationale, what you did to them. And so the great states in inner West Africa called the Western Sudan are going. They have to forget Timbuktu. They have to forget the great educational centers, especially Sankori, one of the great universities of the world of that day. Two universities, Sankori, Salamanca, and Spain. They have to literally make slaves out of the Africans who had maintained these great universities. Now, what the African people are losing is their concept of history and a place in history. Now, bringing, being brought to the new world, being given a Bible that they did not write, not seeing any image of themselves inside of it, <coughs> they began to have the illusion that they played no role in the involvement of history. Now, it is not until the 1700s that we began to suspect that we have played a role. When we began to suspect we played a role, there is a kind of unity between the Caribbean free man and the African American free man that should exist today that unfortunately does not exist because at this, at that period in history, the Caribbean free man didn't call himself a Western in a Caribbean. The black America didn't call himself an America. Both of them had a unity because both of them called themselves Africans. And both of them saw there was only one interest, and that was the interest of African people. All right, now, because the climate in the West Indies had changed, it had not changed to the point of eliminating slavery, but the craftsmen had gained their freedom and had gained a voice and some mobility. So there began to be a, 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 a traveling Caribbean person. Many of them came to the United States looking for better opportunities. So now, in the 1700s, a man came from Barbados, Prince Hall. He heard all of the talk about liberty and justice, and he assumed that they were talking about us. He assumed wrongly, of course. And he was told, if you own property, you could get justice. So he bought some property. Didn't get any justice. So if he's a preacher, you get justice. Became a preacher, nothing changed. Then he told you, you got to have an organization. So he got himself an organization, applied to the British to get a Masonic order charter, couldn't get it, finally got it from an Irish regiment who was angry with the British. He started the Masonic order, first black Masonic order. Did he call it that? No, he called it the African Lodge. Now this was a responsible organization, not a bunch of liquor lapping hounds that you see today. 
no social climbers, no ladies showing off new dresses. These were responsible people. These were free blacks working toward the freedom of the slaves, meeting for serious reasons. Now, they began to underwrite the first writings about our history. In other words, the first writings about our history had to be subsidized. Prince Hall and his group were wise enough to realize that the writer had no money of any consequence, but he could write well and he knew what he was writing about, so he would give him a little money to sit down and let him finish his book. So many of the escaped slaves sit down in the lodge and finish their, finish their, finish their narrative about their life in slavery. Then they began to have newspapers much later. Peter Ogden from Antigua had found the odd fellow. Now why am I emphasizing the Caribbean input into the early Afro-American freedom struggle? Because they had a little more freedom at this juncture, freedom of movement, than the black America. And they did not use it as proud, arrogant, proud, just came over beating breasts, I got more freedom than you, my slave master is better than you. They didn't use it in that nonsense. They said, well, let me go over and see if I can give you a hand. And that's what they did. These were able able men. So, this continued until the slave narrative became a part of the record of the mistreatment of slaves and a part of early American literature. And the rough, huge slave narratives existed until a better written slave narrative would emerge under Douglas. All of this is a part of the writing of history. There was a slave who had been a slave in the Caribbean Islands and been England because his master traveled and took him because he was a good ballet and he read what he read and he was a very intelligent man, Equiano. Now, you're beginning to have a better written slave narrative, written by literate people, putting down the history of our treatment and the history of the background of the same people in Africa. Equiano's diary, worth reading today, Frederick Douglass's life and time, worth reading today. Now you have the beginning of a telling of the life of misery until in the 1800s, early 1800s, blacks began to demand an even greater voice. Douglas is out there now, the finest voice we produced in that century. The great black ministry is out there. Now, a Jamaican mulatto, John B. Ruswan, and a black American, Samuel Cornish, starts a newspaper, Freedom's Journal. Now, Freedom's Journal becomes the first newspaper and the editorials in that newspaper are better than some of the editorials in newspapers today. Sounder, clearer, more biting. 
after Ruswam had served for a number of years on the newspaper, he went to Liberia with the settlement movement, set up a newspaper called the Liberia Harem. Harem still exists. All the papers still existed. All the papers continue to exist. New papers came on the scene, the Anglo-American uh, a newspaper and magazine. New personalities came on, on the scene. A black American, the first black American novelist appeared, William Wells Brown. He wrote history in his novels, then later wrote general speculative history using the Bible and such history books as he could understand, speculating on the history of Ethiopia. His famous novel, Clotel, the President's Daughter, deals with the numerous offsprings of Thomas Jefferson. Now, Thomas Jefferson's taste for chocolate is too well documented for me to have to get into tonight. He just loved those black women. Good taste, too, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> One, Sally Hamus, is seven children by her. Yet all the time he was speaking about democracy and morality and, and also saying he didn't believe in social equality. There all kind of contradiction. Lincoln said he didn't believe in it either. All right, he signed emancipation for another reason, but we don't have time to get into that. He wanted to weaken the South and end the, uh, the, the Civil War. So now, as we approach the 1850s, another recorder was on the scene. He came to America briefly, couldn't get into schools, and he left. His name was Edmund Viltmont Blyden went to Liberia College, went to Togo and discovered the circumstances of his own family's enslavement, would later write a book in spite of its age, over 100 years old now, and it's still worth reading, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race, wrote an early book on Palestine, one of the early blacks to deal with the Jewish situation. His travels in Egypt, still worth reading. But a little book that is almost as up to date today as it was when he wrote it on African customs. Pointing out the values in African society that we need to use. Edmund Viltmont Blyden, there are several books about him these are books by him. Now, as we approach the 1850s on the eve of the Civil War, we have a few people structuring our history. We have a few poets, Jupiter Harmon, and an unknown poet on Long Island who would write the first poem of satire. I've repeated it before. My old master promised me when he died he'd let me, set me free. Lived so long his head got bald, got out of notion of dying at all. This is the first poem when blacks cast some doubt about the promises that was being made to him. He was a slave on Long Island. They did have slavery in Long Island, while in some parts of New England it was too cold to keep them the year round and they could work their way out. 
certain other places they kept them the year round because they found something for them to do the year round. A brilliant black woman poet appeared in these closing years of the first half of the 19th century. Elaine Wilkins Harper, an anti-slavery speaker, an anti-slavery poet. She wrote poetry depicting the horrors of slavery. In one of her main poems she would read on the platform is, Bury me not in a land of slaves. She wrote a novel dealing with the consciousness of whites in relationship to being a Christian and a slaveholder at the same time. She is forgotten now and her life begs for a good writer to put it all together and do a good biography of her. Elaine Wilkins Harper, one of the forgotten greats. I have not dealt with Phyllis Whitley. I've not dealt with Phyllis Whitley because I have a little prejudice here and I don't want to get into it tonight. I think she, she was too mild with her poem uh, to George Washington and to Lord Willingham. This turned me off to the point where <laughs> But, but what turned me off was the poem when she said that she thanks God for taking her from her pagan land and teaching her Christian heart to understand. Teaching her pagan heart to understand. She don't know she came out of an area that had just as much Christianity or more than she came into. Well, that's enough about uh, uh, poor Phyllis Whitley at the time. Now, on the eve of the Civil War, we had growing newspapers, we had men recording, we had the Colonization Society well recorded, we had well recorded travels, we had a brilliant black novelist and protagonist Martin Delaney. We had a Jamaican, Robert Campbell, who joined him to go out to Nigeria to search for a place. They both wrote books about their respective travels. And if you want the books in the University of Michigan paperbacks, Ann Arbor paperbacks, there's a book called Search for a Place. Martin Delaney's report, Martin was a Harvard man, so it's a Harvard man's report. I mean, all the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed. Robert Camel, a man with limited education, wrote one of the most moving reports ever. Pilgrimage to my motherland. Spiritual feeling visiting Africa again, being an ex-slave, now a free man, free with limitations of course, visiting the continent of his birth. Robert Cameron was Jamaican. I'm talking about a period of intellectual collaboration when Caribbean people didn't think of themselves as West Indians or Caribbean people, when black Americans didn't think of themselves as Americans, thought of themselves as African people. I'm, thinking, I'm talking about a period before someone invented a word called Negro and color. Even someone used the word color, it wasn't widely used. 1829, another great document, a secondhand store owner, pawn shop owner, 
David Walker began to write his famous appeal. And because people pawned their clothes and left them there during the, during the summer, he would put some of the appeals in the coat pocket. And sometimes the sailors way out to sea before he noticed them. This is how the appeal got to England and got published in England. This was David Walker's appeal to the colored people of the world. He was the forerunner of a Malcolm X. He was God's angry man. Now, David Walker recorded the anger and the passion against slavery of the African person of that day. And he might have been the best recorder of that period before the period was over. But the one record that we need to examine, uniquely and creatively phony though it is. Now let me explain what I'm saying. Nat Turner's confession is no confession. Nat Turner was so brilliant. Nat Turner confessed only to those things nobody could do anything about. He named only the people in his group who were already dead or escaped. He did not admit he had a wife and his wife was a secret keeper of the conspiracy. I mean, that was unique. And the white man who took down the confession and who hated his guts kept pestering him. Don't you know you have killed people? People have died. Don't you know you are going to die? And he was waiting to be hung. That time said, yes, I know that. This is, this is, don't you understand what you have done? You have revolted against the government. And that time said, the consequence, as a consequence of revolting against slavery, I knew from the beginning that I might have to die. So aren't you sad about it? Aren't you weeping? But I don't see a tear in your eyes. And you've done this horrible thing. He wanted him to crawl and he said, I'm so sorry, I had to kill you, me and your wife. <laughs> he ain't crawling, he ain't crying. So this man is still pursuing him. They take him to the gallows, put the rope around his neck and this man, you know, aren't you sorry yet, don't you know <laughs> that? Nat Turner looks at him, though he's looking at a piece of dirt, tilts his head while they tighten the rope on him. He said, didn't God die? <laughs> <laughs> die like a man. <laughs> and all this man got from Nat Turner is a phony confession. <laughs> it's not worth anything, because Nat Turner's confession didn't hurt nobody. Because all the people who, were, who lived through it and got away, he didn't give their name. It was really not until 10 years later that Thomas Wentworth Higgerson discovered his wife, who was the secret keeper for the insurrection, and began to make a record of it. Now, the importance of this for today is that in an age of media, where revolution, where TV is literally killing the minds of a whole lot of our children, including mine, we don't tell them those beautiful stories because those stories not on television, not going to be there either until we put on a television station and, and put it there. And if you know what some of these stations networks sell for, do you know we can dig up that kind of money? 
Do you know we spent last year five, I mean, uh, $500,000 on potato chips? You know, any housewife with a stove can make potato chips? An idiot can make potato chips? <laughs> you don't have to be wise. <laughs> <laughs> If we start doing the simple things for ourselves that other people are doing for us, we could make money catering to each other. There's no law against sending 10 trucks down to Florida, picking up some oranges and bringing them back and selling them to ourselves wholesale. And nothing wrong with it. We got truck drivers. We got the money for the trucks. We're not doing it. All right, now, back to this history. Because I've only gone halfway and I've got a lot to do. After the Civil War, after a period called Reconstruction, the beginning of the land grant colleges, the beginning of higher education, we began to put down in our own way the history of our churches, the history of our societies, most of these things privately written, and some well written, some not so well written, some endorsed by a group of men or literary women who underwrote the uh, expense of, of having it done. But we were coming back into, in, into, into history. Finally, after some rough starts and some pretty good basic layman's history, a non-profession, but a politician would write a formal history of African people in the United States, and he would call it a history of the Negro race in the United States. His name was George Washington Williams from Ohio. This is the first formal history. There have been other histories, informal, informal, written by people who were not historians and had no hist history training. He had good history reading and a good discipline about himself. He would argue as to whether to use the word Negro. Then he would lose the argument with himself and go ahead and use it. And I'm sorry, he lost the argument. But he himself proved there was no such thing. But he thought if he used something else, people wouldn't know what he was talking about. So he used it. Now we have a formal history appearing in the 1880s. Now, with the period underway, a lot of tracks a lot of material written by alert ministers. Bishop Turner is on the scene. Henry Highland Garnett, whose motto was resistance, resistance, has written a lot of his, not only his speeches, but has written his famous appeal, model after David Walker's appeal. Martin Delaney had written a novel, a protest called Blake. We're getting it together from a point of view of literature. But now, in the 1880s, a young man from Great Barrington, Massachusetts, who had been educated there and assumed he was going to Harvard because the young men who made high marks went to Harvard. 
went to Harvard. They sent the white kids to Harvard and sent him to Fisk. He began to feel color prejudice for the first time in his life. He became conscious of it for the first time. It was there all along. He finally finished Fisk and went to, went to Harvard, did exceptionally well. And there he wrote the first formal scholarly treatment of the slave trade, still a masterwork worth reading. The suppression of the slave trade to the United States by W.E.B. Du Bois. The first book in the Harvard series, books by the former students of Harvard. Now we're beginning to have our history recorded by competent people. He would continue and he was, his essays would be published 1903, his famous book, Souls of Black Folks, followed by his book, Gift of Black Folks. Booker T. Washington has recorded his experience under the title, Up From Slavery. Now we have a lot of history at a time, a new kind of history writer comes on the scene, the radical black journalist, T. Thomas Fortune, William Monroe Trotter, journalist teachers like Kelly Miller, then teaching at Howard uh, University and others. The foundation for the recording of our history is underway 1915, the year Booker T. Washington dies, W.E.B. Du Bois would publish a little book called The Negro. This is the first international survey of African people throughout the world, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. He would later expand this into two other books, one Black Folks Then and Now, and the next one, Africa and the World. Now you're beginning to have African history by Africans. You're beginning to have Afro-American history. You begin to have Caribbean history by Caribbean writer. Now, the migration from the Caribbeans, and a lot of people need to note this, would start early in the 20th century, except for individual migrations. There was no mass migration of consequence until early in the 20th century. This migration would change the cultural structure of the community. It would also change the intellectual structure of the community. From the Caribbean would come Arthur Schomburg. Arthur Schomburg would contribute to, to a book called The New Negro, a famous essay, The Negro Digs Up His Past. More important, long range, a Jamaican who had formerly been a soldier in the old West Indian Regiment, J.A. Rogers, lived in America so long and visited Jamaica so seldom, most Jamaicans don't know he was a Jamaican. J.A. Rogers was a Jamaican. I heard from his last wife today a lot of people don't even know he had a last wife or a first one either. 
be that as it may. I keep in touch with, with some people. J. E. Rogers began to write polemics disputing the concept of white supremacy. He began because he was light complected and from Jamaica, still the most color stratified of all the islands, color and culture stratified still. Because he was light complected, he had the hypotheses that the lighter complected person had more brains because they were closer to whites. And so while doing research to prove his point, he disproved his point. <laughs> and so he began to write about all of the great blacks in history in his first book, Nature as Nature Leads, 1919, then another book, a Debate, still worth reading, From Superman to Man. Then his book, Lives of Eminent Africans. This is the forerunner to the book, World's Great Men of Color. Then he wrote a pamphlet on As Nature Leads with the preface to the three-volume work sex and race. He was interested in race mixing through the years as nature leads also was a forerunner of a more refined book Nature Knows No Color Line. But Rogers was a prolific writer and a columnist but more than any other of the Caribbean writers, Rogers spent 50 years of research looking at the role of the African personality in human history. And he laid the foundation for that inquiry into history to let us know that we too have played a major role in history. 1915, Carter Woodson established the National Association for the Advancement of, no, me, the, not that, but the National Negro History Group. Associate for the Study of Negro Life and History. That was his words. The Negro History Bulletin and the Journal of Negro History. Now you had a formal organization devoted to searching out in a scholarly way to the extent that he could find scholars the history of, of our people in good work. In the Caribbeans, there's the Caribbean, the several Caribbean historical societies. There's one centered principally in Jamaica. Then there's one that embraces the whole of the Caribbeans, including the Spanish speaking and the Dutch speaking and the French speaking. In the West Indian historical society is centered principally in, in Jamaica. My main point is that all of us realize that we had played a role in history and no one was going to write that history except ourselves. All right. Around 1960, 1962, African people, Africanists, people specializing in African history, began to challenge the white interpreters of Africa. They began to discover that most of the white experts on Africa were digging up information to give to the government on how to control Africa. Finally, the challenge came at Mo Montreal. 
an organization that had been threatening to come into being for a long time. And it just so happens I was head of the dissident organization at the time. But at Montreal, the blacks challenged the whites and formed a new organization, the African Heritage Studies Association. I remember that a famous French Africanist, Raymond Mooney, unfortunately dead now, or fortunately, Raymond Mooney always began his lectures on Africa by saying, until the 16th century, the African did not know the wheel. Now what is he, all the chariots Africans produced? There was African gladiators in the Roman arena, in chariots, with wheels. And he keeps saying that until the 16th century, the African didn't know the wheel. But the main thing at Montreal, some young Turks went into a lecture being given by Raymond Mooney and broke it up. He said, this lecture is off, this conference is off. And he kept saying, young men, do you understand who I am? I am Raymond Mooney. And they said, you are irrelevant. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> they didn't know who he was or nor did they care. Misconceptions were over who built Egypt in ancient times. And the Europeans insisted that they built Egypt though they did not exist when Egypt existed. And we kept asking, and we're still asking, how would you build all those great temples in Egypt that was built 2,000 years before you built a shoe for a European, a house with a window? Why would you leave barbarous Europe and build something that fine thousands of miles away from Europe before you build anything of this consequence in Europe. And why is there nothing in Europe of this consequence now? They ran out of excuses claiming Egypt. Now they say civilization started in Suma, started, they, they started everywhere except Egypt. Then they discovered that there were Africans were over there in Suma too building. This was a period when there was no separation between Africa and Western Asia called the Middle East. And there's a book called When Egypt Ruled the East. And what you think of as the Middle East was a former colony of Egypt, a colony of the nations of Western, um, of uh, North East Africa. And what we're trying to say is that we have looked into our history and some of the people who have made a life's mission out of it are growing old. Some of them are dying and they're not being replaced. We should have people who make a priesthood out of historical preservation, just like priests go into church and pledge to God and to a given order. People should go into history. Their whole life is the preservation of the history of a people. You don't have to distort it because our history is so good and glorious. You don't have to tell a single lie you just tell the truth, it's good enough. I have always wanted to straighten out the black heroes and heroines so that I would have enough security and the people would have enough security to let me write about a few black reprobates. 
principally because we have had some villains too. We've had some of the greatest people in the history of the world, but we've also had some villains. I would really like to write a decent book about Tebow Tim, the black slave trader, who, who he never said he was a slave trader, he said he was a contract laborer. But his contract laborers never came back. So. Or Deborah Pasha, who was also in the same business. Or the Congo Arabs, mostly black, uh, born from the cohabitation of the Arab and the African woman. There's some closed doors in our history, but there were some glorious doors. When I saw that stupid thing, Chaka, I'd like to write a children's book about Chaka's mother. If you write a, if you write a book about Chaka's mother, you'll get a good picture of Chaka. you get a good book of African culture. I think on the mother in African history, the female in African history, you know a lot about African culture. Because you might be insecure in the presence of strong women in this country, but you were never insecure in the presence of strong women in Africa. In, in Africa, you never debated whether a woman is superior or inferior, because that's almost like saying your mother is inferior to you. And what fool would do that? Can you be pregnant? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> she got you here. <laughs> And you're going to debate about whether she's good enough to walk beside you? The African had too much logic to do anything as stupid as this. So what we need to do, in addition to recording our history, we need to study what has already been recorded. We need to really study the judicial system of African people. I mean, customary systems, their system. I remember, and I think I've told you this before, but it's worth retelling. When I was in Ghana, I witnessed a, a, a trial because I was staying at the home of the superintendent of prisons in Kumase. And there was a trial, and seemed like such a minor thing, and I kept wondering why it lasted three nights. Three men were, had a job. One man faked an illness, and the other two men finished his work and collected the money and gave him his share, gave his papa share. But on the way, they saw him in a drinking bar, setting up the ladies, and dancing up a breeze. <laughs> so this made them angry. So they took it to their chief. And the chief was actually trying to satisfy the thing. There was nothing involved now. There's, what was involved was the total sum was $9. So we said, man, they wouldn't give the money back. All right, all right, he did wrong. He said, no, they wouldn't take it. So it went on and on, and finally he called character witnesses after another. Then his wife came in, he said, last character witness. And she said that he was a good man. He took care of the children well, he took care of her well, but sometimes he's too generous. And he liked to think he's a dreamer. He liked to think of himself as a rich man with enough money to set up people and, you know, buy drinks for everybody. And he's, he hadn't learned how to control himself in that regard. And she would appeal to the men not only to forgive him, they said, well, we have forgiven him. Well, now what is at issue? The men have forgiven him. The trial still goes on. Then, she appealed to them to work with him again. Because if they don't work with him again, he is in dishonor. 
They not only must forgive him, but they must agree to work with him again so that the, the dishonor is off until they not only they trust him again, they'll work with him again, he'll be a friend again. So he's fully restored then. I went back to Kumar Say and I asked Dr. Donkwa, Nkrumah's uh, schoolmaster, who was now on the odds with Nkrumah, but that's another story. Uh, Dr. Donkwa, what was that trial about? He says, John, his arrogant way. This is affection for him. He's acting like a stupid American. And the child would know what the child is about. My wife is preparing a dinner. Go down in my library and read certain books. You'll find out what the child was about. Go down in the library, I'm reading an hour. Finally found a little pamphlet by Dr. Donquois. 26 pages. Obligation in a canned society. I come upstairs. I said, Dr. Nunquall, the trial is about what governs African society. Honor and obligation. Well, John, you seem to seem to like. We'll have dinner now. <laughs> And when you study a society, you have to study more than its history. You must study the moral rules that govern it. This is why in African societies, when the European came, there was no word for jail. These are societies held together by honor and obligation. And when we get that concept back again, move among each other again. And we understand that nobody would snatch a woman's purse. It's a dishonorable thing to do. And you have an obligation to protect her, not to snatch her purse. Once this is understood, once this is ingrained, once we understand that we came out of a society governed by honor and obligation, we can become a people again. Now, all of this talk about unity is also about history. Because if you don't know the history of what you was, you are confused about what you are and what you still have to be and where you still have to go. And I think we have to pay more and more attention to history from our point of view. Get out of the trap of assuming that our oppressor has written any history about us, he hasn't even written a true history about himself. If he do, he wouldn't dare read it if he did. <laughs> the repeopling of a people, the giving back a people their spirit, the unification of a people, is giving them back values that make them appreciate themselves and respect themselves and walk the earth as kings without reducing anyone else to anything else. Commanding respect and giving respect. This is what we have to do because this is tomorrow's work. And this is the essence of the remaking of a people. We are not Western people. We have to stop acting as though we are Western people. 
we know we live here and we know we have to make certain adjustments. We know we live in a capitalist system and have to make certain adjustments. But we came out of a sharing society. We have to rescue the spirit of the society we came out of. And we are responsible not only to give the world a new humanity, but we will start that giving with ourselves and with our children. And we will walk this earth shining like a new penny because we are tomorrow's people. And if we can't be tomorrow's people, the world is not gonna be worth living in. Thank you. I appreciate being here this critical time in our history and each time I sit and think, meditate and think I've got the subject and focus, another subject comes in focus that makes me want to stand again and speak still again and you wonder where will it end I am a person consistently at war and when you are consistently at war you need an abode of peace. You need something to retreat within yes. that will give you the peace to go back to the battlefield. Peace. And sometimes, thinking over how I've spent my life and the fact that I could have done it otherwise, My peace within the wall came when I recognized I will never know peace. Because I will never get out of the wall. And that for an activist in a liberation movement, war is normal. Peace is ad abnormal until the war is won. My mental notes for this morning is about the serious business of being serious. And oppressed people realizing the nature of their oppression and not being able to face it frontally generally began to fantasize and create a world for themselves that is unreal while the real world marches on and sometimes leaves them behind. People, like objects, sometimes become obsolete 
because they didn't keep up with the age in which they lived. At this critical time in my personal history, trying to hold what's left of my family together, trying to communicate with my extended family that sometimes is just as dependable as what's left of my natural family in the midst of all of this and looking at the world marching forward and being a teacher of history I know that we are psychologically culturally financially and politically out of step with history because we are out of step with reality. We cannot continue to live fantasy. Now I'm going to look at certain things, recent things, and explain the nature of the fantasy and the desired reality. I have many faults that I'm perfectly willing to admit, and one is a low toleration for people who do not read books. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Books have been have been my salvation, my rescue, my spiritual abode to the extent that it's inconceivable to me that there are people who don't read those objective core books. Now, I begin with the Harlem event of last Tuesday then I'm going to work back and forth across history to show you how we are continually missing the point. Last Tuesday, there was an event in Harlem publicized as being for Winnie Mandela. It wasn't about Winnie Mandela at all. It was a charade and a local con game pull in the name of Winnie Mandela to get an audience and in every true sense it was an offense to Winnie Mandela and yet the place was packed the people were there and when she finally arrived we were told that it wasn't about Winnie Mandela it was about Queen Mother Moore passing her lifeline over to Winnie Mandela, as though that's possible. Yeah. Now, to say something against Queen Mother Moore is like saying something against an icon. Now, I'm wondering why other people have lived through the same period as I have lived through know some of the same fakeries that I know, why do I always bell the cat, take the bunt, and identify the fakery? But others know the same fakery and kept quiet. I'm still taking the flat for being the first one to say that the so-called Million Man March was a con game and a method of washing the ego of Louis Farrakhan and that nothing would be achieved that could not have been achieved without a march. I'm still getting hate mail from my own people threatening my very existence. People
people who've been friends of mine for 30 years have broken off relationship with me. The man's crazy. He's against everything. I'm not against everything. I'm against truth. I'm, I'm against a lie. I'm for truth. Now, let's deal with this event. Finally, when Winnie Mandela entered, she told them she wasn't feeling well. They continued the ceremony. They continued all of this adoration for Queen Mother. Now, I'm going to sit silent. Now, I've lived in this, this city since, I mean, of New York City since 1933. I came here as an 18-year-old teenager. I know Queen Mother Moore for nearly 40 years before they called her Queen Mother Moore. Her name is Audley Moore. She was active in the American Communist Party. There are internal black parties within, I mean, clubs within the party. She manu always maneuvered herself into being the treasurer. <laughs> and took good care of herself. <laughs> now, if a whole lot of people know this, now I'm going to get some more enemies right. by saying right. what right. is true. Queen Mother Moore is a piece of fiction created in Harlem. She is a Louisiana Creole. For most of her life, she didn't even speak to black people. She must have gotten a dozen trips to Africa. I'm the queen of the race. So why don't he just keep quiet? Let her run her hustle after all. <laughs> <laughs> But the truth about the matter right now, she's not running the house, so somebody else is running it and making a living yeah. off of her yeah. running the house. Right. Taking up funds, where the queen mother want to make it. Still another trip to Africa. African nations give money, other sympathizers give money. She's had a number of husbands, none of them black. <laughs> now look, if you are to get serious about our freedom movement, you've got to know the players in the game. Then you've got to know the jokers in the game. I'm not against her. I have worked with her. She has some land upstate. She's going to call Mount Addis Ababa and build a university there. And I was going to be uh, president of a university of some land that <laughs> had no buildings. <laughs> and when I finally visit the land, and not even a decent privy. Now, people move based on symbols. Yes. We created symbols to make the least use of them. The symbol on your money, the symbol on so much that you think started some other place, started with us. So they're using a symbol to get a whole lot of people together to have a ceremony it has no definite meaning in our life right now because we engage in so much ceremony without substance. And we have not been able to ask leader a simple question. Leader, where are you leading me? And because we have not been able to ask that question, we have not created the kind of leaders that we need. Well, all right, now, everybody's waiting for Winnie Mandela to speak. All 
all the ceremony goes on and on and on and on. The woman told you she's not feeling well. If she's going to speak, let her speak so she can go to a hotel and rest. I wish she had a heart attack before she left South Africa. No, another is taking into consideration. Everybody going through all kind of ceremonies. And then finally, they let us say a few words. And on her way to the door, somebody got to pray again for her. Somebody got to give her flowers. They could have given her all the time she was sitting there waiting to speak. But nobody, but nobody have examined South Africa in its struggle and her relationship to that struggle. In all the years her husband was in jail. They have not examined the tragedy of the recent separation. And they have not understood that when people play a role in our liberation, similar to Winnie Mandela and Nelson Mandela, they should not even when they separate, have any public display of it. If we go back to the African system, the elders right. would gather them in a closed room. I don't mean they make them stay together. But the reason for them separating would never become common gossip. Because when people have played that role in your liberation, you respect them enough not to start rumors and silliness. Right. Winnie Mandela is a human being. Yes, and at her age now, she's still a very physically attractive human being. Yes, All the years when Nelson Mandela was in jail, let us understand one thing. She was in the heart of that liberation movement, went to jail, suffered, went into house arrest. When you go through all of this without a husband and raising two children, because you are a human being with human endurance, you need somebody to confide in. You need somebody's shoulder to lean on and shed a tear. That's right. That's right. Else you lose command of yourself. Nelson Mandela, a human being. In jail, he found not only an outlet but a way to organize other prisoners and to occupy his own mind, even studying rock formation. Now with all of this, these two human beings under pressure of a fascist government that you have not studied, people talk about South Africa, not read one single book on it, no time. It may be unfortunate, unfortunate that I'm not going to become a dictator. Because I believe that there are certain things in the world either have to be dictated or they don't exist. Everybody that go to Africa, so far as I'm concerned, would have to read three books and explain them before they can go. No passport. <laughs> no visa, no nothing. And people who cop out on that blackness, people like Roy Innes, I would have certain mornings when I would have executions.
They will be executed before they have their breakfast while watching me eat my breakfast. Because <laughs> I'm tired of nonsense. And I'm tired of ceremony without substance. Now let's hang into this, what we're talking about. We're talking about two people in South Africa in the midst of a struggle. Now, in the midst of this struggle, when you're paying attention to this struggle, you have to remember that people who've been associated with over 50 years. And when the McCarthy period was driving black writers and so-called leftists and activists to cry and to weep and to confess on their friends, I wouldn't let it happen to me, but what did I do? I took a minor job at NBC at night. Night supervisor of maintenance in one of the uptown studios. High sounding job. Nothing but a damn porter. <laughs> Supervising some other porters. <laughs> And because I supervised them so well, and they got all the offices cleaned and there was no complaints, they were paid for seven hours. They finished in four and went home and held down a job in the day and together found and sent the kids, paid a little mortgage, every, so long, no, no complaints. You know, so I'm all right. And I, I have to be there whether they're there or not. And, what did I do? I mean, after they're gone, I'm got all the NBC t uh, telephones available to me. I can call all over the world. <laughs> I've got a stationery. <laughs> I called my friend Eastern Udom in Nigeria in the middle of the night. No, oh, what the hell is wrong with you? Crazy enough. <laughs> I got a free phone. <laughs> so I use it. Now, what I'm trying to focus in on the situation that produced a Nelson Mandela and the situation that produced a Winnie Mandela. I said long before, even as much as two years before he was released, if there was a betting contest about who would be run for president of South Africa, my bet is on Winnie Mandela. Now why? Why did I say Winnie Mandela instead of Nelson Mandela? Because I know in 27 years in jail, living under a fascist government, they've got time to play games with your mind that you cannot control. And so let's look at him. Not as a cop out. Not as the president of a country. But as a compromise waiting for the real revolution to occur. A holding action. Now let's look at winning a nationalist who realized the one thing that you're going to have to realize if you bring off a revolution, you've got to have the land back. For land is the basis of nation. Without land, no nation. She said she can't get what she wants, take a gun and go back to the bush. That's revolutionary. Now, you have a commission in South Africa looking into past atrocities and you got people confessing to past atrocities with the agreement that they will go scotch free. What other people in human history treat their enemies in that way? When they catch them, they kill them, or drive them out, or bury them. And yet we of all people, 
where the greatest atrocity has been committed or asked to forgive. You take one of the great moral leaders of the 20th century, Bishop Tutu, to head the, the commission. You mean to tell me you're going to forgive Sharpville? You're going to forgive Soweto? You're going to forgive the bulldozing of the homes, the whole villages of, of African people in a land that was theirs? Is that the guest has turned on them? You're going to forgive the death of Stephen Biko? All of this is going to be put behind you by some damn commission. We're supposed to be better than any people in the world, but our great spirituality, we're going to forgive. I grieve today over the death of my mother because she died of a disease that was unnecessary. People don't even die of it anymore. Called pellagra. Pellagra is a diet deficiency. All she had to do to cure herself is to eat. Now, as a kid, seven and eight, or less than that, I noticed my mother serving everybody, making sure everybody got a nigga. You got a little more, you got a little more. And she, what's left in the pot, she'll take that and she never sit down. I did not know she was killing herself. Then I go to the hospital and stinking wooden Jim Crow hospital. I hate hospitals to this day. She asked for a drink of water. I tried to get it for her. And a white nurse told me, boy, you don't work here. She'll get water when I say she. she was boss of the black nurses who wouldn't give her a drink of water. Do you think I will forgive the society that killed my mother? Then how can I be asked to give and how can I expect South Africans who suffered more to forgive. Let's be real. All of this talk about African liberation, all the libations and the ceremony, it don't mean nothing unless you are willing to work for the liberation of African people. That to work for the liberation of African people, you've got to be serious. You've got to be able to face the truth. And how can you help South Africa when you don't even know what you are helping? You don't know the whites there. You don't know the blacks there. Or during this MacArthur period, I'm working at NBC at night. I'm reading South African history in the day. I'm writing a whole a book on resistance movements in Africa, especially South African resistance movements. I'm reading all the books of competence written on South Africa, how the Boers got there. And you're not going to understand South Africa until you understand the Boers. You've got to understand the Boers are Calvinists. You've got to understand the Calvinist branch of, the Christ, of Christianity. Because the Calvinists said that they are ordained by God to rule over lesser breeds. And so when they created apartheid in the atrocities of African people, they did this in the name of God. Now, take the people, the Arabs, who killed those people at a hotel in Egypt, shouting, God is great. I'm saying the most a trust is ever committed against human beings in human history has been committed in the name of God. If you commit an act of murder in the name of God, 
then you are charging God with the approval of an ungodly act. And by affiliation, you are an atheist. Because you have made God ungodly. By asking him to join you in the crimes you're committing against other people. Now you're not going to face South Africa by just being against the part high because the larger issue is European domination of the land. Now, slaves were taken out of West Africa. Slaves were taken out of North Africa through inner West Africa. The slave trade existed all along the coast of East Africa. And the Portuguese slave trade met the, met the Arab slave trade coming from the north. And a lot of these slaves went to Brazil and parts of, of South America. And the Arabs destroyed the matrilineal system for the patrilineal system, the lineage coming down through the male. Go to the marketplace in East Africa right now. Yes. Male dominated. Go to the marketplace in West Africa right now. Female dominated. Because the Africans who Islamize the Africans in West Africa do what part of the culture to leave alone. And the one part of the culture you'd better leave alone is the matrilineal system. The lineage comes down to the female side. Therefore, the king's son cannot be king, but the king's sister's son cannot be king. Now, what is the African intelligently done? He's cutting down on competition between the father and the son over the kingship. Or the, the, the son became an able assistant to the father because he knew that that is high as he's going to get. He will never be king because he's been ruled out. Otherwise, if he can be king and father keep living on and on and on, he might think of some dependable poison to get father out of the way for he wants to be king. To understand this, you've got to understand African customs to understand history, you have to understand customs, you have to understand folklore. You got to understand something else, the rule of honor in warfare. The African did not hit you in the back. The two warriors would face each other and they step back ten feet. They would give the opposing warrior at the time to change his mind. And an African would never fight a coward. And all you wanted to, all you had to do now, I'm afraid. Nobody gets any mileage from fighting someone who's afraid. It's against the manhood. This is why growing up and caddying at Fort Ben in Georgia for Eisenhower and Omar Bradley and I wasn't doing anything. So, hey, Pee Wee, that was my nickname because I was so small. <laughs> Supervise the crap game. Yeah. I said, I ain't betting nothing now. I'm super. Why did I get to supervise the crap game? No one could get a reputation beating me up. <laughs> If you are so bad for a reputation, you got to beat up little Pee Wee. <laughs> we know he does to your man. Because <laughs> a star child can take him over. <laughs> now, again, after I was in the army, I have a, I'm a sergeant major, I'm big cheese in the army, That's next to being an officer, you know. <laughs> and uh, I have to ship soldiers overseas and process them coming back. During that period, no soldier can go to town. None of your soldiers can go to town. The stationary group. So I pay, come payday. 
They can't go up Commerce Street and negotiate. So well, so you can't let her do nothing. Like we we start shooting crap. You you tell her we're making too much noise. You supervise the game. Also, I supervise the game. End of the day, I got more money than anybody else. I ain't bet nothing. In town, I take a shiner to some girl who have birthdays every other month, depending on what souls are listening. <coughs> so, so she had a birthday on me. So I'm renting some nightclub, giving a big duray for her. And Came time to tip the waiter. I tipped him and almost began to cry. My father, sharecropper, mill hand, part time farmer, one week with all of this he made $18. And I counted the $18, and he lectured me, be persevere. If you work hard in this country, boy, you see what you can do? $18 in one week. Giving a party for this girl who wasn't even a, wasn't a birthday anyway, but for him for that job. <laughs> I tipped the maitre d' more money than my father makes in three months. And why did I get all that excess money? Not persevering. Not working hard. Not being honest. I learned to be a little crook for the first time in my life. I got it cut in the cotton, crab game. <laughs> now that's real. See, so too many times you get into fantasies and don't deal with real. Now let's deal with what's real in South Africa. The Boers came into South Africa to rule blacks. I am not here to give you equality. I am here to rule you. I am ordained by my God to rule over the lesser breeds. And I have declared that you are a lesser breed. Now this is, the, this is the South Africa that Winnie Mandela and Nelson Mandela has to deal with. Now deal with the human pressure on both of them. Deal with the political pressure on both of them. And deal with the mentality of both of them under these different pressures. Deal with people appealing to people for human consideration who have not accepted the humanity of African people before they arrived. They arrived at the conclusion that they were going to rule over lesser breeds. And in studying the longest, the most consistent resistance movements in South, in Africa period, at night, I'm studying these movements in, after the fellows have cleaned all the offices and go home. I'm sitting there on NBC time studying the struggle in South Africa and writing a whole book on it. Book after book on resistance movements. Now, when Mandela come out of this 27 years without a husband, still in the struggle don't you think we should pay enough respect for her not to get her involved in a Harlem con game but if you've never read a single book on the struggle and if you're not part of her career for over 30 years as I have followed her career two hours after Nelson Mandela 
went to jail, the information was on my desk at Freedom Ways Magazine, where I was one of the editors. I had kept so close in touch with the movement and corresponded with people in South Africa, and they corresponded with me, sent me pamphlets, information that nobody else had. And how did they do it? They would take a conservative South African paper, take out their guts, put the pamphlets and the information in the middle, then wrap the paper. When the South African post clerk sees the paper, well, well, ain't no harm in sending that paper out of there. Let it go. And I would take the New York Times, take the guts out of it, and uh, put my material for South Africa inside, you know. Then when they see, well, this is the New York Times, well, they ain't nobody's army, nobody's enemy. Let, let it come in. So I was corresponding with the activists in South Africa not long ago. So now I'm going to sit on stage. They asked me to introduce Winnie Mandela, and I thought she was going to start talking. And here's somebody running a con game doing an African ceremony, all wrong. And she th sit there, told the people, I'm sick. I want to speak, go on. She heading up the aisle, more delay. I'm saying that we have to be real about what we have to do in the world. There's a book called The Tribes. It deals with everybody in the world, all the major groups in the world, in their fight for a piece of space on the turf called the earth. Everybody's fight except ours. Asians willing to join the Europeans in taking over Africa. Everybody wants a piece of Africa and the Africans are running from Africa. Look at the contradiction. Yet nobody has read, and I've yet to meet 10 people who read it. It's a long essay of William Leo Hansberry, Africa World's Richest Continent. Highest rainfall, greatest hydroelectric potential, in spite of several deserts, more fertile soil than any other spot on Earth. Sheikh Ante Diop continues this in a book called Africa, the Politics of a Federated State. He shows you that the river bottoms of Africa, proper, under proper cultivation, can not only feed Africa, but maybe one third of the world. Now I sailed down that big Congo River. There are parts when the of that river that's a half a mile wide. All of that water is running to the sea. The sea don't need the extra water. Good engineering can hold that water inside of Africa and wipe out the deserts. Are you talking about nonsense? If you're going to prepare a people to rule a nation, then they've got to be prepared for everything in a nation, including the manufacture of the toilet paper. And when you talk nationhood, you've got to talk technology. If you can't control your rivers, you can't control your nation. You can't control your land, can't control your nation. Can't control your ideology. You can't control your nation. So don't shout nation time until you understand this. You shout nation time. Who's going to fly your aeroplanes? Who's going to manage your harbor? Who's not going to negotiate for you in the international? you got goods over and above that you need. You can bargain on the market 
I, I got something you need, you got something I need. We, we can have, have an exchange. The real strength of a nation is in its resources. And if you do not manage the wealth producing resources of your nation, you have no nation and you are a fake when you think you're independent. There is not a nation in Africa where the African people manage the wealth producing resources in that country. There is not a nation in Africa that is politically free or economically free. Now that's real. Now, Basil Davison, one of the white writers who've done the most in telling the truth about modern Africa and how Europe still tends to keep it under its domination, have told us that what happened in Africa, what, what happened to our freedom movement, now, I did a book called Who Betrayed the African World Revolution? What went wrong with the civil rights movement? What went wrong with the Caribbean Federation concept? What went wrong with the African independent movement? There have been so be many betrayals since then, I got to write the whole book over again. Because <laughs> you're copying out when you, you, when you let your wealth producing resources go to the hand of other people, you are giving up nationhood. Now explain why is it before integration in that bag of worms, you had at least a black grocery store every three blocks. Now you don't see one. It was no mystery for them to manage the store. Why do you have to have Koreans in that managing store now? East Indians, Arabs. If you can't manage a community, you can't manage a nation. You rehearse for nationhood in your community. You rehearse for your community and your family. What did we lose in the process that we have to get back or be destroyed as a people, go out of business as a people? We stop talking to our children. We stop, there's a such thing called good manners. There's such thing as the proper thing to do. There are certain things in the family that is not negotiable. I mean, we don't discuss whether we forget this. Now, there was a time when if a man said something about your mother, even a coward would fight. He would, he'd rather fight and lose than not to have fought at all. Mother was dear. And, and the sister didn't come too far behind. We've forgotten all of this. We've forgotten curfew, the, the father, the authority figure in the home. He said, 11 o'clock, I want you in this house. And he didn't say 11.30. 11 o'clock, I was here. Bing, what you? you don't negotiate with him. Master the situation. What we've lost is reality in that if, fa if a family has a structure you can give a community a structure and subsequently a nation a structure. We are an unstructured people following other people who don't know where they are going. And if we ask the question, 
leader, where are you leading me? You better get a good answer or replace the leader. Now haven't we brought up enough people feathering their own lips? lining their own pockets. We haven't asked any questions. And when I began to ask some questions, I became a villain. They took up over three million dollars in collection in the Million Man March. Why is it? 90 percent of those people were Christians. Why did the Muslims take up the collection and didn't account to anyone afterwards? And why did you let them get away with it? Because you dared not ask, leader, where are you leading me? Now, if over a million men march on Washington, if each one spend an average of a hundred dollars, look how much money you got just right there, and they, they did more than that. Plus the fact they paid ahead of time. They contributed additional money. There was enough money for six marches before the first march, before the march took place. Then why are they saying they got a deficit? I'm going to raise another million. And they've said that. You haven't asked any questions. What happened to the first? I'm a villain in my own community because people said, if you get, a, can you get a million people to Washington? I'm not right or wrong whether I can get 10. That don't make me wrong. Wanted to know what did you do with the million you took to Washington? And what is the aftermath? What you have not examined is the aftermath. What came after? When you go on a worldwide trip, an entourage of 30, a four motor airplane, a six man or woman crew, you have spent the same money taken up in Washington could have saved one of the predominantly black colleges. The same money for the trip could have built a chain of supermarkets throughout black America. Who was the trip supposed to serve? The closest person to a radical that he met in Africa was Winnie Mandela. Most of the others were cop-outs, compromises. And some were thugs with an army of thugs. Mobutu, who participated in the murder of the Mumba, one of the richest black men on the face of the earth. Some people in his country are starving. One of the richest countries on the face of the earth. Why are they starving? In an African tradition, the ruler is not the owner of the wealth. The ruler is the guardian of the wealth. 
the role of the ruler is to make sure that things are distributed so everybody can have their share. Now, why nobody call into being African traditional governments? Why haven't somebody studied the African customary court? I have attended customary courts all over Africa. And I say that if I'm ever to be tried, I would prefer one of those courts to any civil court because the, before the African knew there was a civil court, they had more democratic justice than anything they had afterwards. And they didn't have one civil trained lawyer. What did they have? Respect for the idea that the elders had lived longer than they had lived and knew more. And their uncle could be in charge of their Supreme Court. We didn't lose all of this coming to America against our will. Because I can remember when there's serious problems in Georgia and Alabama, the first thing you try to do is to keep white folks out of it. And we would gather, and they would, the older people would talk about it and straighten it out and call the young people concerned in and, and not, not ask them what they wanted to do, tell them this is what you are going to do. That was an internal family dictatorship. That was authoritarianism. But when we had that kind of authoritarianism, we had no drive-by shootings. We had no people putting poison in their veins. We were not the majority in the jails. Now, show me that this dictatorship through family custom was wrong in as much as once you discarded it, you exposed yourself for exploitation by everybody in the world, not just whites, East Asians too. East Asians have taken over the government of Guyana, former British Guyana, and Trinidad. How did the blacks let them do it? We are so democratic toward other people, we are undemocratic toward ourselves. We should preserve these governments for our children still to come. Right. East Indians came in as farm laborers, literally coolies, being given privileges by the British and carefully waited their turn and took over the government because blacks were too kind, too kind to them. Now if you look at this catastrophe, look at the catastrophe in Trinidad, now look at the irony of it. Trinidad produced the three major pan-Africanist theoreticians. H. Sylvester Williams, C.L.R. James, and George Padmore. The same island that produced the whole concept of African reclamation and African unity. Couldn't find it and their will to unite the very island that produced the concept. There's something else even more tragic and terribly personal and maybe shouldn't be mentioned at all. Of the three major Pan-Africanists, <laughs> all three of them had children by black women, not one ever established a lasting relationship with one. 
If you're going to unite Africa, you're going to have to unite Africa in bed and out of bed. You got to unite it symbolically. Because you cannot lead people back to Africa when the symbol of your mate is alien. The road back to Africa does not start between an alien woman's leg. What I'm saying is that in this regard, both of us have some responsibility. It's not all the black man's responsibility. It's not all the black woman's responsibility. It's responsibility of both of you to realize this. And because white sociologists are saying that there's a wall between the black man and the black woman. Because white women live saying it. You feel called on to act out a war they created in their sick mind because they said it. Most of the time, you don't know what the hell are we arguing about? We got along before, before we heard the story. But my point is that we have not faced reality and read enough to know the background to what is happening. When Farrakhan go to Iran, do you think Farrakhan knows enough of African history to know that for 2,000 years before the first Europeans set foot in Africa, for 2,000 years the enemies of Africa came from Western Asia? And the last invasion of Africa came from Iran. 550 B.C. They were so brutal to Africans. The Africans cried out, Oh God, if you cannot send me a liberator, send me a conqueror who will show me mercy. Now, the little Macedonian, sometimes referred to as a Greek, called Alexander didn't have to knock at Africa's door very hard for Africa literally let him in to show mercy it's the first European occupation of Africa this is 332 AD. Now everything that happened in Africa, BC, everything that happened in Africa before that was non-European and non-white. How can they build the pyramids in Africa when they had not built a shoe for themselves in Europe or a house for the window? It's a contradiction. Why do you give so much to other people before you give anything to yourself? Because if we discovered our role in history and read the proper books, even those written by white, enlightened whites who repudiated the bigger the Europeans, we would know that at this juncture in history, with books like the Bell Curve, The disuniting of America, assuming it was ever united. And now a book called Not Out of Africa, repudiating all Africa's claim. Africa can't claim Egypt. And Egypt is part of the Nile Valley that stretches 4,000 miles within the body of Africa. I can show you without any difficulty Rome and Greece were not European creations. There was no Europe. Opposition to Rome and Greece 
created Europe. When they got together to protect themselves from Rome and Greece, the Franks became the French, the Huns became the Germans. Scattered warring tribes coming together to protect themselves against the Mediterranean force of Rome and Greece, and therefore becoming a state in the process. How can they, without even a state or an organized army, go all the way and organize Egypt when they hadn't even organized the parachute? We need to ask some serious questions about our understanding of history, but you've got to know more than history. You've got to know a comparative knowledge of history. You've got to know something about European atrocities to other Europeans. Now, we made a lot to do about uh, there's half a million people killed in Uganda by Africans against Africa. Okay. Basil Davis has written an article explaining how the French set it up with the Belgians, how the Belgians put the uh, Tutsis or Watutsis against the Hutus or Bahutus, installed a minority Africans over a, ma or a, ma over a majority. And so the big Tutsis made the smaller Hutus their servants and treated them ruthlessly under Belgium rule. The war was a war of revenge set up by Europeans, not Africans. There was a time before this interference when the, if the Tutsis had a difference of opinion with the Hutus, would they send their warriors? No. They would send their dancers. Who wins the dance contest wins the war. And nobody got hurt. Give the loser a big banquet, let him go home. We didn't lose that in, we didn't lose that in, in the United States. I remember in Gethsemane Baptist, and when I was growing up, there was only two denominations, Baptist and Methodist. The rest of the people were strange people. We didn't pay much attention to them. Anyway, I thought the Catholic was some kind of gypsies because of the long rope. So, I mean, the Baptists and the Methodists were the only denomination to be considered. You know, I mean... No frocktail minister came to our church. He wanted to make an announcement. He wanted to challenge our choir. Singing contest. Had about a female amen corner. Miss Elsie. Would you dare come into a Baptist church? and challenge us to out-sing and question whether we can out-sing a Methodist? <laughs> and so he issued the challenge again. Save our pride and our honor. We gathered up our lead singers, wagon, went to this church. First we resented the fact that the church was called Bethel. How dare you Methodists call a church Bethel? That's a Baptist name. <laughs> Out of place even choosing a name for your church. More out of place even thinking that you can out sing our choir. <laughs> so we go to Bethel to discover that the same little minister had challenged about 12 other churches and 12 other choirs. <laughs> and we sang and we sang and we sang. 
and we won, of course. But he took up enough money to burn his mortgage. And that was the reason in the first place. Then, because we had suspicious of Methodists, because they got sprinkled, so they couldn't possibly end up in beyond the pearly gates. But we had some toleration for them. They were at least human beings. So after this singing contest, the method began to bring out more than a slight repass. The Romans didn't eat that well or cook that well. And we ate until we could almost fall. Sister Elsie said, and thanking them, you Methodists sure can cook even if you can't sing. <laughs> and so when we pass Methodist church and hear the bad singing, we bow and said, well, at least they can cook. <laughs> and what's all of this to do with what I'm talking about based in reality about Africa? We didn't lose everything. Some of the customs carried over, but these customs African traditional customs of self-help. We never heard of the word adoption. We're taking in. Some woman would take him, some families, take in a child and no mother, no father. Raised a man or a woman who had no, no papers, no nothing, no court, got nothing to do with it. Now we let the court take away children who shouldn't be taken away. Don't take away those who should be taken away because we have no community coordination. We've got no community coordination in understanding what is happening to us politically in the world. To understand what is happening to us politically is to realize no one came into Africa to do African people any good. I have no exception. You can be as Islamic as you want to. And why not? You created it. But you don't have to follow a bunch of fools and endorse the slave trade and turn your back. Or well, this go rampant. You have to prove everything. I'm saying once you look at what is happening and what has to happen, you've got to understand that there's a point where we missed the boat. We missed the boat because we did not become serious about serious things. So we had the civil rights movement and civil rights pimps, the anti-poverty movement, anti-poverty pimps, the black studies movement, black studies pimps. Once we learned to get these pimps out of our system and out of our life and face reality based on people who assume responsibility and we protect the people who assume responsibility. I am not an admirer of any form of totalitarianism that takes away the basic dignity of a human being. I am not an admirer of Adolf Hitler. Yet, if you read without prejudice, Mein Kampf, that is one of the finest documents on social organization that has been written. Read it without prejudice. And the one thing he says about organization, if someone can do a job and do it well, Doing without corruption, keep all the parasites and detractors away from him and let him do his job. That's still true. 
That's still true. Every time you want to do a job for black people, all the detractors and everybody come around. But everybody wants the front position yes. for the washing of the ego, oh, yes. but not for service. No. No. We suffer from an untreated disease, yes. ego starvation. We are longing for the front position because it makes us feel powerful but does not assign to us the responsibility of power. That a free people must be a responsible people. A free people must be an honest people, must be an uncorruptible people. I could have done many other things with my life. I've never had a fortune or yarn for one. I don't think I could manage one right now because I don't think I can find enough people I can trust to help me manage it. I never owned a car because I can't park very well and besides public transportation was so accessible to me when I had my full vision that I didn't see the necessity of owning a car. And just at a time I thought I would buy myself a little Honda just for my, because the family car was always gone or being used for other reasons. Well, nature, circumstances so fit to begin to extract my eyesight. <laughs> I could have sat down and cried I could have lived on my little pension and social security. But I realized one thing. My greatest facility was still there with eyesight you can analyze and observe. I was good at observing audiences and observing classes. And, right. and I could tell mm -hmm. when there's a dull light in the student's eyes. I'm not to sit and blame the student. I'm not to call him dumb. Give me three weeks. I'll put some light in that eye. I'm putting some knowledge in that head. <laughs> I can't time a motor. Can't even mix a decent drink. But I can teach. And I know. So let me do but I am most able to do, let each one in our struggle do what he's best suited to do yes, yes, yes. and do it well. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to turn the administration, the clerk work over to someone else. But when it came to the analysis and training researchers, and that's something I've done well. I never strive for any great degree. I taught 50 years. I like in one semester in finishing grammar school. I trained so many students in PhD, helped to write PhDs, until soon after I began to have difficulty with my eyesight, answered a letter from University of Pacific, a recommendation from one of my students. But my students informed them that I've taught all these years without a degree of my own. And they asked me, would you want to enter program and get your degree? So I entered the program. It took me all the credit they give you for things you've already done. It took me a year to get my BA. 
in two years to get my PhD. Now, I did not know one thing more with the degrees than I knew without the degrees. Because getting the degrees, all I did was something I was doing all along. Now I did it in a formal way and wrote a paper about it and laid out some research schemas and got the, the degree. People are still saying that, well, you know, you can't depend on him. He, you know, after all, he is a semi-literate, you know, he never, he never actually finished grammar school. <laughs> I don't even tell them any difference. I'm going to close out this by letting you know my main peeve at this juncture in our history is that we have not read documents enough. We have not read books enough. We have not done enough in analysis. Samuel Cardin, who just came back from Mauritania, new information on the Arab slave trade. I had shopping bags for him before he left. People in the South discovered that I wanted material. They sent me two more shopping bags. I got material debates from the House of Lords on the slave trade, testament by those who participated in the slave trade, <laughs> doctor's thesis written about, about some of his victims, some we met in England and, and especially in the conference in Manchester. So I don't debate about what there is or is not. Colonialism was a form of slavery. Neo-colonialism is a form of slavery. The TV set is a form of slavery. Now, I wonder, can you take this, the Bible, improperly used, is also a form of slavery. Now that means that I'm against the Bible? No. I'm as spiritual as anyone else. But I question the intelligence of anyone who thinks everything in the Bible is true or supposed to be true. One of the main reasons they haven't translated the Dead Sea Scrolls because if you translate them properly and understand what they're saying, you have to change the whole thing around anyway. That's right. Then you got to make a comparison between the Old Testament and the New Testament, so-called King James Version. That's right. Version is an interpretation. Man has changed, especially Europeans, literature of the world to suit the sickness of their ego. Now we can cure the sickness of our ego by getting serious about serious things. That does not mean we got to take laughter from our life, love from our life, enjoyment of our children from our life. In fact, we're going to do it better once we understand better. All my life, I have been in love with something or somebody. The somebody sometimes had made out as well as I wanted to. But the something has never failed me. The something is my commitment to African unity, yes. to truth wherever I can find it, yes. and understanding that those in a fight for your liberation need comfort and protection because they are human beings, yes. and that so much pressure can break any human beings, and you cannot judge people 
who change under pressure until you've been under the same pressure and failed to be broken. So you've got to have some kind of mercy and consideration. Now let me end where I began. When we look at South Africa, the special nature of South Africa, the whites enslaved Africans all over Africans and took them out. They enslaved South Africans on the spot. And so when they said they were fighting against apartheid, they were actually fighting against chattel slavery. They were fighting for emancipation. I believe with the legacy of a Winnie Mandela and the legacy of a Nelson Mandela, he is in charge of a holding action so that the real revolutionists can prepare. It's like Booker T. Washington shuffled, scratched when nothing was itched, said yes when he didn't mean it, so that another generation could say, hell no. His sacrifice put up a school. The school is still there. What did you get for your shuffle? You still shuffling. You ain't got change for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> and he shuffled so you would not have to shuffle. When we understand the messengers, just the basic 20th century messengers, Booker T. Washington, Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad. I don't rule out Elijah Muhammad. He was a semi-illiterate who created a kind of Islam that resembled real Islam less the mist resembles rain. And yet, his Islam communicated and created a Malcolm X who took it to a higher level out of which came a Farrakhan who could have taken it to a higher level instead of creating a con game around it. The commitment must be to the people, not to your personal ego. Farrakhan can sell one of his stretch limousines and see a black child through medical school. Did he have a right to, uh, to accept a billion dollars from Gaddafi or a promise of it? People give that money to nation, not individuals. Do he understand a religious state and that the worst crime that's ever happened to people has happened in a religious state in the name of a religion? Do you understood that Adolf Hitler was a Christian socialist? You got to understand history to get out of the way of the dangers of history and to guide your people through the obstacle course of history. But you can't go washing your ego at that expense. A true freedom fighter is a sacrificial human being. And the serious nature of being serious is commitment. It is like a relay race. You carry the baton around the field and pass it to the next runner, hoping that the next runner will do better than you and the next runner after that runner will do better than that until finally we find our way back home 
And once you discover that you are a child of Africa, once you discover how to reclaim the land, then the African state of mind can follow you wherever you are on the face of the earth. It is like a sun that never goes down. But you have to learn how to face the truth about yourself and the whole world and work toward making that truth into an instrument of your liberation. This, in essence, is what I mean about the serious business of being Good afternoon. We have the pleasure of being with Dr. John Henry Clark, one of the world's most preeminent uh, historians on Africa and African American history. Dr. Clark, today we want to deal with the history of the slave trade. First of all, could you give us an overview of Africa's place uh, in world history uh, before European contact? Now, before European contact, and when we're dealing with the slave trade, we should really deal with the slave trade, or at least refer to it as an international institution that touched the life of other people on the face of the earth. When we're dealing with the African slave trade, we have to deal with the different periods. We have to deal with the period of the Arab slave trade that started 600 years before the European slave trade, then we must deal with how and why the African slave trade started. Now, for most of the existence of Africa, most of the time African people have been on the earth, they've been free independent people, free of foreign domination, free of, of, of slavery. The Arab slave trade was the first massive slave trade in, um, in Africa. You have to make a clear distinction between slavery and servitude. Concurrent with European feudalism, systems of servitude existed all over the world. China, India, and some of these systems still existed. But these systems of servitude had nothing to do with and did not resemble chattel slavery. Up until the Roman period, when the Africans, when the, Rom the Romans, with the pressure of Islam, were driven out of Africa, most African states were independent states. We're not talking about nation states similar to the artificial borders in that's in most African states of the day, or the nation states of, of Europe, or the nation states in the United States. We're talking about states with loose borders. We're talking about states with, uh, with cultural borders as against geographical borders. Mm -hmm. uh, Africa had a pretty uh, you know, reasonable time of it inasmuch as you had a society that dictated the land could not be bought or sold. It was the collective property of a whole people as against that of a given landlord. 
therefore feudalism could not um, uh, develop. Mm -hmm. Now while there was domination, there was no land grabbing and land ownership to the point where no man could find enough land to feed his family. With the coming of uh, the Arab domination of the land and with the coming of people who began to claim title to the land mm -hmm. and with the offsprings of the Arabs claiming title to their father's land both in West and inner West Africa and large parts of East Africa you begin to find a form of landlordism that began to resemble European uh, uh, feudalism. Mm -hmm. Now once the this was challenged by the coming of the European, the European did not come to Africa looking for land at mm -hmm. first. He came looking for trade at mm -hmm. first. Legitimate trade. Legitimate trade to the point where the slave trade really wasn't uh, necessary. Uh, the Europeans were using and enslaving other Europeans and had that system of slavery worked out, the enslavement of the African would not have been massive. Mm -hmm. Dr. Clark, let me ask you, I want, wanted to clarify uh, Africans' role in world uh, events at that time. No, Africans had played a major role. See, it is hard for a lot of people to imagine, but Africa, up until the Greek and Roman invasion, Africa was the center of the world. Mm -hmm. That's what I want it to It was the commercial look at. center of the yes. world. It was the intellectual center of the world. Mm -hmm. It was the culture center of the world. Mm -hmm. It was the supply. It was the world's last great geographical reserve. Mm -hmm. you know. In comparison, uh, what was Europe like? And when we, we're talking about Europe, and I'm separating Europe right now from Greece and Rome. We need to separate Europe from Greece and Rome because Greece and Rome was not a European creation, mm -hmm. but a Mediterranean creation. It got its stimulation mm -hmm. from North Africa and Western, Western Asia. There was no Europe as such. Mm -hmm. For many years, the Germans had united, England had barely united. When they finally united, they united over um, after a series of wars, mm -hmm. the Hundred Year War, the War of the Roses, and, and they fought over nothing. Mm -hmm. What was Europe doing at this particular time? And now we're talking about going back to uh, perhaps uh, early B.C. Um, no, Europe, look, to be absolutely honest with you, if you take out Rome and Greece, mm -hmm. there is no B.C. Europe of okay. consequence to talk about. Mm -hmm. So the Europe as we know it today it's literally AD. came into formation when? They came into formation in um, early in the century with the rise of formulized Christianity. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they did not exist, mm -hmm. but they did not exist with the present borders and under the present name. So they made no impact in terms of world culture and no, contributions to the development of civilized man. Not even to themselves did they make a contribution. And they, did, they made no contribution to anything until they enjoyed the cross-fertilization of contact with other people mm -hmm. that gave them a stimulation. Mm -hmm. And in comparison, with Africa, which was ancient by this time, well, by the I, time Europe and Haiti. Ancient, old, and a little tired. Okay. And a All little right. tired because Africa had carried the 
freedom burden and the civilization burden on its shoulders for over 5,000 years now. Mm -hmm. And its institutions were a little, some of them were getting a little threadbare. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were getting a little tired of the maintenance. So they got careless. I and that let the foreigner in. So the first foreigners were Greeks the and first foreigners Romans? were Greeks and Romans, the first foreigners of any consequence. But the really the first foreigners uh, who, to do damage was from Western Asia, mistakenly called the Middle East. And that who, who were these Western Asians? What they, kind of people were they? they were they also they, African people, black people? Or? If you look at Western Asia and look at how the geography impinges on Africa, mm -hmm. you can walk from one to the other without crossing water. Mm -hmm. And if you read a book called When Egypt Ruled the East, you will know that that geography was what ruled by Africa. All right, so we're talking about literally the same people. I've read that there was two Ethiopias. Uh, not only the Ethiopia landmass that we call Ethiopia today, but historically Ethiopia stretched all the way to what we today call the Middle East. It is stretched into Arabia and uh, into Yemen, and what we now call uh, a Kuwait. Mm -hmm. And an Ethiopian emperor named um, Abraha, with two Abrahas, mm -hmm. conquered Yemen. Another Ethiopian emperor by the same name, 800 A.D., pulled the end of the Ethiopian ch Coptic Church out from under the tutelage of the northern Egyptian Coptic Church, mm -hmm. therefore making Ethiopia a strong, independent Christian church, Ethiopia having been converted in about the third century, you know, A.D. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, these states began to function independently. But once foreign influence began to hit North Africa, the nations to, to the south who had cooperation with Egypt began to resent that foreign influence and began to pull away from Egypt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we take a look uh, at um, Africa uh, prior to uh, European entry into Africa, uh, we only have contact with two non-African entities, and that is Greece and Rome. And what period are we talking about now that Greece and Rome uh, began to make their first impact? Now, on Greece world became aware of Africa in its early folk literature about 1250 B.C., in the book called The Odyssey and the Iliad, mm -hmm. uh, written by someone called Homer. We're mm -hmm. not too clear whether Homer was man or woman, you know, mm -hmm. or whether he existed at all, mm -hmm. or whether someone just picked something up and slapped the name Homer on it. Mm -hmm. But but they became well the mysterious Africans, and uh, and they painted the Africans or depicted the Africans as. Mysterious people with a big eye in the middle of the face, you know, mm -hmm. one big eye in the middle of the face. They, they had their whole mythology wrong. But the strange thing about this kind of mythology, it was respectful. Mm -hmm. They respected the fact that a black people existed someplace who was awesome. Mm. Then what role did Africa play in the formation of Greek philosophy and Greek thinking? No. And of course, the, no, this uh, would be later when, uh, with the, with Africa became really the training school for a lot of these Greek thinkers. Mm -hmm. and this is what's so well recorded in George M. James' little book, Stolen Legacy, mm -hmm. and in. Um, the religious aspect is enjoyed, is in 
Dr. Ben Yakinen's work, uh, African Origins of Major Western Religions, mm -hmm. and in John Jackson's uh, uh, book, Christianity Be Before Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, what was Greece like in comparison to Africa during the period that we are talking about around 1200 B.C.? 1200 B.C., Greece was getting it together, but they, they, they had not formed a pure state. It was small city-states. Some of them came together mm -hmm. at time of war, and some of them and some of them didn't. And Greece didn't get it together until she could warm her hands figuratively and, and literally mm -hmm. on the in, at the intellectual fires mm -hmm. of Africa. And so Greece then came into Africa as students uh, to yeah. learn at the great university. And of course, Africa was, they, was, they admit was ancient at that time. All yeah, the Africa was incident. already yeah. ancient. And I think we, we really need to go over Herodotus again, because he tells us about the connection between mm -hmm. the Greeks and the Africans. And, and one time an African scholar lost patience and said, you Greeks are children. Mm -hmm. You're always forgetting what we learn, what we teach you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the Africans were actually the teachers, the teachers of the Greeks. And um, the last one that the African would teach would be Aristotle. Mm -hmm. See, Alexander, called Alexander the Great, was a student of Aristotle, and he collected a lot of the books in Africa, sent it to, to Aristotle, mm -hmm. who edited it and plagiarized and put his name on a lot of books he didn't write. Mm -hmm. Dr. Clark, looking at Africa's role, predominance in world history at this time, uh, and Greece being a smaller and younger nation, how did Africa lose her world dominance? See, Africa lost her world dominance because of something that happened then that is still happening. Africa has always suffered from a political naivete. Mm -hmm. Africa has always been hospitable to strangers without examining the intention of the stranger. Mm -hmm. And very often the stranger is in the house before the African asks, are you loyal to this house? Mm -hmm. So she allowed everybody to come in to and come treated in. them. The open-mindedness uh -huh. of the African in this, in this regard. Mm -hmm. Africa allowed that many strangers, foreigners, into her land that it could literally build a base to effect an overthrow of the and it did. country. The Hitzhaks, later called Shepherd Kings, they came into Africa, at least uh, North and Northeast Africa. They came in as friends and colonizers. They were there for two generations. Mm -hmm. They had no loyalty to the Africans, so they went back and told their friends back home where the weak spots were, how to invade. And they had married African women by now, and uh, they had not changed national loyalty. Mm -hmm. I had, had read that Dr. Ben had done some work that established the Hissos as being a a black people. He's done this is some of his new research and some of the research he went there for, and it, it proved that Keith Seeley and his group could have been right. And while Keith Seeley 
wasn't too happy about black people ruling anything, he had to admit that the same people who were ruling Egypt also ruled Western Asia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether he admitted that they were black or not is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. They were African in culture, and subsequently there had to be some variety of African in appearance. Yes. So Africa begins to wane in its power and in its glory, and it is conquered uh, and dominated, at least North Africa, by uh, Greece, which was the first, the beginning of the, the real no, separation. Uh, you see, Africa has had what I call three golden ages, and it could have a fourth one. The first golden age was from the rise of Imhotep and King and Pharaoh Zuza, mm -hmm. and the third dynasty, 2800 B.C. Oh, hold on, Dr. Clark, let's take a break. Then that Africa had had three golden ages and could have a fourth. Uh, could I you said the, the first golden age was from the... Uh, third dynasty with the rise of the pharaoh Zuza and the great commoner Imhotep, mm -hmm. the father of medicine, the great master builder, the multi-genius, to the invasion of Africa by the uh, Hitzel mm -hmm. in um, 1675. What were some of the accomplishments during that time, if I can actually, was the... Uh, the, ch the accomplishment during the time is that from the third dynasty through the sixth dynasty mm -hmm. was the great pyramid building age. Mm -hmm. And from the sixth through the twelfth was the great temple building age. So we would then, when we say it was a great pyramid building age, we would know then that the Africans would have had to have mastered mathematics, so science, they, they would have to medicine. have mastered all of the sciences, otherwise the pyramids wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. They would have to measure weights and measures. They would also have to, ma to master something else which I assume, without being able to prove, they would have to have mastered hydraulics. Yes, I agree with you. Because there's a new book out now which establishes the pyramids as being a device to control, or to purify and control the actual flow of the um, Nile River. Not the flow of the Nile River, but it purified the water and enabled uh, internal uh, dikes to open and to control the underground water which came up at Elephant Head. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just getting into it, but it does... Well, I haven't read the book, but the author has called me. He's going to deliver a copy here and I'm going to go go over it. But the pyramid served a lot of purposes other than the burial place Yes. for the key. Right, and symbol symbolizes the yeah. highest, um, yeah. um, at least the apex of the accumulation of knowledge it was uh, on the, the face uh, of the earth at that time. It was the greatest achievement in building in human history. Up these, until today? This were master engineers. We have not built anything anywhere that equals the pyramid. Yes, I mean today? Today, nothing. Name everything. Name everything in the world you can think of. Empire State Building, anything else. Name it all. World Trade Center. Well, why? None of it equals. Why? why? Because one is higher than the other. It, when you look at the World Trade Building, you look at Empire State Building, all you got is formula. Mm -hmm. An architect picks a performance, follows the form. Yes. The pyramid, you've got genius that was working on the spot 
and could not have been formalized. Could not have been formalized? Because they started out doing something. They didn't, they weren't totally sure. I see. And worked it out. <laughs> I see, I see. So all of the confrontations that are related to the movement of the planets and the stars and which they were working it out all at the same time. They knew a whole lot, but they worked the rest of it out in process. Okay. I just want to... Um, not only a great project for public works, mm -hmm. while the river was overflowing and depositing its rich soil along the banks, but a great project for learning. Yes. I was just trying to get a view of African people and African governmental uh, processes to establish what Africa was like before European contact. Um, so in looking at so the all we have, as all we have dealt with the, is the extreme action period. Mm -hmm. And all we've dealt with the first phase of all we've dealt with the first phase of the first golden age. Mm -hmm. Now, the, after the coming of the Hitzhak and the recovery, mm -hmm. Africa has a thousand years of peace. After the invasion of the Hitzhak? After the expel. Yes. A thousand years undisturbed mm -hmm. where they start building again. And this is the period they built the great temples of Luxor and Karnak and great schools. Mm -hmm. Although all of these things were started, you know, with you know the. Uh, if there's one set of buildings in Egypt, that was probably built from the genius of the Sudan. Mm -hmm. It's Karnak. <laughs> yes, I've been there. It's Karnak. And what does that symbolize as uh, Karnak Temple for people who may not know? See, at Karnak, it was one of the earth, see, the African has built many holy lands. Yes. It was an early place of worship. Mm -hmm. See, the, the African built many holy lands before Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now, blacks understood that they would never call Jerusalem holy land. Mm -hmm. But the oldest city in Africa that the Africans built solely for worship is Abydos. Yes. And the Abydos models. has never been torn down, never been rebuilt, and it's still there. Still standing. And that is where many of the religious concepts, both in uh, Christianity and Islam, uh, in Judaism, that they were formed so forth were formulated before uh, the religious concepts that went into the making mm -hmm. of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So not only did Africa give to the world um, math and science, but religion, which was formalized and no, it gave to the world the spirituality that was formulized and codified as Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All right. And dogmatized. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about the second great uh, glorious age. No, this time. was... The, oh, we are talking about we're the second talking, glorious We're into it now. Yes. Because we're talking about the age of reco recovery. Mm -hmm. And what did they do with that recovery? from the 17th dynasty through the mighty 18th into the mighty ninth, the 18th, which I call the greatest dynasty ever to sit on any throne at any time in history. Why? At the top of this dynasty stood the great, the, the, the Totmosis family. Mm -hmm. Coming immediately after, was part of that same family, was the First great female rule of history where we have a record, Hatshepsut. Mm -hmm. After her, her great brother, who she 
he stayed his hand in power, but told him who, what power was. Mm -hmm. She kept him out of power for 21 years, but for 21 years he got nothing but training and how to handle power. When he came to power, he was one of the greatest pharaohs ever happened. Was Africa... And, and after him, mm -hmm. the great religious reformer, in the hotel, the, the fourth, known to the world as Akhenaten. Mm -hmm. And near the end of that dynasty came the teenage king that I often refer to as a minor king who had a major funeral, King Tut. Now up until this time, we're talking about a strictly black Africa. No, we that. should not bear down too hard on the word black. Mm -hmm. Because there were varieties of colors in Africa. And the main point is all of these colors were, uh, were molded by African culture. Mm -hmm. Are they indigenous? They were, were they indigenous African they were people? Indigenous Africans molded by African culture. They mm -hmm. didn't come from Asia. Mm -hmm. And they were not mixed bloods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were mixed with other Africans. Mm -hmm. They weren't mixed with any foreigners. Mm -hmm. So Africa has produced on its own soil, out of its own belly, all colors. All Are color. you saying that? Yes. You've got light-skinned Zulus who are not mixed with Arabs mm -hmm. and not mixed with, with whites. You've got jet black Zulus. Mm -hmm. The light-skinned Zulu is not less of a Zulu. Mm -hmm. than the jet black Zulu. Mm -hmm. We're so taken with color in this country, we make something to do of it. They don't make anything to do with one way or the other. Mm -hmm. You've got light-skinned Yorubas, light-skinned Evos. So color You don't have not. a whole lot of them. You might find in all Nigeria, you might find a thousand. In all of Nigeria. You might find a thousand, you know. And they're indigenous to? The indigenous. Speak the same language, same custom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you might find, I have seen in, in, in Nigeria a sprinkling of a, a banner. Yes. I don't know how that came about, but their lip formation the facial formation is identical with that of Africa. Africa. Well, well let, let me ask you about this type now. We're not talking about a European uh, physical type when we talk about light-skinned Africans with a skinny nose and a thin lip and a straight hair well, you, and blonde you've eyes. Got, you've got Africans with, with thin nose, thin lips, who are jet black. How many Somalis have you seen? Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. And yet, they didn't get it from mixing with Europeans or Arabs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you got a, strain, a, a similar strain in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to be clear about what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that we have to pull back a little bit on this word black. Mm -hmm. And let's deal with the word African culture. All right, I they, understand. They are of African culture. Yes. And the culture, of course, then takes in a way of thinking, a, re a religious cosmology, a way of life uh, that involves a different uh, perspective in than different, Euro. Uh, in, in, in a different commitment. Different commitment different. Uh, than the uh, European uh, mm -hmm. cultural uh, mm -hmm. motif. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the, the second glorious age of Africa. Now we, the uh, second, we, 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 we're talking about the second, we, we, we're talking about the second now. Now we got to talk about the third. After the Romans disgraced themselves trying to handle a religion called Christianity that didn't fit the European character then, don't fit the European character now. Mm -hmm. A camel boy began to grumble, and he asked for reform. Failing to get reform, 
he asked for a new religion. Mm -hmm. That religion was Islam, a military religion. They drove the Romans back into Europe. Now Europe had to feed on itself. But we're to, this is the third glorious age I'm, of I'm, I'm, I'm how it began. Okay. And, and what period are we talking about now? We're talking about... And in what year? We're talking about, although the period of true greatness began in this record around the 3rd century A.D., the rise of Islam started around the 7th century A.D. Okay, so between the 2nd and the 3rd glorious age of A.D., we have had an invasion by Greece and Rome of Africa and the decline of northern we've had Africa. Great Greece and Rome, and we've had Rome, the Greeks, the Greeks didn't stay very long. Mm -hmm. Many of the Greeks settled and stayed, period. Many of the poor Greeks were making our better in Africa, so they decided better stay there. Mm -hmm. They integrated into the desert people, and some of them became Arabs, you know. Okay. The Arab is partly of Greek descent. Mm -hmm. Arab today. So Arab he's today, a mixture of Greek the, and Arab. The Arab of the day is probably the most authentic bastard on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. He's a mixture of several things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, now, um, now with Rome gone, with the Mediterranean under control of the Africans and the Arabs and the Berbers, with Africans controlling Spain and the Mediterranean and the markets mm -hmm. of the Mediterranean. No, these markets no longer in Europeans' hands. Europe has to look inside of itself now for mm -hmm. markets mm -hmm. and for mobility. Mm -hmm. And this would continue from the 7th century almost to the 17th century you would have a flutter with the Crusades. Yes. And outside of Europe, they would discover that people had moved ahead of them. Mm -hmm. People had fabrics. Mm -hmm. Europe didn't have. Mm -hmm. And people had something some Europeans had not even heard about. Mm -hmm. Soap. Soap? Soap. Washing soap. Washing soap. Are you saying the Europeans didn't bathe? They didn't? No. I mean, really? No. Look, there's a book on it. I got it downstairs. It's called Day. <laughs> it's called Day. Now, I'm not laughing it's, because it's a I history mean, of I heard it before. <coughs> it's a history of sanitation. Mm -hmm. It was only until the end of the 19th century that Louis Pasteur convinced European doctors to wash their hands before they move from one patient to another. So Europe was, was literally the most backwards people Europe was, on the face Europe, of the earth. Europe was backward when they, when they began to enslave us. They were still back during that period. What? But they were enslaving backward Europeans concurrent with enslaving us. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, enslaving backwards Europeans? Europeans were enslaved to other Europeans. Well, let's talk about the slave trade, and then let's get into that. Let's establish first uh, the decline of Africa when slavery first began. When did slavery first begin, and who began slavery in Africa? Well, the massive enslavement of Africans began with the... <clears throat> there was enslavement of Africans in East Africa before the rise of Islam because the Arabs felt called on to furnish soldiers for the Iranians, mm -hmm. then in control of India. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Iranians did not trust local soldiers, mm -hmm. so they hired mercenaries and slaves. Many of these Africans... So they hired them at first? Hired them at first, mercenaries and slaves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for, for, for labor and for soldiery. Many of these Africans rose to high position in India. One, Malachi, 
became governor of Bengal. Mm -hmm. And another one, Ganges, had a river named after him. Oh, uh, what period are we talking about now? We're talking about now the period the the Iranians went into India in the early period before Christ. Soon after they were driven back from Africa. See, the Cambus invasion from Iran happened in 550 B.C. Okay. We're talking about a period between 550 B.C. and the birth of Christ. All right. Okay, and that continued. But when the Arabs lost Spain, Africans and the Arabs lost Spain, the Arabs began to enslave the very Africans that had been the military heart of their control over Spain. But people are never great for us, to us. People never return our compliment. Mm -hmm. And people never pay us for our favors. The Africans began to enslave the Africans. And when the Portuguese came around... You mean the, uh, the Arabs began to... The Arabs began to enslave the Africans. And when the Portuguese came around to was driven out of West Africa, came around to East Africa. The Portuguese slave trade moving from the south met the Arab slave trade moving from the north, and they found the partnership. And most of these slaves went to Brazil. Mm -hmm. Now, the Portuguese slave trade was a European slave trade. It was a European slave trade. But the Arabs had already been enslaving Africans for how long? Since about the late 600, they, have had, they were enslaved before the rise of Islam. Mm -hmm. Now, when we I'm say Arabs, can we pick out, can we name countries that, that we can identify here as being the main proponents of the uh, Arab slave trade? The main where, proponents of the, of the East African slave trade was the Omani Arab. Find the name Oman on the map. Mm -hmm. Find the name Kuwait on the map, mm -hmm. and you have the find you find the basic area. Now remember, when the Prophet Muhammad was born, half of Arabia was an Ethiopian colony. All right, so so we are talking about then a primarily uh, Africanized Arab. We're talking about. An Africanized Arab who participated in the slave trade. We're talking about an Africanized Arab who was literally created for the slave trade. Explain, Dr. Clark. The Arab, the Arab moved down the coast of East Africa, marrying African women. And because the Arab was not permitted to go inland, and it was spotted on sight, after two generations of this sexual conquest, mm -hmm. he had produced a black-looking Arab who moved inland and facilitated the East African slave trade. A good work on this is UNESCO Documents 2, Slavery in the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So, now we have how many years of Arab slave trade? You got Arab Europe? slave trade from seven. We got it. We got a few hundred years before the rise of Islam, and after the rise of Islam in the seventh century, you have the Arab slave trade right straight up into the the. 15th and the 16th century when they lost Spain and rekindled the slave trade. Now the slave trade is coming into inner West Africa through North Africa. Mm -hmm. The best authority on this is uh, an English scholar now at Northwestern. His name is John O. Hunwick. Mm -hmm. He's written on the African diaspora 
in the Muslim world, I have his article in there, mm -hmm. in my library downstairs, rather. Because I have, um, I made a special point of, see, as a professional teacher, you simply cannot afford to say what you cannot document. So you have documented all that we talk about. I've, I have to I'll go out of the business. These are things people don't want to believe, don't believe, and don't want to believe. Mm -hmm. And to stay a professional teacher, I have to legitimize the public statements that I make. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Clark, now that we've had several hundred years of the Arab slave trade, what impact did that have on weakening Africa in, in lure of the European slave trade? The Arab slave trade drained Africa of the energy and the organization that it needed to stop. European slave trade. Literally, the Arab slave trade prepared Africa for the European slave trade, referred to as the Atlantic slave trade. The Arab slave trade from North Africa into inner West Africa was devastating. The Arab slave trade did not function along the coast of West Africa. And this disorganization spread to the West African states. And the European took advantage of some African systems of servitude that had nothing to do with sending people out of Africa. Explain. You're saying that there was servitude in Africa, but it was different from the kind of servitude. Totally different. You never broke up families. Mm -hmm. And it was always a period when you could get out. Mm -hmm. After so many years, you could go home. Mm -hmm. It was no chattel. Slavery to the end of the day, your day. In some cases, slaves married into the family in which they were slaves. In one, a, one case, especially mm -hmm. in Nigeria, mm -hmm. a slave named Jaja became a king twice in one lifetime. Having been a slave twice in one lifetime, he became a king twice in one lifetime and ruled a state in the upper Niger called Opobo. Mm, so we're talking about major differences between so, so don't be European telling me, servitude and, don't, and uh, African servitude. So don't even be talking about the same, both of them in the same breath. Mm -hmm. And Jaja became so powerful, he bankrupt the British palm oil business in the 18th century. And he was an African slave, a slave of one slave African to a one to African one. house. Yeah. And this house wanted to play a trick on a rival house mm -hmm. because he was so unruly. He said, let, him, let's, let me give him over. And kings were always giving uh, each other's present. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give him a present to that king. Let him drive him crazy. <laughs> 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 and so he went to the rival house. He calmed down uh -huh. and became the chief merchant for the king. At 19, he was handling 50, 000, the equivalent of $50,000 a year. And there was a lot of money doing that. Yeah. <laughs> when, when we would look back at that time. In the palm oil business. Mm -hmm. Now, when the king died, the sons were making so much money in the palm oil, they decided that they ain't going to leave all this lucrative business to be king. So <laughs> they said, he was our father's favorite. Let him be king. <laughs> we're talking about this kind of a mentality that African had for its, its people of servitude. Do you know what? That they were literally not looked at that much different than other people in the community or within the compound no. of the society. No. <laughs> so we are really, then man didn't lose his dignity, he didn't lose his humanity. He didn't lose his family connections. And he didn't lose his family connections. Some Africans are clannish, like the Musi, 
mm. who bolsters their homogeneous. This is, we not only don't integrate other Africans in the type of blood, we don't even integrate their cows. You mean they kept the cows from kept the cows. Don't you mix killed. your blood with my cow. <laughs> <laughs> If you want a wife, go home, get her, get, get your wife, and bring her back. <laughs> Is this still a custom of the Mooses? <laughs> they still a custom. They talk about they everything now, including cows everything. They marry <laughs> French women. Go to France for education, come back with French women. Oh, the Moose is all mixed up now. But he still boasts about it. He still boasts about the days when he, he still boasts about being the most homogeneous. The Somalis do the same thing. So if you have an African, ever an African tell you he's the most homogeneous, don't argue with any of them. Uh -huh. Because you go in the next corner, the next one gonna tell you the same thing. But this is important, Dr. Clark, <laughs> because now we get to see that Africa is not homogeneous and that the different cultures of Africa um, had their own prejudice against other groups in Africa. No, let us not call it prejudice. Because they didn't hate them. But they, they didn't thought beat they up were... On them. They didn't beat That's... up on them. Okay. That's important. It's preference. Yeah, their own preference. But they were not engaged in, in inter-tribal wars. They or weren't as... engaged in fighting the one they didn't... They were not, because that's the picture we've gotten. They, no, no. That no. they fought each other all the time and so no, They didn't fight each captives. other all the time. There were some, some so-called tribal wars, but not over that issue. <laughs> uh -huh. and, uh, the, the Herrero War and what is now Namibia is a good example. Mm -hmm. Because when those Germans drove 60,000 Herrero women into the desert, they could have it or die because the German wanted to create a bastard race. Mm -hmm. The Hereros and the Mambas, mm -hmm. All the other groups got together. They're getting together right now. Mm -hmm. And that sparked that war. But that was not a war between Africans and Africans. I'm trying to get a picture of the inner tribal wars. Were there a lot of them? Did they exist? No. How devastating no. were they? No matter how, how you research it, most of the so-called inter tribal wars started with the coming of the Europeans. So before the coming of the Europeans, Africa was not engaged in inter-conflict. They had inter-conflict, but the bitter, devastating inter-tribal wars, they did not have. I had heard that before Shaka, the, most of the uh, inter-tribal conflicts, and I don't know why we call them inter-tribal, because Africans did not it, consider it, themselves tribes. If Africans don't consider themselves tribes, everybody came out of a tribe. French is a tribe. And so it, it would be respectable if you use it for everybody. If you're not going to use it for everybody, I wouldn't use it for any, anybody. Let's uh, call them nations. Sir. No, well, I refer to Africans as, uh, when I refer to an Asante, as the Asante people. All right. The Asante, I refer to the culture base. I use the culture base in re as a reference. But what I wanted to ask you before the coming, before Shaka, and that would be before the coming of the European, because... Shaka was trying to uh, bring Africa together to fight the European, but before that... To save that, it from the European. He didn't necessarily want to fight them. His main thing is to save the land, to keep them from taking the land. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he was trying to convince other Africans that you have to join me. If we're going to achieve this, you have to join me. Mm -hmm. and when you fail to join me in this regard, then I have to fight you. But before that, in the wars between Africans and Africans, very few men were ever killed in those wars. As, I, as my well, research Well, sometimes if the casualties were as high as 12, that was a big battle. That was a <laughs> monumental battle. 12 men got killed. <laughs> so how can they have a war and, only, and the casualties are so low? But 12 was a big casualty. So then they had wars in which no one was killed. It was a, it, it was a, a contest. If you, if you look at the role of magic in the development of religion, mm -hmm. if you're one kind of priest, I'm another kind of priest, 
Do we have a difference of opinion? I bring my magician, you bring your magician. Mm -hmm. You see, who can outfox the other? Mm -hmm. So I respect the people just sit there and judge, you know, the foxing, the, the role of the magicians. <laughs> In other words, and we have not really gotten a clear perspective on African values and the principles in which African governed herself by yeah. that allowed, uh, that was really a weakness that allowed yeah, for the European it, to come in because... Yeah, because the African transferred to the European some of the humanity he had for himself. Yes. Not knowing that the European did not have the same humanity. So when the European came in with both a demonic respect for life and also the gun, the African was at a really serious disadvantage. And he still is. He still is at a serious disadvantage mm -hmm. in, in that regard. And unfortunately, I think the African educated in Europe who have dropped his Africanness trying to be civilized may also be doing Africa more harm than good. Mm -hmm. George Lennon said something to me years ago while having breakfast in my home. George Lennon was mildly drunk at the time. Mm -hmm. Lennon is such a brilliant mind. And he, he just is brilliant, half drunk. He's more brilliant, half drunk. But most men are dead sober. Mm -hmm. He said, you need a generation of Africans educated in Africa by other Africans for the sole purpose of serving Africa. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the slave trade. How devastating, once the European slave trade got underway, did it conflict in any way with the uh, Arab countries? slave trade that they... It didn't conflict with it in the East because it, the Arab slave trade cooperated with the European, with the Portuguese slave trade. They cooperated? With the Portuguese slave trade in the East, East mm -hmm. Africa. Mm -hmm. The British came into this area pretending that their role was to stop the slave trade. And the British made a contribution towards stopping it only to start another kind of slave trade called colonialism. Mm -hmm. So then the Africans were duped, uh, undermined by both the uh, Arabs having been under attack by the Arabs and the European coming in and uh, further uh, gaining the a African certain trust. The Africans didn't understand that none of them meant any good. How did Christianity uh, impact or uh, play a role uh, with the coming of the European in its further subjugation of Africa. There's another fault of the African. He, he likes to play with the foreign toys you know, of other people. Mm. And the Christianity that the European gave the African wasn't as good as the moral and spiritual way of life the African already had. Mm -hmm. Some Africans are awakening to this fact uh, today. This is well outlined in a book called The Role of the Missionaries in Conquest and in a new book simply called The Missionaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So during the time of this uh, slave trade, how many Africans would you say was lost to the uh, Asian slave trade, and then how many was lost to the European slave trade? Asian slave trade is difficult to re record. The UNESCO documents two dealing with just one period of the Arab slave trade, and mm. say from 35 to 40 million during that period. 35 to 40, 40 million? million Africans? From just East Africa alone. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois and his work, the suppression of the African slave trade to the United States, mm -hmm. says from 40, from 60 to 100 million 
Africans were taken out of Africa, not counting those who died. Lord have mercy. Are we That's talking about figure. both the Arab and the European slave trade? No, we're talking about the European alone at this figure. Uh huh. There's a new figures by an African, a Nigerian, who's, who's, who's checked the logs of the slave ships, mm -hmm. the enter how many they loaded on, and how many they sold. This new man is called Encora. Like, uh, E. A. Encora. His work is in a magazine in Nigeria called Tariq. change that and you don't have to stop mm -hmm. uh, Go ahead, Dr. Clark. It's fine. Um, Brian Davis, Brian, the professor at Cornell has done some good work on this and his slavery in Western civilization and another book, Slavery in the Age of Revolution. Mm-hmm. John Blassingame's work, The Slave Community, while he did not deal with figures, he deals with the situation quite well. We need, yeah, to, look, like I can hear you. We need to look to our historians. We need to read Orlando Patterson's early work, The Sociology of Slavery, his latest work on the subject, Slavery and Social Death. Slavery and Social Death. Mm -hmm. Both Harvard University Press. Mm -hmm. Orlando is a Jamaican. He's a little smug, like most educated Jamaicans. Impossible sometimes. A lot of these people who are impossible for other people to go along with don't give me no problems. Because mm -hmm. they know they're better not. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I like that. Dr. Clark, when we think of 150 million plus Africans having been removed from the African continent, it is easily the greatest holocaust ever on human the human family and the face of the earth. And the history of the world. In the history of the world. The history of the world is the Holocaust uh, transcending the casualties in the First and the Second World War. You're saying that there were more, yes, there were far more casualties than the First and Second World War put together. Yeah. Let me ask you, Dr. Clark, what contribution did Africa make to the development of America, these Africans who were brought here as slaves? Well, the Africa made a major contribution to the development of the Americas. He, his labor given against his will, not only developed the plantation system, but the plantation system in turn, especially in the Caribbean Islands, Haiti and Jamaica was a major factor in the economic recovery of Europe. Mm -hmm. Remember, Europe had dumped a whole lot of uh, white people into the New World, a whole lot of white servants too. And their labor just didn't work out. And had it worked out, they would have used more white slaves mm -hmm. along with blacks. Mm -hmm. There's an excellent chapter on this in Lerone Bennett's book, White on uh, the Shaping of Black America. And the chapter is called White Servitude. Mm -hmm. It points out that the blacks could have been a third people in chain. Because at first it was the Indian, and second it was the indentured whites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're saying then that uh, the African, literally, its contribution is the establishment, the building, the 
clearing of land that the was a swamp, an uh, acre of land then becomes tremendously important. And the railroad systems. And Blacks built the railroad built system? In the South especially. Mm -hmm. And um, the Irish and other immigrant groups built most of those in the West. Mm -hmm. The Blacks built and maintained those in the South and still do. Mm -hmm. What other kind of contributions could one look to that Africans made in terms of their presence uh, in here in America as slaves? The obvious is in the, in the field of inventions. And inventions of labor-saving devices. Mm -hmm. Latimer's contribution to the filament, filament that went into the making of the electric light. Mm -hmm and black invention of basic things like the lawnmower, the hat rack, the spit tune. Uh, when, when you are rich and smoking a cigar and spitting all over the floor and say, boy, wipe that out, boy, do this. Mm -hmm. It's not the reason you, you will invent a spit tune. <laughs> That's true. You right. ain't coming in, boy, hang up my coat. Stand the reason you would invent a hat rack. <laughs> yeah, and the cotton gin, the same. Yeah, uh -huh. stand the reason. So, <laughs> our greatest, one of, some of our greatest contribution was the invention of labor-saving devices and our early contribution to the electrical industry mm -hmm. and, and, and communication. Mm -hmm. One for Granville Woods, there'd be no Western House of today, and no General Electric. Mm -hmm. There be no, wouldn't be there. And um, except for Latimer also, I don't think uh, Granville would have brought off the telephone. The principal for the telephone was brought off. But the one thing Granville had to do, he had to draw and explain every functioning part. Mm -hmm. He was no draftsman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was Latimer's job. Mm -hmm. And that got the phone on the way. I see. He, although he was really trying to invent a hearing aid for his wife. Really? <laughs> Dr. Clark, in terms of the economy of the country, what impact? Did Africa veer slavery make on the tremendous wealth of America? Well, cotton, it, for it made beyond cotton made an impact on the economy and timber and hides. If you got the labor of an entire people for three hundred years and can't get your economic show on the road, you you have to be backwards. <laughs> <laughs> How many Africans were brought here, made it here in terms of uh, not those that left Africa, but those that went through the Middle Passage and actually became slaves in America? At the end of this Civil War, there was about four to six million in the southern states. And that was close to a million in the northern states. Mm -hmm. We try to avoid admitting that really the proving ground, the breaking ground for slavery was the Caribbean islands. Oh, uh, so. And the holding station the Caribbean islands. They would take them there and brutalize them and, and break them in. It's like you're breaking in a horse. Mm -hmm. Well, they were shipped to the United States. So there were more slaves in the Caribbean islands. No, but the slaves in the Caribbean islands were ever in transit. Uh -huh. Once they processed, they would take it to markets in South America and in the United States and in Central America. Mm -hmm. So they won the there was always a stationary group of slaves. There was always adding to that stationary group. 
So at any given point, there were probably uh, at least a few million slaves given labor for over a period of 300 years uh, in America. Yeah. And so the economy of this country up until the day uh, benefits from the slavery, slave labor, unpaid Africans. It still benefits from it because early in the week uh, or last week I lectured in Brooklyn to senior citizens, it was mostly white and Jewish, and they kept crying out, this, what should, we had nothing to do with the slave trade, why should we, you know, be worried about it? And I said that you, you still benefit from, from it. Mm -hmm. There are still doors that open automatically on your whiteness mm -hmm. and close automatically on my blackness. Yes. So the aftermath of slavery is still with us. Not only that, all the wealth which was accumulated during slavery has been passed down to the to the to to the um, mm -hmm. uh, generations of whites who have come after us. So, so we got no the 300 years of free labor has enabled them to mm. be the most wealthy country on the face of the earth in which so they inherited. So we've got no big entrepreneur generation and no big entrepreneur money. Mm -hmm. Sporadically here and there we've got a few million out. But, mm. you know, nothing of consequence. And nothing that they can't destroy overnight if they decide to do so. Mm -hmm. Were blacks ever allowed to inherit property and wealth like whites? Doing, they, not doing slavery. I mean, blacks were never allowed to pass. They had never had any wealth to pass down. They never had that caliber of wealth. Mm -hmm. They never had the Rockefeller caliber of wealth, or the Mellon caliber of wealth, or the Carnegie caliber, no, caliber of wealth. Although some blacks have had considerable wealth. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you one other question going back to slavery, which we skip. The millions of, of, of Africans, and we're talking about 150 million, so why, why couldn't Africa mount some kind of um, a very formidable resistance? How many Europeans went into Africa? Do we, we have any idea? Of, I, I can't quite understand. They were small in comparison to the Africans, but they had something the Africans did not have. And that is the gun. As for resistance, the Africans resisted with consistency. Mm -hmm. 250 slave revolts in the United States alone, and consistent revolts throughout the Caribbean and South America. I've cataloged this a oh, whole long time. Uh, I'll ask you the question again. Uh, Dr. Clark, in terms of the number of Africans that were 150 means and up, and the number of Africans that were on the continent, why couldn't they have mounted a united offensive and repelled the Europeans, since I am sure there were far less Europeans uh, on the African continent fighting Africans than there were Africans? What made the difference? The difference was the gun and the intentions of the European was unknown uh, uh, to the Africans, mm -hmm. and the African was already in the bind, and yet he still re he still resisted. So he did fight. And back. some of the guns, yes, and and this is well recorded, and in the Caribbean islands, and in South America. They seem to have fought back longer and harder with a greater degree of consistency because they had something intact that the Africans in the United States did not have, and that is an African culture continuity. They mm -hmm. still remembered mm -hmm. where Africa was, that they came from there. Mm -hmm. And the European did not outlaw the drum, mm -hmm. he did not outlaw all the African religions. Mm -hmm. He didn't encourage it, but he didn't outlaw it. Mm -hmm. When the United States, they outlawed 
every form of African expression. Yes. And so therefore, and then in the United States they bought and sold in small lots and broke up the lots often. Mm -hmm. So if someone sells grandma and grandpa to a plantation owner, so they're not going to give an account to sell grandma to a place in Kansas. Mm -hmm. If you pick it up by accident, you pick it up by accident. Yes. But then another thing, once grandma and grandpa get to Kansas, they might sell them again within a week. Mm -hmm. The American slavery system acted like a brokerage system. Mm -hmm. This was true of all states except New Orleans Excuse under the French. Excuse me, you're going to have to go back over that again. Mm -hmm. Why? <clears throat> okay. I wouldn't roll it. Oh, all right. All right, start rolling. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, Dr. Clark. The question was, with 150 million Africans being taken from the continent of Africa and millions more on the continent, why could not Africa have mounted a offensive that would have enabled her to repel Europeans, since there were less Europeans coming into Africa than there were Africans. Well, Africans did mount an offensive of assault, but the European had a distinct advantage, and that was the, the rapid-firing gun, plus the fact that the European also had the service of some Africans who had grown corrupt began to benefit from the trade mm -hmm. and assist. Um, this went on for longer periods in spite of the fact that the Africans did resist in Africa, fought to keep from getting on the boat, fought on the boat, some jumped overboard, fought to keep from getting off the boat, and they got to their final designation. And the um, Caribbean Islands, they fought more successfully and more consistently mm -hmm. because they managed to hold on to the Africaness because the drum was not outlawed. Mm -hmm. The African religious practice wasn't outlawed. It wasn't encouraged, but it wasn't outlawed. Mm -hmm. When in the United States it was outlawed. In the United States they bought in small lots and broke up the lots often. Mm -hmm. See, then when they would sell a relative to a slave master in another state, they would not tell you that your relative, your cousin, your grandma is sold to a plantation in Kansas or mm -hmm. any other state. Mm -hmm. You find it out by accident then. So you had no connectedness with yeah. one another. Yeah. And, and so in many cases the language was This different. is why the, in the United States the... Uh, the loyalty system was broken. Mm -hmm. When you break up a people that way, you break up the cultural line, you break up the loyalty system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Should African people, African Americans, receive reparations today, 1900? I think they should see reparations. I'm at odds about how much myself. Um, I'm so ambitious in this regard, I say, give me the old treasure and I'll leave you the change. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why so much? I mean... Well, the supreme decision is made on the fact that, except for me being here, maybe you wouldn't be here in all your luxury. And I think we need to dem make high demands whether we get them or not. To, to, drum, to dramatize the gravity of the situation. Dr. Clark, I want to thank you, and I, I want you to know that I agree with you mm -hmm. that at this point, um, the only people who probably can save humanity is the African race. And I think that the African American plays a particular important role uh, in the future of mankind. Again, I want to thank you for been with us on the African slave trade. Thank you. Yeah.
baptism will confuse these scruples. Have them totally confused. They will try every way to identify. on your favorite radio station, which is what? I thought so. WBAI 99.5 on your FM dial. Just a few notes before we get to the business at hand here tonight. First, I should warn you that my job is to maintain order, and there will be order. I learned from your dear mayor. <laughs> humor and order we shall have yes your enthusiasm is strongly encouraged and but please you know don't attempt to throw chairs we want every last word from our participants to be heard so I ask that you be quiet to allow them the opportunity to present their views and so we will move on if you must move around you know, try to be as quiet as possible. I know it's warm. It certainly is warm here. It's going to get hotter too, <laughs> yes. But uh, they are trying to open up the window or two so we can have some, some air. You know, just this afternoon, I got a call in the office and somebody wanted to know what the discussion was to be here tonight. And I told him, you know, generally what it was about. He says, oh my God. You mean they're still discussing this stuff? I said, yeah. Of course they're still discussing this stuff because this stuff is the stuff that scholarship is made of and that academic inquiry is made of. Tonight we enter the world of scholars who have diametrically opposing views on the subject of the origins and foundations of what we know today as Western civilization. One school of thought is that it is distinctly African or Afro-Asian in origin. The other, that Western civilization in large measure is the bequest of ancient Greece. Make no mistake, this is not a mere difference of opinion in the ivory tower. The battle itself has become an allegory for something as important as the debate itself. Academic insurgents have breached the ramparts of the acad academy's high priesthood, and the battle is as much for the authority to write history and for how to write history. Our task tonight is to ferret out the truth insofar as we can discern it, but more importantly, to question and challenge. And we have four incredible people with us tonight, and I'd like to introduce them to you and have them come to the stage as they're introduced. Already on stage is Professor John Henry Clark. They were standing for you, Dr. Clark. Uh -oh. Teacher, historian, writer, lecturer, John Henry Clark is a unique resource and a special institution in the African world. Beginning in his early years, Dr. Clark studied the world history of African people and became a master teacher. He has authored and or edited more than 30 books 
short stories and pamphlets on African and African American history and is distinguished professor emeritus of African world history in the Department of Africana and Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College. Professor John Henry Clark. I'd like to ask to the stage Dr. Martin Bernal. Right. Dr. Martin Bernal has been a professor of government at Cornell University since 1972 and an adjunct professor of Near Eastern Studies also at Cornell since 1986. Educated at King's College, Cambridge, where he earned his doctorate in Chinese studies in 1966 and at Peking University, the University of California and Harvard, Dr. Bernal's works have been widely reviewed and criticized in many instances as controversial. His chief publications are the two-set volume, Black Athena, The Afro-Asiatic Roots of Classical Civilization, and Cadmian Letters, The Westward Diffusion of the Semitic Alphabet Before 1400 BC. Dr. Martin Bernal. I invite to the stage Professor Mary Lefkowitz. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. You can sit right here. Mary Lefkowitz is Andrew Mellon Professor in the Humanities at Wellesley College. She is the author of Not Out of Africa, How Afrocentrism Became an Excuse to Teach Myth as History, and is co-editor of Women's Life in Greece and Rome. With fellow Wesleyan Guy McLean Rogers, she co-edited Black Athena Revisited, a collection of 20 essays by scholars from a broad range of disciplines who take dead aim at Dr. Bernal's Black Athena specifically but contend generally that the Africa-centeredness of scholarship on the roots of what is called classical civilization is blatant revisionism. Dr. Mary Lefkowitz. I invite to the stage Professor Guy McLean Rogers. Professor Rogers, as I said, is also at Wellesley College, where he is an associate professor of Greek and history. With Dr. Lef Lefkowitz, he co-edited Black Athena Revisited and is author of The Sacred Identity of Ephesus, Foundation Myths of a Roman City. Professor Rogers. <laughs> So here we have a rather distinguished panel, and I would like them first to begin with their conclusions. <laughs> they will have about no more than five minutes to summarize their major thrust this evening. Professor Clark, we will start with you. The one single point I wish to get across before we start anything, I am not here to debate with anyone. I have devoted all of my adult life to this subject. I only debate with my equals, all others I teach. <laughs> Continue, but I'm not clear. 
Go ahead, Dr. Clark. Your treatment. Go ahead, Dr. Clark. Broadly speaking, honestly speaking, the book, Not Out of Africa, a good sophomore effort is not really about not out of Africa. Last year, it was the bell curve. This year, it's not out of Africa. Next year, it'll be something else. This is part of a world war against the role of African people in the history of the world. If we began history, began mankind, how is it that the last branch of the human race to enter that arena marked civilization now think they brought civilization? Okay. Now, it is part of a war over and above Professor Lesterwitz's book and over and above her political naivete. Her naivete is about what is happening in the Western world. There was a recent book called The Tribes. It diagrammed every people, major people on the earth, searching for a piece of turf for themselves. It left out the African people because the other people, including Asian imperialists, have plans to take over Africa. There have been several articles in the New York Times advocating the recolonization of Africa. This book and other literature of this nature mean to prepare the world to accept a rationalization for the re-enslavement of Africa. Now, and when you deal with professional white behind kisses. And as Carlos Cook, you raised to the skin they wear. <laughs> These people, if I'm be so kind to call them that, are running from themselves and teaching us a lesson that we should have learned long ago. Sometimes white wannabes are more dangerous than whites. And sometimes they'll fight you harder to be accepted by whites. They are running from their own people. Two minutes. And running from definition. Now what we need to look at now is how Professor Lesterwitz neglected the white writers through history, the radical European writers who wrote positively of Africa and who identified uh, the relationship of Africa to the ancient Greeks. Now, if given time, and I probably won't be given it this evening, I can prove to you with your satisfaction if you are listening that Rome and Greece was not European creations. These were Mediterranean inspired nations and couldn't be created by Europe because at the time there was no Europe. We'll have to leave it there, Dr. Huh? We'll have to leave it there. Huh? We'll have to leave it there for the moment. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> I now ask Professor Lefkowitz to present her five-minute conclusion. Can you hear me? Yes. Maybe you don't want to hear me. Um, but let me just begin by saying what my book, Not Out of Africa, isn't about. It's not an attack on Afrocentrism. If Afrocentrism means recognition of African achievements in the world, it doesn't seek to deprive Africans of their rightful heritage. 
Africans do not need Greece to have a cultural heritage. They have a rich cultural heritage. Egypt is just one part of it. They don't need Greece. I'm concerned because what is being offered in some quarters as African history is really a European myth. And thus, instead of getting real information about Africa, what people are learning is something that's really 18th century French. It's Eurocentric, it's based on Greek and Roman myths. I do not myself think that one should do that because Egypt itself is so fascinating, so rich. There is so much that you can learn and know and that I myself, as a result of all this work that we have been doing for the last four years and more, have come to know and understand about Egypt, I would like to now spend a great deal of the rest of the time that I have learning about that because it is so different. It's so different from the, what the Greeks thought that it was. Herodotus was very impressed by Egypt. He wanted to say that everything in Greece that he could think of came or had some connection with Egypt. He didn't really understand the depth and richness of Egypt, which went in directions way beyond what he knew from his own experience in Greece. So I am concerned about that in not out of Africa. I have tried to explain why the notion of an Egyptian mystery system, which is basically a French invention, it's based on a novel that everyone has forgotten about, but still you can find in some very obscure libraries, get it up in Boston even, and that that book, which was by a French priest, is based on Greek and Roman sources and tries to describe a Greco-Roman Egypt and that this myth was preserved in Freemasonry and thus came into American culture. So I'm concerned that that myth not be taught, the notion that there was an Egyptian mystery system. Instead, I'd like to see people learn, all people learn, not just black people, white people, any people learn about Africa and the civilizations therein. And Egypt is particularly appealing because it's so old, it's so impressive, its role in the Mediterranean was so vast, and so many other civilizations were touched by it. Even if only slightly, they did get touched by it, and we have to work on that. I would like to say, just in my uh, last two minutes, that from my point of view and the point of view of my colleague Guy Rogers, the ancient world is multicultural and that one cannot study any one bit of it without studying every other bit of it. And the debate tonight, and I hope the debate will go on for many, many years because so many of us will learn from it, that debate uh, should investigate the degree and extent of those links. Myself, as I think you know, I don't think that Greek philosophy was stolen from Egypt. I do not believe there is any evidence to show that. I think that because Egyptian philosophy, and there is such a thing as Egyptian philosophy and deep Egyptian religious thought, which is very, very complicated, and I myself need to know more about it still. Uh, but it's not like the Greeks. It's, uh, it may in many ways be richer and better than some of the concept. Well, you'll have to leave it right there for the moment. Uh, I would like Professor Bernal to conclude in five minutes or less. Well, I, can people hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Professor Lefkowitz that Africa does not need Greece. There are plenty of glorious African civilizations. It's just that it happens to have Greece or to, a to have influenced Greece to a significant thing. This is not an issue of politics, it's an issue of history, the way things were. Now, Greece is extremely important because it is the single greatest source of European culture, uh, and therefore we are concerned with it. And it is very interesting to note that European culture did not begin in Germany or Sweden, but at the extreme southeast corner of 
Europe, and the reason for that is quite straightforward. It was the closest area to the great civilizations of northeastern Africa and southwest Asia, and these, this East Mediterranean complex was the source of Greek, and hence, I believe, uh, <coughs> European culture. Now, that's not to deny that there was a great deal of local development within Greece, and I certainly do not propose that Greek, uh, Greek culture was merely a projection or an imitation of Egyptian or Semitic culture. It's clearly a very distinctive culture, but to try and understand Greek culture without knowing the background of the ancient cultures behind it is, would be as absurd as it would be to study Japanese culture without knowing the Chinese and Korean roots behind it, and no East Asian specialist would dream of doing that that you have to see the cultures as interrelated and that the older cultures and the more elaborate cultures had the predominant cultural influence. I, one of our basic disagreements is that Mary Lefkowitz, sitting in the 20th century, feels that she knows better than the Greek historians of the 5th and 4th, 3rd century, uh, when they said that there were significant influences. Yes, he was very impressed. Yes, he was very Greek. But what struck him were specific similarities. And uh, Herodotus was a rather plodding historian. He said, well, what are the, what's the reason for these similarities? I think they're too close for coincidence. I don't think the Egyptians could have borrowed them from the Greeks because they've had so long, they've had them so long. Therefore, the most likely explanation is that the Greeks took them from the Egyptians. Uh, and this is what I call the ancient model. And this model was not overthrown until the early 19th century. Now, Mary Lefkowitz mentions the 18th century novels, and at times, despite the attention she's devoted to dismissing my book, I sometimes feel she hasn't read it, because I do devote some, uh, quite a few pages to the novel Setos, which she talks, and I too have read it. It had to be sent by interlibrary loan to me. Uh, and I do think it is important in the formation of Masonic thought. But what she does not uh, bring forward is the fact that this was perfectly orthodox history as understood in the 18th century, and going back beyond the 18th century to the view that the Greeks and Romans had of the Egyptian sources of their own culture. Uh, now, I think that the Greeks were, on the whole, a very intelligent people, and I respect their philosophy, their art, uh, their democracy, uh, their science, uh, but I also respect their history, and this is a great anomaly in Mary Lefkowitz's approach, in that she says they're, they're very good in these other respects, but they cannot be trusted with their own history. <laughs> uh, so that I want to uh, bring that out, that one has... Now, she says that modern classics has dismissed all this, and it's true that the predominant view of modern classicists is that the debts to Egypt and Phoenicia, and I don't want to underestimate the importance of uh, Levantine or uh, Southwest Asian influences on Greece, that <coughs> these influences uh, were uh, exaggerated uh, by the Greeks, and I think that they clearly were... Uh, a prop, you know, I think they were uh, properly, uh, expect, um, properly developed, and to some extent, uh, the Greeks may even have played down because they were very conscious of being Greek and proud as being Greeks, uh, and they were affected by two forces. On the one hand, they wanted to plug in to the ancient civilizations and give themselves cultural depth. On the other hand, they were very conscious of being Greeks and wanted not to be uh, <clears throat> surpassed culturally by the Egyptians and Phoenicians who were still very much around. So they had two forces working on them. Modern scholars and modern scholars working in intensely racist 19th and 20th century had no double force. They had the single force wanting to make Greece pure, white and European and the ideological pressure that that put on the scholars led to what I see as the recent dismissal of Egyptian and Phoenician influences on ancient Greece. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Rogers, please do present your conclusion in five minutes or less. Thank you. I'd just like to say from the beginning that Professor Lefkowitz and I are here precisely because we're open to debate about these issues. 
Three and a half years ago, the University of North Carolina Press asked Professor Lefkowitz and me to put together a volume of responses to some of the questions which were either implicitly or explicitly raised uh, by Professor Bernal in his work, Black Athena. And what I would like to do for just a couple of minutes here, and perhaps expand uh, upon this a little bit later, is to set out some of those questions and to give you some sort of sense of what the preliminary thanks preliminary answers to the questions that the contributors to our volume found obviously among the important questions that people have been concerned with number one were the ancient Egyptians black two did the ancient Egyptians or the Hyksos colonize Greece? Did the three, did the ancient Egyptians or the Phoenicians massively influence the early Greeks in the areas of language, religion, science, or philosophy? Four, did 18th and 19th century scholars obscure the Afro-Asiatic roots of classical civilization for reasons of racism and anti-Semitism. Let me give you some sense of our conclusions. Number one, the scholars who have looked carefully at the first question have concluded that the attempt to fit the ancient Egyptians into a modernizing category of either black or white, do so from a perspective which lacks both historical and biological justification. <laughs> did, did the ancient Egyptians or the Hyksos colonize what would later become Greek lands in the second millennium. Unambiguous archaeological evidence to that effect is lacking in the Mediterranean. Did the ancient Egyptians and the Phoenicians massively influence the Greeks in the area that I outlined? There is no doubt and no one has denied for at least 50 years that I know of that there was Egyptian influence on early Greek culture in several different areas. In areas, actually, that curiously Professor Bernal skips over, like art and architecture. The real scholarly question is, can that influence be described as massive in the sense that Professor Bernal means? And the conclusion which scholars from many different sub-disciplines, and not just classicists, but Egyptologists, Semiticists, and African historians have reached, is that the case cannot be made for a massive influence. Furthermore, students of the ancient world propose a very different model of interaction among the cultures of the ancient world in the time period that we're discussing. Instead of seeing a one-way street leading from Egypt to Greece, scholars now are shaping a model which includes many two-lane highways going from Egypt to Greece, going from Egypt to the Near East, to West Asia, and back in the other direction as well. What about racism and anti-Semitism in 18th and 19th century historiography. Yes, there were some scholars who operated from a framework which we would consider to be both racist and anti-Semitic, but an undifferentiated picture of racism and anti-Semitism cannot be sustained on the basis of the evidence. Thank you. Well, you've heard their conclusions and we'll get to the amplification of their conclusions as we go on in the evening. But I wanted first to ask each of the discussants tonight how they came to this particular area of study and how scholastically have they undertaken comparative analysis in this particular area of study? How, in effect, 
are you preparing or have you prepared yourself? We'll start at this end of the table and go straight down. Yes. I'm not sure I quite understand what you're asking. Are you asking how we became interested or what our scholarly preparation was? Both. And Both. I'm asking okay. particularly, in as much as you exert influence yes. by virtue of your scholarship in this area, I'm asking how do you defend your scholarship in this area? How did you acquire your scholarship in this area? Okay. In a way, uh, I am, I think, an example of the kind of training that Professor Bernal has been calling for because I have the advantage of not having an undergraduate degree in classics, but an undergraduate degree in ancient history, which included where I was taught not only Greece and Rome, but also Egypt and Persia and Phoenicia and Palestine. So that's my preparation. How do I defend my scholarship? I don't have to defend all of the different areas which are raised by Black Athena or issues that we're talking about. The whole point of putting together a collected volume with scholarly views by different people is to offer different perspectives on these questions. My own particular expertise happens to be in the eastern part of the Mediterranean from about 1200 BCE to 300 CE. So are you saying that you were a facilitator of a frontal assault? <laughs> a frontal assault on as, what? <laughs> as opposed to, in this book, Black Athena Revisited. If you're saying that you're not yourself prepared to defend the scholarship in this book. No, I'm not saying that at all. Um, I'm, I'm certainly prepared to defend the scholarship in, in this book, uh, but I don't claim, and I don't think that anyone else would claim to be uh, an expert at the, in the 27 different fields which Professor Bernal raises. Um, in that sense, we're all but, but, students but, but of the... But if you'd pardon me, Professor Bernal will defend his own work. I'm saying that you, as a co-editor of this book, I would have assumed, perhaps it's naivete on my part, that part of your role is also to inspect the, the scholarship of contributors to your book, as well as to exercise some kind of scholastic judgment as to their expertise on the subject. I, I think your question is now a little bit clearer, and my answer to it is that I stand completely behind our conclusions, and I take full responsibility for them. Is that clear enough? Well, I was under the impression I was saying what I had to say quite well. Okay. You evidently are having difficulty trying to understand. And that's an entirely different problem, one which I'm happy to say belongs almost singularly to you. <laughs> Professor Lefkowitz, how did you come by your scholarship in this area, and how do you defend your scholarship in this area? Well, <clears throat> I come by my scholarship in this area as a classical scholar. I was, I have an undergraduate degree in classics and a PhD in classics. My work has been widely through the whole field of Greece and Rome. I became particularly interested in a neglected field. It was neglected entirely when I came to it, which was the study of women in the ancient world, half of the women in Greece and Rome, and I think elsewhere in the ancient world as well, were simply half the people were ignored. So I became very interested in that and spent a lot of time on that, which involves many different periods of, of antiquity. I got interested in this subject because I was asked to write a review for the New Republic magazine of Martin Bernal's two volumes, and at the same time I was asked to consider such influential and important books as George G.M. James's Stolen Legacy. So that's how I got into this. I, my perspective is simply that of a person who seeks to understand history and who uses evidence. I defend myself by citing my sources and the materials. Anyone can check these references. My goal is not to stifle discussion or to 
do anything to, I do not seek to indoctrinate, I have no agenda, even though many may be imputed to me, I have none. You may say that, but how do you know what is in my mind? If I, if I am a white person or a Jewish person, does that mean that someone has told me what to say or told me what to think? Professor Walafkowitz, have you uh, been to Africa? No, I have not been to Africa. Have you? Have you studied in Africa? No, I have not studied in Africa. I never said I did. Can you tell me the African scholars to whom you have referred in your scholarship? I have referred to the writings that are in Black Athena Revisited by some distinguished Egyptologists such as John Baines and David O'Connor and Frank Yurko, I, I can only uh, refer to those in detail. I have read many other things, but I do not pretend at any time to be a scholar of Africa and Egypt. I must rely on others for that, including Martin Vernell, whose work I, in spite of his suggestion, I read and I know I could find the pages very easily on Terrasson that he mentions. And he, it is an example of the comprehensiveness of his work that he knows this obscure source. In writing as prolifically as you have on ancient Greece, have you been to Greece? Yes, many times. I thought so. <laughs> I would like to ask the same question of Professor Burnell. Well, my training was not in this area at all. It was in East Asia, Chinese, Japanese, and to some extent Vietnamese. Uh, and the one advantage of learning Chinese, in particular the Chinese writing system, is that it makes you somewhat less frightened of others. I had done a very little Greek at school, and I tried to teach myself more as I did Hebrew, but essentially over the last 20 years, I have been an autodidact, that is teaching myself, but in a very privileged situation in that I was a teacher at a university, so I could go to the experts, ask them naive questions about the new subject that I was looking at, and they were extraordinarily generous in responding to me so that uh, I did uh, get information in this way. I was also given a very broad historical background by my father, who read me H.G. Wells' Outline of History over six years with various glosses, uh, so that he gave me a sense that one could understand history, one could see things in larger contexts and sometimes even in global contexts, and that I found uh, very uh, useful and confidence building. But I always insisted, and I say this in the introduction to volume one, that I am trying to open doors for people who have more uh, or are better equipped in a specialized sense to go through because there are many areas that I look at and touch on but cannot uh, follow through. So I wouldn't claim uh, a, a deep expertise. Yes, I have been to Greece. Yes, I have been uh, not only to Egypt but to Tunisia, to Malawi, to Zambia, to Zimbabwe. So I have some experience uh, of uh, Africa. So I have that background, and I think that uh, has uh, helped me in my general approach. In, in your books, your two volumes, uh, uh, Professor Bernal, the Black Athena volumes, are you suggesting that you initiated much of this information, or are you picking up for, from where others have left off? Well, I mean, I start off uh, looking at the uh, ancient sources, the ancient Greek sources, their view of their own history, but I don't take them on face value. I then try to check, looking at archaeological, linguistic, uh, cultic information of, from other sources. So I was using a multidisciplinary uh, approach, and I am eclectic, and I've been accused of that. But I think in these areas where there's so little information that one cannot follow the rigor of, of pursuing one particular discipline, like linguistics or something like that, one has I, to look across the board. I was referring specifically to the scholarship of African scholars. Yes, I mean, although I must confess that I came to them rather late on in my study, and to some extent I found that I had reinvented the wheel. 
uh, that there was uh, a great deal of what I had laboriously tried to assemble for myself had been assembled, and this was uh, very stri striking in the case of scholars uh, like Du Bois or uh, Sinclair Drake, but also uh, many of uh, Sheikh Anta Diop and others provided extraordinarily useful uh, avenues for me to pursue. Uh, I wouldn't call myself an Afrocentrist, except to the extent that I believe that Africans and peoples of African descent have played many significant roles in world history, uh, and that these have been systematically denied by European and North American scholars in the 19th and 20th century. I think that the degree of racism in our society can hardly be overestimated. We all have it, and it's very, very difficult to see past it. All right, thank you very much. Professor Clark. I came to this subject before I was 10 <laughs> as a Baptist Sunday school teacher. I wanted to teach junior class in Sunday school, so I learned to read very early. What baffled me from the beginning was the Bible itself. I could not find my people in a book that's supposed to be about all mankind and what called my attention to the neglect of Africa was the Sunday school lessons with all those white angels. And when they said God is love, God is kind, God is no respect of kith or kin, I kept wondering why didn't he let at least one or two little brown or black angels sneak into heaven. <laughs> so I began to suggest that somebody else had tampered with God's book in favor of somebody else and that the Bible to a great extent was irrationale for European domination, but had been used as such. Then, coming to, you no, know, after leaving Georgia, after a white man that I've worked for, I, if he's alive today, he has, uh, he's a liberal with a capital L. His name was Gag Steiner. I asked him about some books on the African people in ancient history. And in the language of the South, he let me down slow. I mean, he spoke kindly. He said, you know, John, I'm, I'm sorry that you came from a race that's made no history. But if you persevere, if you obey laws and study hard, you make history someday, and you personally might one day be a great Negro like Booker T. Washington. <laughs> Booker T. Washington was the one thing whites approved of at that time. Yes, sir. All right, while doing chores at a local high school, holding the coat and the books of a recitalist, the book, I opened it, a book called The New Negro, and I found an essay by a Puerto Rican of African descent, Arthur Schumberg. The essay was called The Negro Digs Up His Past. Now I knew I was not only older than slavery, I was older than my oppressor. And my oppressor was the last branch of the human race to enter that arena. Mock civilization. Don't get mad, get smart, prove me wrong. <laughs> now, in the old Harlem History Club, under Willis and Huggins, long since dead, John Jackson, who died only a few years ago, we had to take up a collection to bury him. Charles Seifert, J. E. Rogers, under all of these teachers pointing me to good material, Arthur Schumberg telling me, go study the history of your masters. Study the people who took you out of history. Then you'll understand your history. I started on an old chestnut, recently mentioned, 
H.G. Wells' outline of history, it is still worth reading. It is a good basic outline. His basic facts are in order. When he tells you about the Crusades, he's not, he's not off one iota. But his interpretation is basically Eurocentric to the point of being a prejudiced document. Now, I was reading these kinds of books. I was reading Spingarn's Decline of the West when I was 18 years old. So I began to read European masterpieces, and I began to read European curiosity about Africa. Gerald Massey's sixth volume, Egypt, Light of the World, two volumes. Natural Genesis, two volumes. Book of the Beginning, two volumes. And I began to read Gerald Massey's attitude on religion and his idea that nearly European concepts of religion were stolen from outside of Europe. He was not a historian. He was not an Egyptologist. He was an agnostic, fighting the arrogance of the European of that day. See. The History Club led me to not only re reading masterpieces by black, white radical writers who set the black radical writers in motion. A whole lot of claims blacks did not make until they saw the documents and works written by Europeans. And these works written by Europeans, what black had the time and the money to sit down and do a six volume work? Well, Dr. Clark, I would like you to uh, hold it right there. Yes, thank you. <laughs> hold it right there. You know, sometimes you regret having to ask a question <laughs> and that is so obvious that it almost hurts. Okay, now let's get into the fray. We will have the scholars asking questions of each other, and I'd like to start with uh, Professor Lefkowitz asking a question of Professor Bernal. I'd like to ask Professor Bernal if he could point to some specific instances which he could cite where Egyptian thought influenced Greek philosophy directly and if he could discuss some of those for us. Well, the uh, Greek philosophers uh, were extremely respectful towards uh, Egyptian philosophy, uh, and uh, particularly Plato, and particularly Plato in his later dialogues. Uh, the emphasis on geometry, uh, which was the great strength of Egyptian mathematics and was the center of the Platonic educational system, uh, I think is one example. Uh, I would also think that the system of uh, ideas or forms which uh, Parmenides and Plato pushed looks extremely Egyptian to me, but I can't prove it. I also think that the distinction between worlds of being and worlds of becoming, which fits Egyptian grammar extremely well and Egyptian cosmological notions extremely well, look uh, very influential. I think that the Greek tradition which was that uh, Pythagoras and Plato had drawn from Egypt seems altogether plausible. But what I insist, and here's our major methodological uh, difference, is that I don't believe one can establish proof in these distant areas of history. One has to work on a system of probability or what I call competitive plausibility. What is less unlikely than the other? Given the closeness of the two countries geographically, the contact that we knew, know was taking place in the 6th and 5th century uh, when Greek philosophy began to be formed, uh, the likelihood of contact is extremely high and I think if anyone should uh, have to prove anything, it should be those who would deny that there were significant Egyptian influences on Greek philosophy at this time, as the Greeks themselves associated the word philosophy with Egypt in their earliest references to it, uh, it seems very strange that 
uh, the, cha the people who maintain the Greeks' own tradition on this subject should be asked to prove their case rather than those who challenge it. Well, I think those are some interesting ideas and I would like to think very hard about them, but I think we must also think about the things that are very different and very, very confusing in the tradition, such as some of the things that are said about that Pythagoras learned in Egypt, he couldn't have learned there because they aren't Egyptian particularly. There are some mistakes that are made in the Greek understanding of Egypt. And one problem is in thinking about this contiguity, very few Greeks could get to Egypt over a long period of time, say from the 10th century to the 7th century. Then there was a window of opportunity, but then again the Persians moved in, kept the Greeks from getting there in any great number, and really until the conquest of Egypt by Alexander. I hate to interrupt you, uh, Professor uh, Lefkowitz, but the idea here is to not just explain the question uh, that you yourself have asked, but to follow through based on the response you got. Well, I thought that's what I was doing, but... <laughs> All right, well then, actually we differ there. Uh, Professor Lefkowitz, would you like to ask a question? I mean, Professor Bernal, would you like to ask a question of Professor Be uh, Lefkowitz? Yes, um, as she and uh, the predominant view of classicists at the moment uh, concede that Egyptian art and architecture, and she's just written an article in the New Yorker showing a particular medical view was taken by the Greeks uh, from Egypt. Why is it so implausible to suppose that the Greeks took other aspects of their culture, particularly in this period, I believe also much earlier as well, uh, what is the reason for denying uh, the possibility, which was brought up by the Greeks themselves, of transmission of mathematical and philosophical ideas at the same time? There's no reason to deny it. It's just simply to try and find what these ideas were. Now, in the case of the medical thing that you mentioned, uh, it happens to be a particularly wrong idea. And, of course, wrong ideas can be transmitted as well as right ideas. And this is one thing that in tracing the history of the world, we tend to concentrate so much on the glorious achievements and the glories of Greece, you know, the glories of Egypt. There are also some non-glories and some of the medical ideas were one of them. I think we're all very lucky not to have been living at that time. But I would say there's nothing implausible about it at all. And there is a great Greek interest in Egypt, as you say, and that surfaces very clearly in the later dialogues of Plato. But I think that if you're going to talk about stealing ideas from Egypt, which I know you are not, but others have, then you really have to show some parallel text and show what is done. I think the idea of some influence is something that could fruitfully be discussed and, preserve, uh, and pursued, and I would like to continue to do that and to, and to continue to encourage others to work on that. Do you want to follow up on your question? No, I'll leave it for that. I can have further talk. All right, Professor Rogers, you get to ask Professor Clark a question. <laughs> Yeah. I hardly know where to begin. <laughs> One thing I'm curious about, um, I had a quick look actually at the introduction um, to the second edition of uh, Bradley's uh, The Iceman Inheritance, a very uh, interesting book with a lot of interesting hypotheses about uh, the origins of cultures and civilizations. Professor Clark wrote an introduction to the second edition to it in which he stated that the first show of European literary intelligence surfaced around 1250 BCE with the publication of two books of folklore, the Odyssey and the Iliad. And that struck me as somewhat curious because in fact, um, as far as most scholars seem to be able to tell, 
um, the Iliad and the Odyssey were composed actually orally um, and didn't reach a, a literary form, if you mean by that a, a written form, until probably the 6th century BCE in Athens. Um, there are obviously texts from Mycenae and Crete and elsewhere with real Greek in a literary form from before 1250, in fact, going back probably to 1600 or so. Uh, but this has significant implications for the idea um, which some scholars have put forth that Egyptian language uh, was deeply influential on the first form of Greek that we have, that is the linear B tablets. But that is my question. He, he, uh, Professor Clark has stated that this is the first form of literary intelligence that surfaced around 1250, and in fact, it did not. Uh, and I'm curious how he is maintaining that. All right. It is the first book, and it's a book of folklore, and we really don't know whether Homer wrote it or whether Homer was man or woman. It's the first book to become known, basic to the West, in a form that we could study and conjecture about. And it emerged at the time Europe was beginning to show some intellectual maturity. And if you deal with this, you have to deal with what, what Professor Leslie accused me of, not paying attention to historical chronology and if she read any of my texts, any of my numerous guides and curriculas and lecture notes, she know that I'm a specialist on chronology. I know that one comes first and two comes second. <laughs> but what, I'm, what I was trying to, to get across is that in the 8th century to the 12th century, so the intellectual emergence of Europe, at a time Egypt was in its 23rd dynasty and dying after nearly 10,000 years of some forms of organized society, Europe intellectually was just being born. That's right. That's right. And I further maintain that Europe in general had nothing to do with the creation of Rome and Greece and yet, the challenge of Rome and Greece created Europe because they were scattered tribes and the challenge of Rome and Greece brought them together and they became a people strong enough to create a state. If anybody got any information to the contrary, state the information to the contrary. I maintain that there was no Europe. You're giving Europe credit for things that happened before the first European war. She lived in a house that had a window. <laughs> and I'm saying that you have not read, not just Massey, Joe Massey, and his, his European disciple, Alvin, I mean, Chuchwad, signs and symbols of primordial man, the origins of, of religions, and his extensive work on Freemasonry. You not read the American disciple of, 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 of Massey, Alvin Boyd Kuhn, is who, who is this king of glory, one of the best written books on the Christ story, where he proves that Europe, the basis of European spirituality was taken directly from Africa. Professor Rogers, would you like to follow on your question? No one is actually maintaining that uh, literary Greek culture pre-existed um, any number of Near Eastern cultures. Again, I, I find it a bit curious that... I accept Egypt is part of, physically part of Africa, created by the Africans even, from the South. Even if, even if you... Even if, even if I concede or admit or agree with you that Egypt is part of Africa, what I'm about to say... There will be order. 
Thank you. There will be order. Thank you very much. Do I do I detect some disagreement? <laughs> my my point was going to be that the most recent scholarship about the genesis of the, those two oral epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, points in fact in another direction to influence, and that is in fact the Hittite Empire, whose documents we can read very easily, and there may well be independent confirmation of the historicity of some form of a Trojan War in those documents. And so what I'm really asking is, why is it that we're just really looking in one direction when we're talking about the origins of Greek civilization? Um, when Alexander entered Egypt, he wrote home to his mother and said that he at last reached the land where the Greek gods began, Apollo and Zeus. And he wanted to consult one of the great African teachers of oracles. And the oracle asked, how old is this man? He said, 32. They said, in 20 years, maybe he'll be wise enough to ask me a question that I care to answer. <laughs> Would you like to ask Professor Rogers a question? <laughs> Professor Clark? Yes. It is your turn to ask Professor Rogers a question. Uh, the main, my main concern is that they seem to have equated the civilizations of the Tigris and the Euphrates with the civilization of the Nile. What proof do you have that the civilization of the Tigris and the Euphrates predated the civilization of the Nile? I don't think that I said that, and I don't think that anyone maintains that. I think the, the Hittite Empire obviously comes at a much later period. I know very clear when the Hittite Empire came, I know what damage they did, because I maintain that every pe people who came into Africa, Greeks, everything from modern day English, everybody that came into Africa did Africa more harm than good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that Africa owes nothing to outsiders in regard to development because all of them declared war on African culture, war on African civilization, war on African ways of life. They began to bastardize Africa and confuse and create a kind of historical schizophrenia that the Africans had even got rid of to this very day. And they created whole words that did not previously exist, like Middle East. Middle from what? <laughs> In round two, we will continue. Professor Clark, you will ask the first question in round two of Professor Mary Lefkowitz. Uh, at your own admission, you encountered J.A. E. Rogers four or five years ago. J.A. E. Rogers didn't say he was a historian. He was a such a trying to find the role of the African personality in world history. He worked over 50 years of his life, gave a service, died broke. What gives you the audacity to think that you can dismiss Rogers out of hand? And what gave you the maturity to think that you can judge a writer like Sheikh Anta Diop, the finest historical writer we have produced in the 20th century. Sir, what do you do with that? 
I try to ask questions of all the material I read. I try to answer those questions on the basis of the evidence, the historical evidence. It all, in my view, comes down to that. And I do not wish to criticize any individual at all. I am dealing only with written work. Uh, the people who write that I do not always know and I have no individual or personal criticism of them. This is the way scholars, I'm sure as you know, proceed and that is simply what I did. In my book, I will leave it to everyone who reads the book to judge what I did. Uh, um, I think you have emphasized too much the word black, and we've made the same mistake. Black tells you how you look, but it don't tell you who you are. The proper name of a people must always relate to land, history, and culture. I did not say Cleopatra was black. I quoted someone else who inferred that. My defense of Cleopatra is not on her blackness, but on the, no matter whatever she was, she was born in Africa. She defense, she was the, her manipulation of Mark Anthony and Caesar kept the worst aspect of Roman rule from the backs of Africa. I defend her as an African nationalist. And that's a good, good defense. And no matter what she did with her wares in and out of bed, there's a whole lot of people got less for it. Professor Lefkowitz, you may ask a question of Professor Clark. <laughs> Professor Clark, do you think that we should always judge history in terms of race? Look, there was no such thing as race in the psyche of the world until the Europeans put it into the psyche of the world. The African knew nothing about race and didn't think they belonged to anything called a race. Right. And when the Africans saw the Europeans, because they have a traditional hospitality to strangers, they didn't fight them, they didn't kill, they were curious about them. And with the African explorers, especially Mundo Park, went into Africa, he, nobody hurt him, no, me, nobody shot at him, nobody showed any arrows at him. The Europeans went in peacefully, but the Africans heard that Mundo Park was a pork eater. Most people don't know it, but Africans were not great pork eaters, and they're not great pork eaters today. Pork was a meat you ate in a certain ceremony, certain times a year. But we were not great pork eaters before we came to the United States, or were forced to the United States. But in the United States, we had to eat the part of the pigs that white folks threw away, so we made delicacies out of it and survived. I had this argument with Malcolm X. I said, if it wasn't for the black woman making delicacies out of pig feet, pig heels, guts, chitlins, well, you, you and I wouldn't be here arguing the point. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm afraid that you're not only a delinquent in African history, you're delinquent in African folklore. So much of our history is tied up with our folklore, but Europe has introduced words that didn't exist in anyone's vocabulary before. No one ever thought of anybody being inferior or superior. Intelligent people don't even devote. A human being can't, be, you can't fall into that category. And nobody had the extensive problems the Europeans had with women because in the, in the period of feudalism in Europe, that lasted over a thousand years, the white woman in Europe was a vassal. But the African woman had never been a vassal in that sense. If you read Shekhanta Diop's The Culture Unity of, of Black Africa, dealing with the history of the matriarch, he's got all evidence right there that we were the first people 
to support a woman as head of state. We were the first people to put women as riding ahead of her army. We were the first people to make women a god. I'd like to ask Dr. Bernal, Bernal to ask of Dr. Rogers a question. Um, I agree. I haven't read Black Athena Revisited. I haven't yet received my copy. Um, but... Uh, I do know who the contributors are, and I have read the reviews they wrote, and these reviews, uh, I'm told, are very similar to the ones that originally appeared. So the title Revisited is slightly misleading because these were uh, immediate responses uh, in the heat of polemic. Now, I have no doubt that the conclusions he summarized are the conclusions found in the book, but I'm not sure whether they're the result of an impartial selection, because having read most of the reviews, not all the reviews of my work, I find a pretty systematic selection for Black Athena Revisited from the hostile ones, and other ones which were more balanced or more friendly to me uh, have been pretty, in fact, completely systematically uh, not requested, or if requested, refused. And these include the three experts on Egyptian-Greek relations. Not Egyptologists, not Hellenists, but specialists in the interrelations between the, uh, between the two cultures. And these three scholars' works were, in fact, excluded. And it seems, I wonder, if there's any other explanation for their exclusion than the fact that they would have appeared too friendly or to have taken my work too seriously. And serious is a word repeated in these reviews. Thank you. I'm afraid I have some rather bad news for you, Professor Bernal. Professor Lefkowitz and I actually didn't read just some of the reviews of your work. We read them all. We collected them all. There's 50 pages of bibliography at the back of our book uh, with asterisks next to the current outstanding reviews of your work from 1987 until just a few months ago. As for the selection process of the essays that went into it, I have to say to you that we in fact do believe that we have given a representative sample, and here's where the really bad news is, we actually excluded the ones that attacked you personally or attacked your competence for this field. As far as the three experts on Greek-Egyptian relations are concerned, Two of them that you're referring to must be Eric Klein and Stanley Burstein. Eric Klein has written several articles about those relations. We, in fact, did ask him if he wanted to contribute, but he couldn't meet our deadline. When he eventually did, I'm afraid to tell you that his essay did not actually agree completely with your conclusions, but the reason why it wasn't in the collection was that it came in too late. As far as Professor Burstein is concerned, um, I'm afraid that his essay was much more critical than you seem to believe. So that really is the explanation, I think, for those omissions. I might say that as far as our editorial posture was concerned, we realized that these are sensitive, difficult issues. And we fully expected that we would be in this room here tonight. We didn't know the date, but we knew we'd be here. And so what we did, what we tried to do, was we tried to have what we call full disclosure. It's the reason why the book turned out to be not just another 150-page book with some essays sort of thrown together, but a book which attempts to give summaries of comprehensive accounts of the questions that Bernal raises. And we give Bernal full credit for raising those questions. I think that Professor Clark and others are quite correct. Professor Bernal is not the first person to raise those questions. But, in fact, he raised them in a compelling and interesting way. And we feel that we are giving him and those of you who are interested in these problems, as we are, complete respect, both by answering them in full and by being here tonight to defend our views.
I, I want to just, if I might... Uh, uh, yes, please do. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> I don't expect any scholar to agree with me entirely, and what I found with the reviews, he said, is that they did not agree with all I said, but they took what I said seriously, and they did agree with some significant things. I don't want uh, uh, total praise, and I'm sure they're right that the predominant reaction from the disciplines which I am challenging is hostile. I don't uh, question that for the moment. But the selection uh, does include, I'm told, uh, personal attacks on me as being a baby and various other things. So I don't think they've been quite so scrupulous as far as uh, that is concerned. I'm also intrigued because uh, one person who had attended the meeting, uh, the party given for the contributors to the book, which of course I was told nothing about, uh, described it as a lynch mob. Uh, another mutual friend of Mary's and mine uh, refers to it regularly as the shit on Bernal book. Uh, that there's a, and so I think there are very different perceptions uh, of this book. Is, is that a title that you come up with on the spot, or is it something you've been thinking about, Professor Banal? Uh, it's a title that uh, a mutual friend of Mary's and mine uses regularly. He's a colleague at Cornell. It's not, I wouldn't have thought that up. I think, I think that if you look carefully, and I'm sorry that you haven't had an opportunity to work through the book carefully yet, um, I think when you do, you will see that there are not very many uh, ad hominem attacks in it. Although I find your defensiveness about that somewhat curious since in Black Athena, volumes one and two, Part of your methodology has involved actually contextualizing people and talking about their family relations, their own personal backgrounds. And so uh, I, I'm a little bit puzzled by that kind of response. I have no objection to people uh, attacking me personally. I, what I would like to see is a all-round uh, collection. And I think that as I live by the sword of sociology of knowledge, I must be prepared to die by it. Uh, and uh, I think that people will see in 20 years where I'm coming from or what my personal problems or axes were. But, uh, and I think that's part of the story of the book. But I think there's also the substance of the book. Uh, and I would have hoped to have found more, uh, a wider scan. And we've had many collected volumes on this. I mean, don't think this is the first response to my work. There have been three, four journals now have had selections of articles on my responses and their responses to my responses, and there has been real dialogue. This was a book which I was not told about till long after it had begun, and when I was told about it and asked if I could see the pieces to write a response, I was told there was to be no response, and furthermore, that the responses that I had published to the articles criticizing me were not to be included. This does not seem to me opening the deba debate, it seems to me stamping out heresy. We will have a free-for-all uh, in a minute. But I wanted to follow up on a phrase that you said, and I didn't want to leave it uh, unaddressed, the issue of full disclosure. And it is to that I'd like to ask uh, the question of Professor Lefkowitz. Are you comfortable with the fact, you obviously were comfortable with the fact that your book, Not Out of Africa, subtitled How Afrocentrism Became an Excuse to Teach Myth as History, was underwrite written by several foundations that have uh, reportedly rightist leanings. I wondered whether this was a reflection of your own personal or ideological view, or whether you were just so cash strapped that you took money from anyone. <laughs> No one tells me what to think and no one tells me what to say except me and the main financing of this book was out of my own pocket. But surely you can appreciate the, the color of accepting fu uh, uh, funds from foundations that do not enjoy wide acclaim and receptivity. And I thought that maybe there was some concern on your part, in as much as you were interested in integrity, scholastic integrity and all, that you might have 
foregone the grants in the interest of academic and scholarly integrity. If they had asked of me to do anything, I would not have accepted these grants. They did not do that. Therefore, I didn't, the grants did not go to me, they went to Wellesley College, which had no objection to taking the money. But still the question remains. You have a duty, do you not? In as much as you are preparing work, uh, the aim of which is to overturn the revisionism, you say, that is going on in black studies, particularly in African studies, this whole battle that you have been dealing with in terms of Afrocentricity, do you not, regardless of where Wellesley cho chose to accept money from, do you not, as a scholar, have an obligation to discern where this money is coming from, to see whether the source is compatible with your own views as a scholar? I did not see anything in the conditions of the grant that uh, inhibited what I did and what I meant to do or say or think. I believe that I acted with perfect integrity. Now you may disagree with that and you may disagree with the aims of those foundations and other foundations and that is a, what we do in a free country. Until they are outlawed, I don't see what else can be done. Well, let me ask you the question perhaps more directly. Had there been, say, a foundation to wipe out scholarship of any sort, if such a foundation were to have given money to Wellesley College, would you have found it equally acceptable to take money from such a foundation to further your work? I don't know what foundation you're talking about. This seems to be a, it totally was a hypothetical answer. question. It's totally hypothetical. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're trying to force me to say or to go, to compel no, I, I, me no, into I, please into do understand. I, I'm you're not, to put me. Uh, no, I'm not you forcing you. Go ahead and attack me. Do. I'm not That's forcing fine. you to you're say anything, to Professor me. Lefkowitz. I'm just trying to elicit a cogent response from you. Well, you be the judge of my response. All right. Okay. In this last round, before we get to questions, and we will get to questions, but let me warn you: you ought to have questions. Uh, that are questions, not lectures, and that are straight to the point. In this round, it will be a free-for-all in which all of the discussions are permitted to ask questions of each other and to chime in responses whether they are asked the question directly or not. Will we have time to sum up? Yes, you certainly will. Um, your treat. I think we should... Oh, 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 oh. I just wanted Professor Lesterwitz to know some basic information about the concept of Afrocentricity. Uh, there's a lot of people who believe in the African awakening and discovering of their history and their culture who do not accept the word Afrocentricity because it's a compromise with the word African. It's either African centricity or it's nothing. And if she attacks Afrocentricity as the teacher of myth, have she attacked the nonsense about Columbus discovering America? <laughs> because he discovered absolutely nothing and he committed an act of genocide. He set in motion an act of genocide ten times worse than the act of genocide in Europe called the Holocaust, as though that was the only Holocaust in the world. That event in Europe was wrong. And even if only six people were killed, it was wrong. But it was a matter started in Europe by Europeans that should have been solved in Europe by Europeans. I, I'm sure that you're aware, uh, as we are, that there is a spectrum of Afro and African centric views. I'm a little bit curious what you think then of the work of Asante, uh, who, as far as I know, does call himself an Afrocentrist. Are you saying that Professor Asante's work actually is flawed conceptually? 
I'm saying that all work under the guise of Afrocentrism is not perfect, but it is an, un an earnest effort to restore Africa to a proper commentary in human history. I think Professor Sanchez's work is written too fast, and there's some things he hasn't checked out as well as he need to, and I think too many times Afrocentricity becomes a personality cult, but that don't mean that I'm against African people discovering their, their history, their literature, their place in the political science of the world. That don't mean that I have not played a role in encouraging people to write about Africans and all the societies of the world. See, your talk keeps telling me what you have not read. You could not have been asking these questions about Afrocentricity if you have not read Anacalypsis, two volumes dealing with the massive uh, uh, explosion of African people throughout the whole world. You could not possibly have read with any degree of understanding the three volumes, Africans in early Asia, Africans in early Europe, Africans in early America. We're not talking about no hearsay. We're talking about documents. Or J or, 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 Professor Joseph Harris's book dealing with the global dimensions of the African hollow, uh, dispar. I, I don't know, I mean, you, you, you keep telling me, you keep confessing your ignorance with your questions. You have not read, I'm, I'm telling you, be, before Afrocentricity, radical Europeans had pioneered in this work. Now, I haven't even mentioned the radical black writers that you probably have not read. Now, if you read Chancellor Williams' chapter two in the book, Destruction of Black Civilization, yeah. read that chapter two called Egypt, Ethiopia's oldest daughter. And it deals with the Southern African origins of Egypt. If you read a book called Nubia, Corridor to Africa, once more you've got, it. also you got the early Arab slave trade. I keep saying nobody came into Africa through African people any good. After the Romans had disgraced themselves trying to be early Christians, <laughs> the Africans thought that by accepting Islam, they could get the Romans off of their back. They were right, they did get the Romans off their back, but the Arabs replaced the Romans on their back and the Arabs are still on their back. Speaking of book reading, um, I'm a little bit curious then, one book I have read is Civilization and Barbarism in which a scholar that we've talked a little bit about has written that the 18th dynasty in Egypt quote colonized all the Aegean Sea and consequently brought the region of the world out of proto-history into the historical cycle of humanity by the introduction of writing linear A and linear B and I'm quite curious what Professor Banal thinks of such a hypothesis. Uh, clearly, uh, linear A and linear B do not come from Egyptian hieroglyphics. It is an Aegean and an Anatolian script. On the other hand, there's no doubt that Egyptian relations with the Aegean intensified a great deal during the 18th dynasty, and we have documents and paintings representing what the Egyptians interpreted as people from the Aegean bringing tribute to Africa. We also have scholars uh, like Professor Redford in Toronto who takes it for granted that there, were reg there was regular correspondence between the court in Mycenae and the court in Thebes. And there's no doubt which was the more powerful state. There is archaeological evidence of contact at that time. Uh, but Greece was already literate in its own scripts of uh, Linear A and Linear B. I was rather intrigued by Professor Rogers mentioning texts, Greek texts in the 16th century. I, I don't know what he's referring to there, that the Linear B texts are two or three centuries later. But that's a side issue, I agree. Actually, it's not a side issue. I'm afraid that Chadwick and others have now updated uh, the earliest linear B tablets, but I would like to come back to you for a second now that we're talking about the 18th dynasty, because as I'm sure you know, the funeral stele of Amenhotep has been used actually to make some claims by some scholars about 
Egyptian dominion at that time over the Aegean. But since you've mentioned uh, Professor Klein, in fact, uh, both Professor Klein and Professor O'Connor at the Institute of Fine Arts here in New York, I think have shown fairly clearly that this in fact is not the case. Um, so this leads me to onto a point, this leads me onto a point about source criticism, and I would like to raise this as a general point that one of the very curious things to us about Black Athena is that it does appear to us that the rules of the sociology of knowledge appear to apply to scholars of the 18th and 19th century, but not, for instance, to Herodotus or texts which seem to support Professor Bernal's point of view. And I'm wondering then what, since we're speaking of principles of selectivity, what then the principle of selectivity for the sociology of knowledge might be? Um, the reasons why, I mean, I don't accept Herodotus uncritically. I think one should try and check Herodotus wherever possible, but I think one should also check the 19th and, 18th, 19th and 20th century scholars thoroughly. The reasons why I, on the whole, incline to believe Herodotus more than the 19th century scholars, I... since last October, I believe. September, last time he was here. But this, this man can speak at the Slave Theater every Wednesday, whenever he gets ready. And he's known all over the world. And I don't care where you are, everybody knows John Henry Clark. And we are so fortunate to have him with us, and so I would like for everybody to stand on their feet and put their hands together for our scholar, our elder, our hero, Dr. John Henry Clark. Dr. John Henry Clark. Dr. John Henry Clark. <laughs> Dr. John Henry Clark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I 
I'm going to be talking about a subject that has no end because the subject keeps coming back to us and we keep misunderstanding it. But before I start, uh, permit me a brief personal note because since I've seen you last, I've passed a landmark I never thought I would reach because in my radical young days, picketing and challenging police, I never thought I'd get 60. All right. But I, I passed, uh, I'll pass my, uh, reach my 80th birthday since I've seen you. I went to Columbus, Georgia, where I grew up, and went to school up until the seventh grade. All right. Well, my sister, I have a sister who dearly loves me, got all of my books lined up and shelf, and she boasts about her brother who writes books tell people don't put your fingerprints on these books and don't be bothering my brother's books right. I wish somebody would bother them long enough to read them right. <laughs> I wish somebody would wear one out so I could replace it but I was among some old friends who still survived and my fourth grade classmates about three of them are still around. I came home to do some serious eating. You northerners don't know a great deal about this good southern cooking. And my sister, who loves me so much, forbade me to eat these old dishes like crackling bread. Sauce, or any part of the pig. <laughs> Got plenty of food now. The pig is the cuisine of our survival. We were not a great pork eating people in Africa. And we're not a great pork eating people in Africa right now. All right. But being enslaved, we had to eat what the white folks threw away. Right. So they threw away the pig's feet. Right. We, make it, we made a delicacy out of that. Right. Threw away the head. Right. We made sauce and other things out of that. Sometimes they threw away the skin. We fried that and took some cornbread and mixed it with little onions and made crackling bread. All these things I, I can't eat anymore, and yet I had a wonderful time at home. Then went to Atlanta for five more days with colleagues and, and friends. And, I didn't think about being 80 because I work at something seven days a week. And nothing would bore me more than protracted rest. All right. <laughs> the struggle is my norm. Being outside of the struggle is abnormal. I am from that generation that has never known peace right. and never expect to know peace. Right. 
We will struggle to the end of our lives so that another generation will know peace. We are the sacrificial generation. This is why we do not understand Booker T. Washington. He scratched his head when nothing itched. He laughed when nothing was funny. He said yes when it didn't mean yes. So that another generation can say, hell no. Came your time to say, hell no. You didn't say it. All right. To the subject, the world war against African history. All right. I'm saying you do not understand the issues of today because you do not understand the nature of that war right. that has been mounted against you to remove you from the commentary of history and to say you have no history and to remove you outside of humanity right. and to say, God, do not love you. No, God loves you, so therefore when a crime is committed against you, no sin because you're not the child right. of any God. Right. And this is what is happening to you now. And this is why you do not understand. You keep protesting when people are acting rather normal according to their norm. And they will continue until you set your norm. All right. And the only way you can set your norm, you have to understand how to handle power. Right. If you had independent states in Africa, all independent, if they united and say, Nothing will go out of Africa. No metal, no zinc, no manganese, no gold, no diamonds, no cobalt. They can close down Western industry. That's power. But when those things that belong to you are in the hands of other people, when you do not know enough about your own history, to seize your rich prerogatives, you pay for it by being reduced to servitude. All right. Now I'm going to devote some time to the president of Rutgers and his remarks and to three articles that just appeared in the city sun on the Arab slave trade, the present day Arab slave trade. Too many things have happened in the name of religion that has nothing to do with religion at all. all right. These are customs drug into religion by the foreigners and the fakers and the fools who gain control of the religion for power reasons. There is nothing in any religion that separates men from women. And yet every organized religion that you know of downgrades the role of women. All right. Every organized religion you know of a male chauvinist murder cult. All right. All right. All right. All right. Now you have to understand the difference between religion and spirituality. Because religion kills spirituality. Religion is the house organ of a bunch of gangsters. Spirituality has humanity. You do not kill anybody in the name of spirituality. And yet two world wars were launched in the name of God. And a number of smaller wars were launched in the name of God. People program other people to be less than other people and proclaim themselves Christian 
Hitler was a Christian. He not the kind of Christian I am, or I was. The Ku Klux Klan of Christian and proclaim themselves Christian. Now when he, he says he's a Christian, he prays to the same God you pray to, and he's not struck dead, who is he lying to? Is it the same God you pray to? A one his warped mind created. Now, you are shocked because of what the president of Rutgers had to say about IQs in minority group passing it. SAT. I would be shocked if he didn't say it and didn't say more. All right. Some of our children did not pass a white test created by whites for whites, and white children get advanced schooling in the test so they can take the test and pass it, and some of them get the answers ahead of time. And if they pass it, not because they're smarter than our children, but because they had the answers ahead of time. And they're taught how to pass these bogus tests. And there's no, no proof of their intelligence in the first place. Now he said it was a slip of the tongue. And maybe he could have been. But he is mild in comparison to others. He articulated what others are thinking under their thinking words. And this is nothing new. We begin to discover these things. Now we want to burn down schools. You came out of integration with some misconceptions. We should have we should continue to build the predominantly black colleges. We could have built any predominant black college could have built into a school better than Harvard University. Why didn't you do that? Right. No, you just had to be close to them. Right. You had to be near them. Right. You thought we well, got the NACP syndrome. You soak up education through osmosis by just being near them. Huh? No, no. They didn't teach your history. They didn't respect your history. They didn't look at you as a people with a history. How do you think they're going to control the world? Once you understand who you are, you will demand your prerogatives. You will demand the right to rule. They are more sophisticated now than they were 50 years ago. They don't send soldiers to conquer you anymore. They send a loan. They send dollars. Then they tell you when to devaluate your money. They even tell you who to buy. They even tell you who to, who's going to be prime minister of your country. They are more ruthless now and more imperial now than they were before the so-called colonies fell apart. All right. You're more colony now. All right. Because you don't see their hair. You do not understand the nature of their history. You not only must understand your history and how it is manipulated, you must understand their history. When I came to New York and after reading a, an essay by Arthur Schumburg called The Negro Digs Up His Past, and when I finally found Arthur Schumburg and I wanted to know, I was a teenager then, so teenagers are this silly. 
I want to know the history of all of the African people, the Negroes and those in Africa, henceforth within the hour, his lunch hour, all of it. He said, sit down, son. What you're calling Negro history and African history are the missing pages of world history. Son, go study the history of your master. Go study the history of the people who took your people out of history. Go study their sick need to take you out of history. If they had to take you out of history, then you've got something that they fear. You've got something that they do not want to compete with. They do not want to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with you as an equal. Their announced in superiority complex could be the flip side of an inferiority complex. I began with an old chestnut, still worth reading, incidentally, H.G. Wells' Outline of History. It's Eurocentric, it's white in all its attitude, but the chronology is impeccable. His dates are in place. His events are in place. Now you can go over all of this and Africanize it. All right. He's done your work for you. He tell you what happened when. And he, he show you exactly where he left you out. Mm. He had the Crusades. The European emphasis. And he leaves out the fact that the Ethiopians And the Coptic Church did not join the Crusades. That the North African Church did not join the Crusades. This was a European matter. He leaves out, he glorifies Richard, the so called lion hearted, without telling the real truth about Richard. Richard wasn't lion hearted, he wasn't even religious. He didn't even go to the Church of England. So, what's what? What's he on the crusades about? To rescue the holy grail that wasn't holy in the first place and wasn't even lost in the second place. <laughs> they wanted to marry him off to some homely, flat breast princes. And he wanted to get the hell out of England and keep him married at once. <laughs> he was a coward, right? <laughs> Running from his royal responsibility. <laughs> John the Crusades and, and man. <laughs> Are you going to tell you that part? You got to read some other books to, to get that part. All right. Now, back to this president of, of Rutgers and his apologies and all the fuss is over. I think the students should have made that point known, and once it's so well known, they should get off the picket line and go into the book and show, show him how well they can study and how, what good marks they can make, though they are going to a school ruled by whites. They can even take their books and on their terms and still beat them. Right. And some approve that. Paul Robeson went to some of the same schools. He ended up speaking over 20 different languages. Football star. And when they announced the great football team of that day, they, they had a 10-man team. They left ball off of the team. He just now made the Hall of Fame. 
all those people that played the Hall of Fame and Paul Roby did ten times more, and he's just now made the Hall of Fame. This is the last few years. That's the school where Paul went. Became a lawyer, but, but, but a man who stood on the line for principle. He could be making two million a year. His salary was reduced to six thousand dollars a year sang in his brother's church the same people who milked him dry using his voice to raise money and when he was reduced and he was singing in his brother's church and he insisted that the, that the fee be in a manner that the common people could hear him five dollars and three dollars the same people who had bled him dry weren't even there now he had an all black audience One of the most brilliant men we produce came out of the best school where that man is president. All right. All right. Good repudiation of what he said came past the SAT All right. test. All right. I imagine if Ravis was making up a test as to who would go into the brow patch, they wouldn't make up a, they would make a test that a fox came past. Because they don't want him in the bar patch. All right. <laughs> All right. This is what you have to understand. This world war to deny your humanity by denying your history. Now let's look at the three articles on the Arab slave trade in the city sun. This is delicate now. Because the brothers think that by being Muslim, you've got to endorse everything Arabic. If you want to know the difference between a religion and a religion, go into a white church one Sunday and go into a good black church the next Sunday. It's a different, not only a different, it's a different religion. You don't necessarily have to approve of everything Arabs do in order to be a Muslim. All right. All right. The Arab is a pseudo white. He's a white ass kisser because he wants to be white. He wants acceptance by whites. He will do the same thing whites do, downgrading you. He was in the slave trade before Islam and he never got out of the slave trade. He's killing Africans in the Sudan because they are not Muslims. He's killing Africans in Mauritania who are Muslims but happen not to be Arab. One day African people will have to mount a case against the Arab and let him know if you're going to live in Africa, you're going to live on African terms All or right. find some new geography on which to live. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Mount a campaign, drive the slave trading, womanizing, raping dog into the sea and still be a Muslim on your terms. All right. Because we buy things and swallow the hook, line, and sinker, none of the brothers have taken time out to study revolutionary Islam in Africa. That was used as a rallying cry against the Europeans. But if you don't know history, you won't know how to deal with this. Islam in Somalia, under the leadership of Muhammad. Ben Abdullah Hassan, 
called the Mad Mula of Somali, was revolutionary, anti-imperialist Islam. The Islam under Muhammad Ahmed in the Sudan, they unified the Sudan and drove the British out of the Sudan was revolutionary Islam. And when Arabs came down with the British from Egypt, he called them a bunch of dogs unworthy of the faith. And he was a devout Muslim. You think you got to agree with everything a damn Arab have to say in order to be a Muslim? The Arab is the most corrupt element within Islam and the lowest in morality. The United Nations, all kind of committees have documented this. You chuck on the answer, it's all a lie. Everybody's a lie. I mean, no, no document is true. I have on my, just on my desk, 11 books on the Arab slave trade. And all I'm doing is a chapter. Not a book. The United Nations have documented this in, in, in documents too, especially that leading chapter, slave trade in the Indian Ocean. When we deal with the relationship of the Arabs with the Africans, we should read a book called The Arab Conquest of Egypt. It's been reissued by A and B Press. You can get it in paperback. The Arabs proposed Islam as an alternative to Roman rule. The Africans saw by adopting Islam they'd get the Romans off of their back. They did. But the Arabs replaced the Romans on their back, and he's still there. Look at every North African country. The black population is to the south, and the black population is in servitude. I'm not talking about something happened yesterday, but something is happening right now. The Arabs destroyed the effectiveness of the organization of African unity. They want no unity in Africa. To speak against the Arabs is not to speak against Islam, except for Africans that been no Islam. How many times do I have to tell you Zaid bin Harith and Bilal, both assistants to the prophet, helped to bring the religion into being. But the brothers are so sensitive, they think nobody taught the prophet Muhammad. Well, his rich wife hired these two literate men for the purpose of teaching him. Bilal is classified as a slave. They were both, Bilal and Zayd bin Harid were Ethiopians. Now you classify them as a slave, Bilal was a lawyer who was captured and reduced to servitude. The rich wife of the prophet bought him out of servitude because he was a literate man. The one thing that is difficult for you to understand is that most people who come down to us as gods were illiterate. There is no proof that Jesus Christ could read and write. Buddha was the exception. 
because you cannot equate reading and write, writing with great wisdom. There were men who had great wisdom, great leadership, who could not read and write. I'm not advocating it, but this is a fact. Now, once you study Zayd bin Harith and Bilal, that once the prophets was under pressure in Arabia, he told these two key followers, go to Ethiopia, go to that land of righteousness where no one is wrong. Look at that reputation. The Ethiopians had. The Greeks called them the favorites of the gods and the tallest of men. There in Ethiopia, his followers waited out the storm and the controversy. Some converted Ethiopians to the faith. Some married Ethiopian women and never went home. And if you see some of the Ethiopian women, you can understand that. <laughs> On his deathbed, the prophet was supposed to say Islam will never forsake Ethiopia when Ethiopia is in distress. No nation in Africa has suffered more at the hands of Islam than Ethiopia. The Muslim from Eritrea backed by Muslim Zalak Qaddafi destroyed the political effectiveness of Ethiopia. She's literally a weaker nation. At what point in our history are we going to understand that powerful people cannot afford to train you in the technique you need right. because if they train you, you take their power away from them right. because they've got power they took from you. Right. If we were serious about South Africa, we would have had no demonstrations, no loud noises. We would have started 50 years ago quietly smuggling young men and women out of South Africa, sending them to the best schools of administration, sending them to the schools of harbor management, airport design, Send them to the Colorado schools of mines. They would know every single thing they need to know in order to rule a nation. Not only to electricity, but how to make the light bulb. And they won't go around boasting, we talk too much. Then they would gradually go to Africa on vacation, not go to South Africa. They would go to nations near South Africa and just wait. Then blacks who know military, is, blacks former officers in the army, blacks who know land craft, blacks who know how to take over forts, blacks who know how to take a bank and run it, blacks who know currency, won't ask for nothing in South Africa. Just move in there and take it all. all right. Take it all. all right. And say just simply, those whites who intend to live under African rule may stay. Those who wish, who disagree with it may go and if you love 
Africa so much you insist on staying, we will give you a permanent peace that you can keep forever. The length of your body from head to toe, six feet under the ground. Why don't we find out how white people treat their enemies? What did they do with Hitler's followers that they found? They put them on trial at Nuremberg. And they killed some. And some killed themselves. But none of them are permitted to stay in power. And once you tell a European he's not to hold power, not to control money, he's going to go crazy or go home. Because he didn't come there to be ruled by you. Now the mistake was to shout such democratic phraseology, non-racial government as though there could be a non-racial government. All right. One man, one vote. All right. The main thing you needed to talk about is African rule. That's it. That's it. I want a nation as African rule, as France is French rule, right. as British is British rule. Right. If that's a contradiction, then you are living a contradiction. I will share with you in Africa to the extent that you're willing to share with me in Europe. I will give you inch for inch as much land in Africa as you're willing to give me in Europe. And as many rights. That will sell that. No, but you want to integrate. You want to be a part. Stay and help and stay and share. They do not have the mentality to share. They didn't come there to share. They came there to take it all, all right. and to rule it all. all right. And when you do not understand their history, you are in a trap. You thought that it was a fight between the capitalists and the communists. It was a fight between those who held power and those who wanted it. All right. The communists wanted power over African countries and wanted colonies just as bad as the capitalists who had them. All right. But one thing which gave you some illusions about the communists is that the communists had an imperial empire in Europe. But the European colonies began to revolt. And this is what the fight with Russia is about. These people wanted sovereignty. Now Russia made a mistake and the communist world made a mistake and everybody tried to point it out to them. It was called a red beta and a fool. No nation should ever declare itself officially an atheist nation. Man cannot walk this earth without a spiritual belief system. It is a belief system. A spirituality that lifts man higher than the dog that gives man responsibility. All right. But to declare <clears throat> a nation officially atheistic, I will let the churches stay that are there, but no more churches can be built. All the politics in the world will not substitute for the culture and the spirituality of a people. All right. You can tamper with that, with that politics. Right. And once you tamper with that spirituality, that spiritual being, 
you got a problem. All right. All right. Now, no matter how communist the Poles become, they're still going to be Catholic. Now, I'm not arguing the rightness and the wrongness of the Catholic Church. The Poles are going to be Catholic, right or wrong. Even if they are communists. All right. That prevailing spirituality is going to be Catholic. Now you go to tell them, uh, call them an official atheist nation. Part of that culture comes out of the understanding of Catholicism. Or the interpretation of Catholicism. Now, because the European is not original, you think is original, that's, what, that's part of the trap you're in. All right. You think the European has something to offer him, nothing to offer himself. All right. yes, sir. This fool has fought two world wars, yes, killing in excess of 200 million people, his own, and still can unite against you. A lot of useless killing. All right. The European fights for revenge just to show something. All right. Now the Germans were basically defeated and they finally decided they're going to teach America and the Allies a military lesson. This is what the Battle of the Budge was about. They knew they couldn't win, but they thought they'd let them know that militarily we know our business. Though we're going down in defeat, right. we're going to kick your butt on the way. Right. So that cost about 50,000 people. America, having won the war, having bombed the industrial cities, bombed an open city, no military target at all, called Dresden, 35,000 people, just for revenge. Now, if he do this to his brothers and sisters, now what in the hell are you expecting? Are you turning to him for hope? All right. Ain't no hope there. All right. Ain't no hope going to be there. All right. You go into his schools and you expect the kind of education that you need to reclaim the state and lift you above him and to liberate, be liberated from him? Are you sane? Are you real? With the same energy and the time, you could have doubled the enrollment of Tuskegee. Tuskegee didn't have to be a university. We got enough universities. That's a great liberal arts university. But Tuskegee was training us in nationhood, right. self-reliance, right. plumbers, cooks, right. orthopedic schools. Tuskegee is Cooks in Baker School were so good, the army was sending back cooks to Tuskegee. All those schools are gone, except the veterinarian school is still there because it's one of the best in the world. All right. It races over Cornell's veterinarian school. I was speaking to the president a few days ago, and he said, well, well John, some people have to know in mathematics. I said, well, there's no contradiction in what I'm saying. Right. We need great technical schools. We need schools of mechanics. We need schools for not only teach men how to fix a car, how to design a car from scratch. But all the cars we use, we don't have one car company. With all the leather that is available, all the cows we attend to, we can't tan leather and make shoes. 
We can outflow, shine, flow, shine if we put our mind to it. We're making them apologize for being in the business of the shoes. You make Floshan buy shoes from us. And as for sneakers, we let our idiots do that. The idiots make the sneakers, that's so easy. We won't even sign our best technician for the sneakers. You guys who fail at other things, we let them make sneakers. Cause Guys who've been in prison need some practice before they, we elevate them to higher. You know, make sneakers for a while. See how well you do that. <laughs> then we'll let you make, make shoes. We can create a whole industry. Why don't we do it? We have lost the history of the time when we did everything for ourselves. We have lost history of the time when we ran nations all by ourselves. We have been delinquent in studying the society that we produced that had everything in it that Karl Marx advocated that Europe never practiced. Everything, there's nothing in socialism or communism that wasn't already lived out in African society. We didn't dogmatize it. We just lived it out. We didn't dogmatize Christianity. We just lived it out. John Jackson has documented this beautifully in one of his last books called Christianity Before Christ. In another book, Pagan Origins of the Christ Myth. You think there's only one Christ story. Every civilization in the world of consequence has its own Christ story. Every civilization has its own creation story. And everybody thinks they created the beginning of civilization. When I was in the anti-poverty program, I was going to teach my students a lesson, so I asked to run an Igbo to come in and tell his creation story. So he said, well, dear, dear children, now let me tell you the, how the world began. It began among the a place called Anisha. Of a God waved his wand and said, Go forth, you great evil people, and civilize the world. Right. And that's how the world began. All right. Next day, I had a Yoruba come in. So I'm glad you children waited. Now you will know the truth. I will tell you how the world began. <laughs> Place called Dudawa. Our God saw fit to designate the Yoruba as the bringer of the civilization of the world. I thought I was crazy. Next day I brought in a can from God. His story was more beautiful. One thing I like about his story, there's always some good eating in the Ghanaian creation story. He said that his God, Anain, waved his hand, go forth, you great Akan people, and civilize the world. And we started out to civilize the world, and the God said, wait, got to have a chop. <laughs> Nothing before the meal. <laughs> in Ghana all meals are called chop because <laughs> that's literally what it is a chop and so girls came out beautifully dressed plates of gold serving this great food and after everybody got their stomach full 
Now go out and civilize the world. And that they did. And the good God blew his breath, created a great hole. Out came great Akan people marching to civilize the world. Years later, I'm in Ghana. I'm with a professor, and he's taking me out to the hole where civilization started. Well, just like an old gravel pit to me, nothing except, you know. <laughs> so we drove about a half hour. I said, Professor, now, um, according to my research, um, the Akan people used to live in East Africa. And they always moved out of places where people try to impose religions on them against their will. So they moved from East Africa to the Niger River. And when Islam came down, they moved from the Niger River to the Volta River. Then they had some difficulty among them, and some moved to the coast. And then a priest called Akumpo Anochi brought the golden stool and reorganized them into the great nation that they are today. That's essentially the story of the Akan people, isn't it, Professor? He said, of course, Professor Tarkin, but are you going to spoil a good story with the truth? I said, no, Professor, no, they came out of all. <laughs> You said they came out of a hole? They came out of a hole? <laughs> Don't ever spoil a good folklore by spoiling with the truth. Don't spoil the Adam and Eve story by saying it's a joke. So if that story is true, then mankind is about 6,000 years old. Each time they dig in Ethiopia, they find somebody a million years older than the last one. Right. Mankind is about four million years old. But what happened to the Adam and Eve story? All right. Now what happened to the flood story? All right. But if you read the folklore of the Old Testament by Sir James Frazier, it's full of flood stories. Everybody got their flood story. When you don't read history, anybody can tell you anything. I enjoy folklore. I read a lot of it. I know the Bible is full of great spiritual inspiring lessons based on folklore. It is not less because it is based on folklore. But don't start killing people if they tell you something is not true. There is absolutely no documentation that Moses ever lived. None whatsoever. No place. If you got any, please show it to me. There is no documentation in existence about an exodus. None. No place. Now, it's an inspiring story. And we believe it more than the Jews. Because we, in slavery, wanted to attach ourselves to a people who escaped from something. And so they told this escape story, and we bought it. And right now, you can get blacks to weep over the three Hebrew boys in the fire of punish. Right now, a piece of folklore, nothing to prove any of it. And yet there are magnificently written books dealing with how spirituality emerged, you will not take time out to read Alvin Boyd Kuhn, especially Who is This King of Glory? One of the best books ever written on the Christ story. Shot of the Third Century, a book, one of the best books on the uh, St. Augustine. Or Gerald Masses, book. St. 
just read the first of the six volumes, Egypt Light of the World. Then among his essays, read the historical Jesus in the mystic Christ. Now once you know this, and end the world war against your history, All right. you will know what you will have to do. Right. Because history is a tool. History, I have repeatedly said, is a clock right. that you use to tell your political and historical and cultural time of day. It is a compass that you need to find yourself on the map of human geography. History tells the people where they have been and what they have been, where they are and what they are. Most important, history tells the people what they still must be and where they still must go. All right. You cannot exist successfully and be full and whole and totally human and be absent from your history. There are some very basic things about history. You don't have to read forever, but certain simplified approaches to your history that you haven't even read. I think uh, uh, Professor Joseph Harris's little book, The African People and Their History, it's in paperback, easy to get. A good introduction to our history. John Jackson's book, An Introduction to African Civilization. I've been told that my introduction to his book is one of the longest introductions ever written. I, you wrote a book introducing a book. A little book that I wrote a number a few years ago, still in print and still for sale, is an illustrated lecture, The African People in World History, published by Black Classics Press. So I'm not telling you some monumental, expensive thing you can do. Now, all these things put together, it would probably cost you about 12 to $15. All right. So there's no excuse, really. Teacher scotch costs you more than that. <laughs> you want to know where the money's going to come from? Leave off a six pack. You can get it. When I was teaching the students, I used to sign students paperbacks at $5, $6. Students, but I don't have the money, Professor. How much did your sneakers cost? He's coming into my class with $150 sneakers. He can't spend $5.50 for a book that's required to reading in the class. We cop out on ourselves. We cop out on our children. There's so much learning that has to take place before the child gets to school. There's so much learning that's fun. We fail to make it fun. We make it too dreary. I want to teach a kid mathematics. Tell me, Jimmy, how many steps it takes to get from the table to the door? None. Go to the left, then tell me how many steps it takes. Go to the right, take my minutes. Go straight time. How many? You're teaching mathematics and you're having fun with it. You're teaching a piece of corn, the scientific effort that goes. Take a piece of corn, that same piece of corn becomes a piece of bread. That same piece of corn becomes cornflakes. That same piece of corn becomes so many things. Oh, you're teaching him basic science. Basic science. And all you're teaching him is about a piece of bread. You can bring some raw wheat. This is how the raw wheat looks. This is how they refine it. 
Fine. This is how it looks at the biscuit. That's science. <laughs> you ain't picked up a book yet. It's everyday living. That's science. That's geography. Kisses. Read the papers about Somalia. They get a map of Africa. Says, oh, this is Somalia. This is where it's located. You ain't picked up a book yet. You teaching him geography. When the word is mentioned, you just point, point to him on the map. You put a small world map. When you read the papers, point to the place. There's a whole lot we can do ourselves. And when the child gets to the school, the school can teach instead of keeping order all the time. You have to let the child know the school is where you teach. You have to give the teacher time to teach and not to keep you from hitting your next door student or knocking his books off. Great expectations need to be put forth from the very beginning what needs to be expected of you. But in the final analysis, there should be a target in his mind and in your mind. Our ultimate aim is to build and sustain a nation. All right. All right. All right. Therefore, do everything is necessary to achieve that objective. All right. there you go. If a nation has airplanes, make sure that somebody knows how to fly them. All right. Make sure ultimately that someone knows how to make one. All right. Someone knows how to design an airport. All right. When you design an airport, you remember now, thousands of turns of weight has to hit that ground consistently. Ten years before you repair that apple. So you, the man that puts it down there better know his business. You better not put it on no soft ground. All right. But reinforce it if you do. People need railroads. Somebody have to know railroad engineering. And someone have to know locomotive design and locomotive repair. If our ultimate aim is to get back what slavery and colonialism took away, which is nationhood, then we must look back at what we had. They built the pyramids without an industrial complex. That's an achievement. You can't say it was done by Europe because Europe wasn't in existence. All right. Asia had no contact with Africa at the time. All right. When the Europeans came, they found no jail system because no one had ever gone to one. No word for jail. All right. Did they bring in civilization? No, they ain't bringing civilization. They're bringing disorder. All right. They're declaring war on your culture, your women, the dress, your art. They're making you despise the things that made you feel good about yourself. They're manifesting in the name of a superiority complex an inferiority complex. They don't want to compete with anything you've done. So they want to destroy that and let you be totally dependent on them. Now if you study Europe, you study the breaking up of the Soviet Union that could not, that 
did not have to break up. And there was nothing basically wrong with a union. There's nothing wrong, basically wrong with a Soviet socialistic union, Soviet socialistic republics. Nobody objected to being in that union. What then did break it up? The main people in Moscow, white Russians, did not understand that they had a multicultural empire. And they could not homogenize that empire around the thought pattern of Moscow. And it had the agreed to respect the cultures of the colonized people. Respect their religion, whether you agree with it or not, just respect it. Give them a fair share of the economy. Praise them for what they give to the toll union. Realize that most of the agriculture in Russia was coming from the colonized part of Russia. And some of the best uh, mineral wealth was coming from the colonized part of Russia. Well, the, the colonized part said, no, never mind. If you, can, if you can't play straight, I'll take it with myself. I can market it myself. What's happening right now is an absolute disgrace. No use for those people being killed. Russia's not being run by a drunk. This man's not even sober half of the time. The low caliber, this other guy that they, they threw out, he at least had basic intelligence. And he was sober. Now, these are the people whose desire it was to rule over you. If they liberated you, they're going to liberate you so they can rule over you instead of the others. All right. Freedom is something you take with your own hands. You do not inherit it from a will. It is not hand down from one generation to another. And when you inherit it, you must re-secure it in your own times with your own hands. Freedom is never secure. And you can never take it for granted. It's a precious substance. Today, when we look at Africa, there is not a single African nation ruled by Pan-Africanism or nationalism. I have said a real revolution will occur in Africa when an African head of state prays to an indigenous African chosen God in public and without apology. Until that day comes, Africa will revolve, but Africa will not move forward. You cannot use the breathing apparatus or the politics of your former master to build your state. This is something you're going to have to sit down and design for yourself and stop worrying about whether he lacks it or not. If he lacks it, chances are it is wrong. And has not spared this great African people for an ideal reason.
We were never a minority. We numbered throughout the world with our people in Asia and in India, and over 300 million in the Western world, over, over 750 million in Africa. We number a billion people on the face of this earth. If we create an industry just traded with each other, we need no other customers. We have to turn to each other and believe in each other and love each other. We need ourselves first and foremost. I advocated something and one girl said, you're going to get yourself in trouble. I advocated that we, we need a hugging brigade. See a brother or a sister feeling down and neglected? Walk up and give him a nice big hug. So one girl said, you hug the wrong person, you're going to get hell knocked out of you. <laughs> okay, let's put it another way. When we see each other, there should be instantaneous, cordial communication. We're in the same struggle. We came out of the same historical womb. There was a time and place in riverbanks of Africa, especially the Nile. We gave the world the social thought that went into the making of the Bible, the philosophical thought that went into the making of what you think is Greek philosophy. We gave the world its first humanity. Now we need to seek some partnership in doing the same thing again. And my suggestion is that in seeking the partnership, we find a mirror and see who's staring back at us. That's my partner. You and I will change the world to give the world a new hope, a new lease on life, and a new humanity that will not only be good for our children, but their children and the still more beautiful ones waiting to be born. If we did it once, we can do it again. But you cannot change the world until you agree to change yourself. Thank you. A loud ovation for Dr. John Henry Clark. Dr. John Henry Clark.
Garveyism in Jamaica of today. They can call him a national hero, but you go to the library, you don't find any books on Garvey. You don't find nothing in primary schools on Garvey. In the material in the Jamaican Institute on Garvey is deteriorating, and uh, they not they haven't laminated the, the paper so they can save it. And there's no Garveyism in the Caribbean islands, and there's no and very little here right now. Why he was heard here is not because anybody got any better brain than anybody else, but because I'm a crude slave master and I'm a crude oppressor made us know one thing. We were not a part of the state and not wanted to be a part. We were brought here to labor and once that was over, your surplus population. For well, in Jamaica, they had the illusion of being a part of the British Empire. You cannot sell a state to a people who think they've already got a state. It was a matter of a frame of mind. Many people took pride in being a part of, um, of that empire. And while many of us would have taken more pride in being part of the United States, but the United States let it, us know by putting up signs said that letting us know what we are not wanted. Even signs, black drinking water and white drinking water. And you figure that one out. They reminded us every day of our status in such a way they were killed in a concept of being such a true blue patriarch. And yet we held out hope and fought in all of its wars. When someone asked me years ago whether I loved this country, I said immediately, I didn't think it out too well. I hate what it is, I love what it promises to be. That was before I understood that the promise wasn't even made to me or my people. They weren't even talking about me when they announced the promise. But what I should have said is that you brought me here against my will. And I stay here against my will. And so far as I'm concerned with the life that I have in me, I'm going to transform this nation to something better. Failing to do that, I have no compunction about trying to destroy it. The role of the writer, the teacher, the leader, is to make a new society. And why he cannot make a, a new society, he is, has the bounding responsibility to wage endless war on the society that harass him. Faith has assigned this task to the thinker, the teacher, the preacher, the political activist. And to him, war is a natural way of life. War against oppression, war against hunger, war against any form of deprivation of the human being. It's a way of life, it's a normal way of life. Fighting to improve the condition of people, fighting to give strength to people without it, fighting to give homes to people without a home. Because uh, I remember Dr. Ben saying last night in a lecture we gave together, he was quoting someone else, but it was a very excellent quote. Show me how you treat your women and I will show you the condition of your nation. And I say that the measurement of a nation 
the measurement of a people's humanity. It's how well they treat the very old, the very young, and the life giver of all people, the women. I don't mean she must necessarily be pampered all the time, but she must be protected and respected all the time. <laughs> Shall I start, Reverend? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much again. We're going to be talking about the Zulus and the struggle for Southern Africa. I did not use the word South Africa because I'm speaking about a broader dimension than just South Africa itself. The Zulus influence all Southern Africa. And the Zulus gave forth a warrior example that influenced all Africa. And the main target of those trying to downgrade African history is to downgrade that warrior group that gave to Africa and the world its greatest example of warfare standing up and protecting those things that belong to them as against those things that the enemy was claiming. When we look at Africa picture, the picture of African manhood in the mass media, there is something wrong with the picture in general, more wrong with the television series, The Africans. If African people were alert, they would have not, they would have assigned people to look at it and explain it, but they would not have assumed there was anything basically true in the film. Do you expect South Africa, who put up most of the money, to have anything true and complimentary about a people who fought to keep all Europeans out of Africa, especially the Boers, and whose war with the Zulus drained them to such an extent they could not establish the republic inside South Africa or Southern Africa that they wanted to establish. Once you check out who's doing something and the motivation for doing, you will know what to expect. The picture, the series of the downgrading of Zulu womanhood and manhood. And it came soon after another slick job, slicker than the Zulus, a series called The Africans. Now, if you knew African history, you could see the downgrading in The Africans. But The Africans were done by a master black hustler with great skill and one of the best informed Africans on the face of the earth who know better, who never lie without knowing he's a liar, who never lie until he knows that most of the audience will not know that he's a liar. He's a master con man and a master hustler. 
that has been in favor of the whites against the blacks for more than 25 years. He wrote the first anti-Nkrumah article called Kwame Nkrumah, the African Czar, Leninist Czar. I commissioned an African to answer him. In other words, as the African freedom explosion became a world issue, he was trying to water down the enthusiasm for it by writing an article saying that Nkrumah was a pawn of the Soviet Union. Now this is the man that made the picture. Now if you did your research work, you would understand the National Endowment endorsed the series at first, but in the interim, the administration changed and the National Endowment withdrew their name, but they couldn't withdraw, withdraw the money because the money had been spent. Only 600000 in the first place. It cost $7 million. He got Africans of note to be his consultant. I don't know what they consulted him about or what he consulted them about because everything in the film did violence to everything they stood for. But there are some Africans who are hungry. One, I could understand his position. He's a marrying man and a divorcing man. He had two sets of alimonies to pay. <laughs> he needed the money. <laughs> so sometime you sell a piece of your soul, you think, and you walk through the world as though you've got a whole soul when one time if, if you sell a little piece of your soul your whole body is polluted your whole body is less of a body just because you sold one little piece so what I could do without that piece you can't you can't do without any piece you have to be have a whole soul or none at all because you got to have a whole character or none at all you're either honest man or you're a liar. One or the other, and there's nothing in between. So, all right. Who backed the other party called Seven Million? Annenberg Trust of Philadelphia. Who are they? A Jewish real estate, not real, a, a newspaper foundation. Why would they endorse that? Why would they put up the money? When you look at the picture, you can see what is happening. You can become a, an amateur prophet. Why would they endorse an African film? It said nothing of complimentary about Africans. Not really. He said something about African exploitation, exploitation of the minerals in the fourth section. But every time he had something real good to say, he said it about Muslims in Africa. Algeria, I mean, he was just uh, eloquent about that. Egypt, Muslim customs, the Muslim woman so moral, dressed up, you know, then showed an African woman in a bathing suit. He was downgrading African people in behalf of Islam. And most Africans did not understand what he was doing. All right, now, I've been in trouble most of my life, so a little more ain't gonna kill me. I think this film was backed by a Jewish foundation because ultimately they're going to make peace with the Arabs 
And you're going to see the Jews and the Arabs in the same political bed against us. We have no friends, no place. If you realize that, if you realize we have no friends, then you count yourself all over the world. You might be a billion people. Maybe you don't need any. Maybe you can manage without. And you shouldn't let that little item worry you. People make coalitions, people make alliances based on interests. And people have always made alliances at our expense and made alliances with us to benefit themselves and broke those alliances when it was no longer to that benefit to do so. All right, now let's go back to the Zulus because when Mazaroy came to Southern Africa, he missed the Zulu story altogether. He missed the South African story politically altogether. He told a few things here and there to give you the illusion that he favored the radicalism the revolutionary warfare that's going on, the frontline states, and yet, while he gave you the illusion, in other places he said what applied what needed to be done, all he did there was just to infer here and there to show you what a pitiful lot they're in. And when he showed Black kids in the hospital, he showed the sickest ones he could find, he could focus the cameras on. And he did not show anything because Muslim men, including black men right here, some in the audience and some all over this country, Muslim men are generally chauvinistic, believing in the separation, physical separation of woman and assigning women to a lesser task as human beings. And blacks are forever joining things without examining them. But if you're going to join something, you transform it. Join it and transform it into something that you want to use for your liberation. Everything you belong to, from a whist club to a fraternity to a church, should be an instrument of liberation or stop wasting your time. I have never been able to explain even partly why well, anybody should belong to Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> and what's this got to do with the Zulus? Maybe everything, maybe nothing. If the founder of, of, of Jehovah's Witnesses said that there's room in heaven for 250 thousand well there ain't no room for us <laughs> ain't enough room for the white members you know they're going to take president so what are you doing hanging out over there <laughs> we want a big heaven where all of us can fit <laughs> Because we have used our emotion in a wrong way, we have not seen the best things about us, and we have let others emphasize the worst things about us. Now, there was another series by Basil Davison that was fairly good. 
It was fairly good mainly because Basil Davidson focused on chronological history, I means step by step, the progression of history and moved it on. His series can be used in a classroom because so many of us in a color trap and we had to buy one of the series for use in the classroom, we would buy the Ali Mazaroy because he's alleged black and, I, and Basil Davison is alleged white. And that's what we would have gone wrong because Basil Davison's series is at least usable in the classroom. If he takes a piece of history, he runs it straight to its ultimate conclusion before he moves to the next one. Ellen Mazaroy didn't stay on anything over two minutes. It's choppy, episodic, and it's not usable. And yet, technically, from the view of camera work and angles and technology, it was the finest series that's ever been done. From the point of view of content and history teaching, it was one of the worst. Now let's come back to the series, The Zulus, where so many things were wrong, technically, factually. The whole thing was at least 95% factually in error. The people didn't talk like Zulus. These were actors and bad actors at that. The people didn't look like Zulus half of the time. And it, it seemed to choose women who nearly all of the lead women were light to the point where Zulus are not. And they had words, they were saying words that Zulu women do, do not say. You had one scene where a sister looks at her brother who's the future king and she said, I would have a chance of being queen and you're going to be the future king only because of what's between your legs. African women don't talk that way. <laughs> Clinical descriptions of sex belong in a medical book. You just don't go around talking about clinical descriptions of sex. It's a highly personal, confidential thing between a man and a woman. Group sex is as bogus as group therapy. <laughs> but the dogs on the street don't think so because they are dogs and you're human. You're supposed to think so. It's a personal and sacred thing to human beings. And it is a matter of maneuver and negotiation and conviction and convincing between two human beings. And even if it fails, you don't go out and publicize. It still remains a confidential matter between two human beings and not for the community. You give it that dignity, and Africans gave it that dignity. And they didn't shout about it in this way. Now, when we look at the people that we call Zulus, who are these people because the mass media is out to control image they out to if they control what you look at they can control what you think if they control what you think about yourself they can control what you do about yourself no if they give you an example of the Zulus that's bogus, you will forget that the greatest military force against the whites who fought them longest with greater degree of consistency 
and had more victories than anyone in Africa were the Zulus. The, a war has been declared against us. And this war started in the 15th and the 16th century, and that war is still going on, only now it is more sophisticated. This is the war against our manhood and our womanhood. Now, the war, all this exposure, and this, this fake pity for the black family is part of the same war. The black family is in trouble, no more or less than any other family in the Western world. Western civilization is in decay because it is not civil. It is not a civilization at all. We are in trouble because that civilization, that mechanism never fit our temperament as a people. It's like a body rejecting a a transplanted heart that simply won't go with the body. We are rejecting the container that they put us into. Now, when I gave a lecture on the historical origin of teenage pregnancy and didn't blame the black men, the, white, the black women fraternities who invited me got angry. I said, there was no teenage pregnancy in Africa. There was no African man calling women bitches. There were no broken homes in Africa. Now who is this black man who's breaking homes, signing children that he don't support, and slapping women around for reminding him of his, uh, of his responsibility? Who is he? Who created him? Western oppression and Western environment. That don't mean he is right at all. That don't mean he need to be excused. If he had revolutionary fervor, he would have revolted against the conditioning and been a man in spite of it. that I would be and do what a man's supposed to do, no matter what kind of oppression you place on me, because that is what I am. I am the shoulder of responsibility. When you touch a woman romantically and physically, when you have the privilege of sharing the sacredness of her personal favor. The two of you are about to change the world. That's no small thing to think about. That's a monumental thing. So both of you have to understand the consequences of doing it or have the strength not to do it. But you have been programmed into a society where walking away from this sacred responsibility becomes a casual thing. What the women did not like, that I pointed out that the rape of black teenagers along the shores of Africa, in the slave castles, on the boats, on the plantation, was the beginning a widespread black teenage pregnancy. I also pointed out that there are three million people in the world called Eurasians, half Asian, half white. There's not 10 marriages between whites and Eurasians. In South Africa, there's over a million people called colored colors, that mean between cohabitation between the African man, I mean the white man and the African woman. And then there's another almost a million called Cape Colors, co co cohabitation between the Asian Cape Malayans and all these people who came in later, 
and the wives. There's not one marriage between them. Now who is the greatest deserter of women in the whole world? Now I'm not trying to justify a single black man who deserted any black woman. And I'm saying that every single one should be called to his responsibility and made to show them his responsibility. But look at the historical origins of how this thing started with the remaking of, of his mind, with the remaking of the condition where he had no security, where he must rise each day and literally beg for the right to live to the end of the day. Well, he, don't, he does not inherit a job normally. He doesn't get his bread normally. He literally engaged in a form of protracted begging. And your begging for one day don't carry over to the next day. The next day, another form of begging, form of asking for permission to live to the end of the next day. And the next day it starts all over again. Look at what it is doing to his spirit. Look what it is doing to his very soul, the very dignity. Then he goes on the weekend and worships a white god. And in the rest of the week, you expect the father, black father in the home, to have full respect. When you worship, you're worshiping the oppressor the symbol of the oppressor. Now, what the Zulu people tried to do is to preserve the concept of African sovereignty, the African nation state. Now, the Zulus did not start in South Africa or Southern Africa. Nearly every African in Africa came from another part of Africa. And the one thing we need to study in order to understand any portion of Africa are the migrations within Africa. The Zulus once lived along the coast of Southern Africa, of, of Eastern Africa, before they were called Zulus. <laughs> It was a group called the Ngunu. There's an Ngunu group inside of the Zulus to this day. We meet these groups in a book by an Arab writer. The book's called Gems of Travel and Meadows of Gold or something. I remember his name in a few minutes. But the book was written 947 A.D., over a thousand years ago. And he encountered that group. They were living in East Africa then. But I'll tell you something about certain African groups. Not just the Zulu. The Ken has the same trait. The Musi has the same trait. Anytime they are faced with a force they can't deal with, <clears throat> they pack up and move some other place. Can't fight it, get out of the way. Here's a group come now antagonistic, want to bother with your land, want to bother with your cattle, want to bother with your money, with your women. All right, so let's go find another home. Africa's so big, you know, you can walk 10 miles away and find another country. Ain't nobody on, on, I don't mean, a country that's free for you to take if you want to, because ain't nobody there. The Zulus, when Islam hit that coast, began to move inland. Then they moved inland until they moved into the Congo Basin. Now the Congo Basin got crowded with other groups moving out of the way of Islam. See, everybody trying to purify Islam quite forget the damage it did. People trying to move out of the way of the Islamic slave trade. 
people tried to move out of the way of warring groups and they were not a part of either part of the wall and they don't want to be caught in the crossfire, they just pick up and go. The African is a natural nomad. That don't mean he didn't build cities. But he'll, he'll, he'll move in a minute, you know, and go build a city some other place. So now the Zulus moved inland. And when the inland became crowded with herds and people with their flocks and cattle and sheep and goats, not for war purposes, not for any disagreement with anybody, they were living with a magnificent people, the people of the Congo, the Bashongo people, one of the finest people in all of Congo, the Bashongo or the Kuba people. The Kuba people didn't say go. Nobody said go. They didn't see the space they needed. So they wanted more space and they began to move not only the Zulus, but other groups began to move down into the open land mass further to the south. The group with the preface Emma to their name moved closer to the coast. And then the Zulus were referred to as Emma Zulu, follower of Zulu. Their, great, their first great leader was named Zulu. They took his name. The other groups with the preface Ba to their name, we can find these groups still there. The Baman Waiter, Bamwakatsis, the Borlongs, they veered inland. Now the home of the great B group is now Botswana. There was a group called Botswanas, that the third wave of the B group. The Borlongs went further, further into Central Africa. Later they would have a good relationship with the, uh, they would join the Zulus, many of them as officers in the Zulu army. All right, now, now they settled. The Zulus settling along the coast around Natal, the coastal part of Southern Africa. Further to the south, in the tip of South Africa, near the Cape, is another people that had been there all along. They'd been there so long, no one could remember, and, and they're not too clear on it. These are people called the Koshon. Koshon San people. If you meet them, you say, what's your name? He says, Koshon. If you're talking about his language, he says, Koshon, Koshon. If you're talking about the two of them, they say, Koshon San, S-E-N, Koshon San. If you're talking to a San, he says, San Koshon. Like two vaudevillians arguing over a building. Who, who gets the first name on the marquee? But, uh, if you talk to a Koshon, he said that they are the seniors, the Sen people are the juniors. Talk to Sen, he said that he's the senior, the Koshons are the juniors. <laughs> now this don't start in a fight, but some of the best jokes you've ever heard between them is about who's the senior and who's the, uh, and who's the junior. See, good-natured kidding that white people make fights out of, the Africans make good jokes out of and good relationships out of, we even dance around and fall out with laughter, arguing over something. Nobody resolved anything. They don't intend to resolve it because that means the argument is over and it's no more fun. <laughs> they want to come back the next day and argue some more. <laughs> so arguing become a marathon of <laughs> thing that you do. It's not like Dr. Ben and I arguing over dynasties. <laughs> or who paid the last dinner bill? I treated you the last time. It's my turn now. You treated me. My turn. It was nonsense. But we enjoy it. <laughs> we ain't gonna ever settle it. We don't want to settle it. He knows that I know 
that the 18th dynasty was the greatest dynasty ever to sit on any throne in any time in the history of the world. <laughs> and I know that he thinks that the 19th is the one. <laughs> But I'm never going to concede to him. He's never going to concede to me. And we're not going to lose friends. We're not going to lose friendship over it. Because it's part of both of our culture. It's to choose a subject that has no end, because we won't let it end. Another branch of the Zulus took over. Nearly everybody who became imperial in the world, this is true across the board, was once colonized by someone else. And that's where they got the idea of dominating others because they were once dominated. The British were once a colony. All right. And so once they freed themselves from being a colony and remembered being a colony, they decided to colonize. All right, now, a group called the Mtiwa took over with the colonial masters of the Zulus. The father, the Zulu king, who's going to become Chaka's father, headed the regular Zulu group, while another king, Jobe, headed the dominant group. Nainda, who is going to be Chaka's mother, came out of the dominant group. In other words, she had a higher royal status than the man she married. The dialogue between them was a disgrace. Zulu dialogue, Zulu courtship is just something else. I mean, they sing praise songs to a woman and they hire a poet to compose poetry and stand in her path and recite it to her. Well, you stand aside, see what impression it, it, impression it makes on her. I mean, the courtship is an elaborate thing. All of this before you consult her family, her, the two families consult themselves to see if um, there's a possibility of you getting together. All of this, you ain't touched her. You create an elaborate ceremony you know, around her. Well, in a way, Chaka's father met this lady from the dominant house, and negotiation began for them coming together. Negotiation between the two respective families. Finally, it was agreed that she would join this other house. The house that she joined was the house her people dominated. She came from the Mtiwa group, then the colonial masters of the Zulus. <coughs> Everything went well until the marriage and months passed and the other three wives had given birth to girls and she gave birth to a son, Chaka, automatically making her the favorite wife. She had produced the warrior to carry on the tradition. 
the otherwise grew jealous and began to tabulate the months between the marriage and the birth of the son. They assumed or said or proved or insinuated that the child had arrived too early. That there must have been some kind of relationship before the marriage, which is against custom because the wives or future wives of Zulu kings supposed to be certified virgins. How you certify a thing like this, I don't know, but... Uh, but they're supposed to come to the king untouched in that regard. Now the gossipy wives started out on Nida, spreading rumors. Subsequently, they told the king, if you don't get rid of her, we will tell King Jobe, and he will rule you out of lineage and rule her out of the royal line. She now goes back to her people with her son. Now this is what the movie got wrong. The two with, with the children kidding him and kidding her for not having a man. Africans don't do this illegitimacy it first be, first be what, his mother and father was married. What's illegitimate? How did that get in there any place? Here John Gonther in his book Inside Africa said, he was in the, you know he was illegitimate. Illegitimate how? His mother and father were married. His father acknowledged that was his son. The mother acknowledged that was his, the father was the father. So what's illegitimate? On the, the main thing, Africans don't even use the word. The whole concept of illegitimacy is unknown in Africa. <laughs> then, as he grew up, when, you know, when she came back to Zululand, one of the other wives, two of the other wives, had given birth to sons. Two of those, those two sons would someday be his assassins. His two half-brothers, Ding Gong, and the other half-brother. Now she leaves, goes back to her people, where Chaka grows to early manhood. She seeks friends for him. And when he refused to fight, she tells him and explains to him that there's no other way to survive except fighting. In the film, when the boys kid him and throw him in the water, then she tells him he will, in the future he'll never leave his enemies behind. All the South Africans are trying to say is that if Africans come to power, they're going to kill all of us. That's all they're trying to say. Chaka left many enemies behind so long as they realized that he was the boss of Southern Africa. All right, Chaka grew up. His mother sought friendships for him. His father did not see him again until he was 14 years old. Now all of this was left out of the film. This is a beautiful thing, ceremony. And when his father saw him, his father came to dress him for the ceremony of manhood. The ceremony of manhood is when the boy goes out into the bush, kills an animal, and brings back the mane. He has one spear, one shield. So that means he has nothing to practice on. He must find the heart of that animal the first shot. And he cannot afford to miss. 
And when he comes back, he is declared a man. He had to go to the hunting ground, was three days away. <laughs> he came back in six days, so that means he must have found his animal the first day. Came back with the proof. Now he's growing up. His mother is seeking the friendship of the son of the king, Jobe. This son is called Ding Isweyo, the wanderer. Ding Isweyo befriended Chaka, but after an argument with the father, he goes and lives among the coast and lives among the whites. He noticed something when the whites are fighting among themselves. They keep running at each other in a straight line, and they get killed quicker that way. Ding Isweyo comes back to Zululand, revolutionized Zulu warfare, and introduced a concept of warfare that still exists, broken field running. If you're running a zigzag line and someone's shooting at you, that cuts down on their chances of hitting you. That doesn't mean you won't be hit, but you're reducing the odds. Now it's in the infantry of the world. If you're moving forward on a battlefield, don't move in a straight line. He introduced broken field running. He revolutionizes the Zulu weapon, the Asagai. He saw that the Zulu throwing weapon was too unwieldy. He revolutionized the shield. He makes a shield with mattered with wax. So if you would throw a spear dead at the shield, it would glide off instead of penetrate. Now Chaka and Ding Isweyo is revolutionizing warfare in Southern Africa. Then Chaka tells the Zulus, take off your shoes, it's making too much noise. The Zulu would move on a city and a group and so silently, you don't know they're there. Then they would stand up and begin to bang the weapon against the shield. And then you know that not only you were in war, you were surrounded. <laughs> you ain't heard nothing. A movie called Zulu, who did everything wrong, <laughs> show all of the regiments in one, all together. But the Zulu fought in a three regiment formation, white shield, brown shield, black shield. The white shield regiment made from the, the hide of white cows, the shield made from the hide of white cows. These were the trainees. Their job was just to hit the enemy and get out of the way just to let the enemy know the battle had started. The Brown Shield Regiment would come in and finish if they could. But the Black Shield Regiment was the Zulu's elite guard. Once they entered the battlefield, they had to win or die. They never left the battlefield with victory or death. One or the other. They were specially trained Special beer was brooded for them. Special women were trained to marry them. That was the only branch of the Zulu war group permitted to marry. So you can see now how men fought to get from one regiment to the other. <laughs> <laughs> In days before the war, before battle, Chaka isolated the men from the women. He said that warfare is passion, this dispensing of passion, and so is sex. If you lose it in the, in the bedroom, you don't have it for the battlefield. So hold it up for a little while. After the battle, your pleasure. But get the battle over first. 
So because of the special treatment he gave that group, it was always striving to get into that group. Now, what you have to understand, looking at Charker's best years, is that his mission was accomplished, is that he was to hold the whites to the coast and not let them come inland. And he did that. And whites could not come inland without his permission. And when certain Zulu ceremonies took place, he did not give them permission at all. He was the master. And had he lived, there would have been no South African situation because there had been no whites there that wasn't under control of blacks. All right, admit it. Admittedly, he was a dictator. Admittedly, he was ruthless. But had he succeeded, even killed 50,000 more Africans, he could have saved five million. Now, if you're part of a statistic that might have to go, I'm sure you're not interested. <laughs> but that is a fact. Whites were weak enough to be defeated then, and he had a chance. All he had to do is to unify Southern African blacks. And Chaka never fought the whites. Another fallacy a lot of people don't seem to be able to deal with. Chaka fought other blacks in order to bring them into a Zulu federation to save Southern Africa from European domination. His best years were the years... Now, when Ding Iswayo came home from the course, and two of them revolutionized Zulu warfare. Chaka's father died. Ding is where you install Chaka as king of the Zulus. When Ding is where you died and Jobe died, Chaka combined the Imtawas with the regular Zulus. In the next nine years, he was the most powerful force in all Southern Africa. He built the Zulu Empire during, mm -hmm. during that period. He would move to the east, he would move to the west, conquering and consolidating. And many people, many groups that did not want to fight him joined him. One was another B group called the Borolongs. Their main king had died, and they were under weak leadership, and they stayed with Chaka until they found a strong king named Moroke. Now, with the Borlongs working with him, with all the branches of the Zulus working with him, he would move further to the south and further to the, further to the west. Two thirds of South Africa under his control Discipline the absolute best. Many times the Zulu would trot 50 miles a day and back just to keep in shape. At his best, he was the supreme leader of Southern Africa. He faced the people still existing in South Africa. He, never, he was never defeated physically defeated when he faced the people called the Swazis. The Swazis wouldn't fight him. The Swazis fought from ambush, didn't have much, she didn't have shields of any consequence, long hard sticks, they would sneak up and hit the Zulu on their leg and move out of the way. That's aggravating. Just get on your nerve. Climb up in a tree and jump on your head. <laughs> Until Chaka declared it a stalemate and spared the Swazis. <laughs> That's about as close to defeat as he ever got. He said they're crazy. <laughs> he said that they had a, uh, a woman ruler. 
and the Swazis. He thought because a Swazi man rises each morning and goes to the door of his mother and prostrates himself and he won't rise until she give him permission to rise and said, rise, precious fruit of my womb, and go forth for the day. He said, these men must be weaklings. <laughs> he found different. <laughs> but he, he eventually uh, learned better. About four years before his death, that's be about 1824. One of his great warriors, known in history as the British call him Moselekatsi, and um, the Africans who can speak with a click language call him uh, Umzelgeza. You have to say it fast or, it, or you say it wrong. Umzelgeza. The British called him the path of fire, path of thunder. He met with Zulus near the edge of the Drakenburg Mountains and said that he has gotten enough of Charka's killing and he didn't think the spoils were being equally divided. With his 15,000 Zulus he had under his command he decided to break away. And when he made this decision, the Zulus gave him the royal salute. Then he shied away from it, almost like Caesar refusing the crown that he knew he wanted. He said the royal salute belongs only to Charka and his mother, the great elephant, Nanda. To call a woman an elephant in African society, that means she's strong with great character. In this society, you don't do that. <laughs> no. They gave him the royal salute again. And he partially accepted their leadership. Then he noticed the old men standing by, frowning. And he prostrated himself in front of the old man and asked for apologies from his elders. So I've spoken like a child. I have not asked my fathers which way to go. And they said, rise. We agree with you. We will leave Charka. And they pointed toward the mountains. We will go beyond the mountains for there are women to be our wives, cattle as plentiful as ants, land as far as the eye can see. We have had enough of Charka's killing. We will find a new home. Then he turned to the men and said, do you know what you are doing? You cannot go back and claim your wives. You must leave your children, your wives, and everything behind. Because if you go back, you give away what's going to happen. Now, history shows that they, some of them went back one by one and claimed their wives and children anyway. Uh, but most of them went without their wives, without the children. They went to a country Part of it is now called Zambia. Other part is now called Zimbabwe. Later called Southern Rhodesia and Northern Rhodesia. Where they found a new home for themselves. Across this mountain under the leadership of Umzalageza. Now Chaka searches for a new leader, a new warlord. He looks among the regular Zulus. You don't find one. But among the Borlong people who had joined them, who had moved down from Central Africa with them, he finds a leader in the Brown Regiment, Brown Shield Regiment. I saw his picture when he was 74. 
And as much as I'm close to 74, the picture frightened the hell out of me. <laughs> Mamboza was standing there with his lawn cloth on, not a gray hair in his head and all the hair on his head, not a break in his complexion at all, not a wrinkle in his face. <laughs> That's Mamboza. He assumes warlordship of the Zulus to fight the Ponderland campaign and other campaigns. All right, now near the end of Chaka's life, he's growing weary, not only of warfare, but of some other things because the Zulus are patrilineal. This is one of the few African people who are patrilineal. The lineage come down through the male. He has sent most of his sons away, all of them really, because he feared that one day they may come and dethrone him. His mother, Nanda, wanting a grandchild to pamper, takes this last son, has a little village built where she can go and pamper and dawdle over her grandchild like grandmothers want to do or do, every, do the world over. Chaka discovers this and was, is angry with her. But contrary to all the literature, they say he struck his mother and she died. There's not one iota of proof in it. And I went all the way to Ireland to find the diary of the white man who was with Chaka during his death, during her death. Chaka began to lose interest in the dance because Chaka was a great culture figure and a great dancer. I'm going to see, you see, more and more you see what's left out of the film. He was a great dancer. He created a Zulu dance that is tantamount to close order drill. He created a dance that was so universal, we make a game out of it called Statues, a freeze, that came from a form of Zulu warfare. Now, when he began to lose interest in the dance and people began to dance in front of him badly, just to see if he would push them out of the ring and show them how to do it, they knew that something was happening to his mind. And then there's an event, it's recorded in the history of the Jews of South Africa. My man named Herman something. I, I have the book and I have the treaty. So if anybody want to argue the point, I've got all the evidence. Two months before his death, he signed a treaty granting a piece of land in Zulu land for the settlement of the Jews. I've got the treaty, I've got his signature, and the date. And yet most historians say that he was insane during that last, the months of his life. He obviously was not. That was a very tight treaty. Because if it was so tight, if the Jews let any of the enemies of the Zulus move over the land, they would lose the land. And if the land was ever used as a haven for the enemies of the Zulus, they would lose the land. It was a tight treaty. No insane man can think that way. So, sometime near the middle of 1828, he had been accustomed to occasionally going on a hunt with an Irishman named Henry Louis Fan, and he liked Fan because um, Fan could cook up something called the Fan called Irish stew, and and uh, Chaka took a liking to it, you know. 
And, well, the Irish had no colonies, so we had no reason to fear this white man, you know. Had no colonies, had no armies, no navies, you know. So he let him in. Um, <clears throat> while on a hunt, a runner came to him to announce that Nanda, his mother, had passed. He was 60 miles away from Zululand at the time. He went on back to bury his mother. And I know this might sound gruesome to you and your Western mind, but one of the great funerals in Africa, Chaka decreed that 15,000 men would guard her grave for a year. And they did. He ordered the whole nation into mourning. If anybody showed any form of gaiety happened in the laughter, they got punished. He maimed the cows so the cows could also mourn for the passing of Nanda. He said that there'd be no crops planted for a year. The people said they, they could take that, so they did. He forbids certain other things. Then, he said, no cohabitation for a year. <laughs> then the old ladies took over. <laughs> said our king is crazy. <laughs> he has forbidden life itself. We will not survive as a Zulu nation unless we bring forth life into the world. Here is a patrilineal society, a male-dominated society. The women, the old women of the council ordered his ceremonial death, not his assassination, his ceremonial death for the good of the Zulus. They said, he is royal, only royal hands shall touch him. So they choose, chose his two half-brothers to do the job. And when they went into his tent, he would say, you think that by killing me, you will be king. You will be the bondsman and the slave. Whites are waiting like ants to take over this country. In the second cry, he reminded them that you have called me many things, saint, tyrant, God, and devil. To some extent, I am all of these things, but I am something else you need to remember. I'm the greatest hope you have for freedom from European rule in this century. In the last blow, he looked at them with pity and said, Oh, what have I done to you, sons of my fathers? Now Chaka is gone. Zululand is looking for a new king. They find the king in, among his assassins, Ding Gong. That was one of the boys born when Nanda went back to live among the empty walls, came back to visit Zululand, and some of the other wives said, the shame is gone, now we have sons. That was one of the sons, now grown. Now, Ding Gong takes over. Now the fight between the whites have started, not with Chaka, but with Ding Gong. Now the British push the Boers, and the Boers push the Zulus, and the Zulus push back. The Boers want to find a separate republic on the other side of the Vell River, or the Orange River, that they wanted to call Transvell. They want to get away from British taxes and British rule. And so they're trying to move inland. Ding Gong stops them twice, destroys their wagons and their horses, 
the third time they were about to be defeated at the edge of that river, the British realized that if any whites are defeated, they might be next. Though the British hated the guts of the Zulus, the British came to their defense. They would meet Chark, meet Dingong at that river. The battle was so fierce and so many butchered bodies flowed down that river. The Africans called it the Blood River. The Battle of Blood River was one of the decisive battles for the African to hold on to Southern Africa. Finally, the battle was lost. Dingong was driven into exile. 1838, he dies in 1840. Now coming to power, a Zulu of the British choosing. You have to understand something about Zulu character. They never produce half men. Their men are whole men. Their puppets are puppets all the way. <laughs> the Zulu puppet Mpande would rule the Zulus for 32 years, rule or misrule. The Zulu war machine has fallen apart. Mpande is fat and sloppy. He, he does not marry the women assigned from the family designated to train women to marry into the king, the king's uh, household. He marries into the common women because he can discard them easily. He's a fat, beer-drinking, liquor-lapping slob. <laughs> He's overweight, couldn't get out of the way of nothing. He is so naive, and the British wrote out his death warrant because he believed so much in the British, he signed it. <laughs> so all right now, approaching 1870, he is becoming unpopular with the Zulus. He has produced a strong son who is now a favorite among the Zulus. The son is Kechewayo. In two years, so much support is rattled around Kechewayo that he dethrones his father and becomes king of the Zulus. Kechewayo began to punish Zulus for being fat and sloppy starts the Zulu war machine again, sets out to train the Zulu army again, sets out to avenge the reducing of his father to the status of a puppet. He is planning now the war against the British. It took him four years to get it all together. More than four years. He did not fight the, the battle until 1879. He knew the missionaries helped reduce his father to puppetry. So he's going to attack a missionary station, Roki's Drive. Now coming back into Zululand, the Borlong warriors, these related Zulus who had previously fought with Chaka. Now the new leader is coming. Mamboza is old now. Well, I can't say he's old because he's near the age I am now, so I don't think I'm old. <laughs> so the moderately young Mamboza, <laughs> 74 years old, looking like a man of 30, 
<laughs> comes back to offer help. But the condition is that you give his son a command assignment. His son gets the job of leading the troops in the attack on Rocky's Drive, the British Missionary Station. If you see a film on the late, late, late show called Zulu, that's what the film is centered around, that attack. There wasn't about 96 British, the African killed about 200. At the end of the film, there's still 96. <laughs> Mamboza goes to help Cachuayo plan the big battle. Because this battle is, one battle is a rehearsal for the other battle at San Helvina. This battle was so perfect. A few years ago, a publisher wanted to write, help commission writers to write books about the greatest battles in history. The first book was written about as San Helvina, the Battle of as San Helvina. Now, after the missionary fight, this would lure the British in to the camp to face Cachuelo. And he pulled back and let them walk right into his trap. Mounted on this side, mounted on that side, the sea at the back, and facing it was Cachuelo on a horse, just looking at them for three days. Just, just looking at them, scrambling. They can't get out, they can't get in. Nobody can get out, nobody can get in. Finally, he gave the signal for the battle to start. Damn near everybody down there got killed, including Jerome Napoleon. Churchill wrote about this in a book called A Roving Commissioner. Churchill wrote exceptionally well in the years when he wasn't a cigar-smoking senile drunk. <laughs> he held the English language Churchill was a good writer. His other book on the war in the Sudan called The River Wall, I call it the greatest piece of war reporting since Caesar came home from Gaul. He's a man of great talent. When he went to Eden, he couldn't learn French, couldn't learn German. He said, I suppose you just concentrate on the English language. Just learn that and we'll be satisfied. He's a rich boy, <laughs> so you don't tell them too much of what to do. He learned the English language well. So he was a reporter in his early days. So he wrote two books on his reporting in Africa. One, The River Wall, about the battle, the whole, the retake to Sudan. One about the war in Southern Africa called A Roving Commissioner. And he's the one that mentions the fact that Jerome Napoleon was killed in this battle that these Africans had changed the whole structure of the British Empire. Now, Cachuelo would make a mistake, same mistake Nkrumah made. He left Africa at the wrong time. Had Nkrumah stayed in Ghana, nobody would have been able to overthrow him. He could have rallied the people. Nobody would have been able to overthrow him. Cachuelo went to London. Queen Victoria vi uh, received him. The war wasn't too popular in England. British tailors vied for the honor of making him a British suit. And they did. And there's pictures of him in this British suit. Big, fat, tall Zulu. Catch away, yo. Looking utterly ridiculous in the British suit and the top hat. <laughs> the main thing is that when he got back home, the British had split his country into 13 different parts, and he was only king of one part. Finally, they would drive him into, into exile and into suicide. Now the British would breathe easily and said, at last the Zulu has been broken. They had spoken prematurely. They had forgotten that second Zulu empire now under 
the son of Kechewayo, Lo Bengala. Lo Bengala was blocking the path of the British trying to take over mining concessions in this area. An Englishman named Cecil John Rhodes, a consumptive but with consumption of TB, was told if you stayed in England, you might live six months. In Africa, you might live two years. Went to Africa, that good African climate cured him, and he lived for years, stole so much money, finagled so much money, betrayed so much people, they're still trying to count his money. If you understood that, no black man would ever accept a Rhodes Scholarship. All that is blood money. He wanted now to take over the area that the, of the second Zulu Empire, Metabele land and Shono, Mashono land. The people in what is now Zimbabwe are Shonos mixed with Zulus. Remember the 15,000 Zulus who went there, mostly without wives? They married Shona women. So there's no great decision, di di division between them. They're all relatives. But the main thing is that when Cecil Rhodes tried to take over this country, he tried to provoke a fight with, Dink, with uh, Loman Gullah. Cecil Rhodes wanted to build a communication system from Cape to Cairo, a good idea for Africa's purpose, but he wanted to build it for colonial purpose. He accused one of the vassal states under the Borlong, un, under the uh, Shona people, accused them of taking wire from the rail, from the, the communication system, and asked that they be punished. And when they were punished, he asked the British Empire to punish the king because he had punished the people too severely. He faked the war using British freebooters and all that salary was what they could take from the Africans. When they saw the gold bracelets on the African women, they didn't ask to give them to me. They just cut off the arms and took them. So we ain't got nothing to be kind to anybody about but ourselves. This war led to the exiling of Lomengala. His followers followed him into exile. Finally, he told them to go back and make peace with Cecil Rhodes and save their families. In the beautiful poetry that Africans talk sometime, he said, go sweetly, go in peace. There's nothing else I can do for you. We've got another fight, for well, they've spoken prematurely one more time. After the Boer War, some Zulus served as wagon masters and quartermasters and supplies in the Zulu and the British Army. The British said that they would remit their taxes. Instead of remitting their taxes, the British doubled their taxes. Now this would start and provoke the last Zulu war in Natal and other places. This war was partly led by young Zulu king Bambata and an old Zulu Sigananda. When Bambata goes to Sigananda and asks for help, Sigananda is 90 years old, 95 years old now. Sigananda is the oral historian of the Zulus. He, had, he was body servant to Chaka. He was in the, in the army that guarded the grave of Nanda. He went up, when the Zulus wasn't fighting, he went up in the Congo and fought with a dissident king called Tam Tam Anna. 
He came back and he saw the Zulus sitting around pitting themselves and he cursed them out and said, there's no blood on your sword. The imperialists have violated your women, have taken your land. Are you sure you are Zulus or old women waiting to be buried? Then he started his own private war, then went to jail. Now he's back in Zululand and out of jail again. He's head of a small group called the Kubays. He's known as Sigananda of the Kubays, a Sigananda Kube. Now, when Bambada goes to him and asks for help, based on the fact of what help Bambada's father had rendered to him, this angers the old man. He said, I help your father because he was a Zulu and I'm a Zulu. I'm not going to pay this tax. The British want to charge $75 a month for having a dog. He lacks dogs and his sons. He ain't going to pay tax on either one of them. Ding his way, I mean, or, um, Bimbada was called a horse thief because every time he wanted a horse, he'd take a horse from the British. Every time he wanted a cattle, take cattle from the British. So you ain't break no horses, he ain't break no cattle here. They all belong to me. <laughs> so when he wants one, he just takes one. So the British looking for him. He now goes to Denizulu, the last son of Cetewayo. Denizulu said, I don't want any part of this war. I've had enough of the British jails, enough of war. Then he speaks in a loud, secretive, and yet loud enough to be heard across the room. He said that while I won't know part of this war, I've had enough of fighting, enough of jails. If there's anyone in the sound of my voice who wants to help this young man, my eyes did not see his form disappear. My ears did not hear his footsteps as he departed. Standing by as the last of the great Zulu warlords and war planners, Sanjani. He goes now to help Bimbata plan that last Zulu war. And when he go back to Natal, find out what the old man has done, the old man has started his war already. He waiting for the young people to get back. He started the war already. He would fight for nine months. Finally, the British Bimbada would go to the grave of, of Ketchewayo to ask, ask for, pay his respects, as is the custom. Any time you're making great decisions in Africa, you go to the grave of your elders or go to your elders. The British were supposed to have cut him down on the way from the grave. His wife refused to go into mourning. If the British knew enough about Zulu custom, they would have known that Bambada was not dead. His wife said his spirit will come back and lead the Zulu people. He had escaped. He had a dummy on one horse, and he was on another. And he didn't ride as a customary white horse that day. He was a strategist, too. The British killed his dummy, his double cut off the head and displayed it among the Zulus. And all right, this is a lesson for you. You better stop this revolt. It stopped the revolt all right, but it did not send the wife into mourning because Zulu wives, after the husband died, supposed to mourn the rest of their life. But this didn't signal the British the fact that Ben Bottle was not dead. A man named Benny's doing some work on then Zulu discovered that Bimbada escaped and lived in an obscure village in South Africa until 1926. Well, he died of natural causes in old age. Now, in summation, Zulus have played a major role in the transformation of South Africa that was the Zulus in the building of the ANC, a great Zulu in the building of the South African Communist Party. His name was Champion. 
And when someone asked him in the choice between the party and your people, what choice would you make? He said, I will choose my people every time. And when the party asked me, propagated the concept of separate states, the whole homeland concept is now practiced in South Africa, was taken originally from a plan laid out by the South African Communist Party. They may not have known what was going to happen to it, but they designed it first the so-called separate states for different African groups. When they asked um, Champion about separate states and in South Africa with different groups, he said, of course, all of it belonged to we Zulus, so I'll take it all. <laughs> <laughs> the party ex expelled him for being nationalist. And he did not, and when the white head of the party, A.E. Bunting, went to Russia with a delegate, all white, Stalin took him to task. Stalin wouldn't even shake his hand. How are we going to unify? How are we going to have a great party in South Africa? You haven't even got a single African delegate. The next time he went to Russia, he took Champion. Tall Zulu, six feet seven, I mean just a magnificent statue of a man. He only died about seven years ago. He was 90, 97. Another Zulu taken with South African acceptance, taken with his acceptance by the Boers, went to a university called West Water Sarad. And because he was, this was a British run Boer university. You have to understand one thing about the Boers that I should have said earlier. They are Calvinists. And the Calvinists creed is that they are designed, designated by God to look over all lesser breeds. And they don't feel guilty about what they're doing in South Africa because they assume that the African is of lesser breed. Now you would wonder why would anybody belong to the Dutch Reformed Church? And yet you got blacks in the Dutch Reformed Church. <clears throat> you got blacks fighting to join the Mormon Church, and they say we don't we don't have we don't have souls. We can't be priests. We can't be anything. Why do we have to belong to? A whole? Well, anyway, that's another <laughs> lecture. <laughs> Champion continued his course of nationalism. Many times when this course did not go well later on, some Zulus became conservative and some of them are conservative to this day. But the Zulus continued their fight on a different plane. When Mahatma Gandhi was in South Africa, he started fight to unify everybody except the blacks. United Nations League, Natives League, United Colors League. If King understood Mahatma Gandhi, King would have never said he's a follower of Mahatma Gandhi. That's still another lecture. But the Zulu War of 1906 was the last of the wars. This war, the war against the whites had started with the Koshon San people, later called Hottentots and Bushmen. They fought 11 wars against the, the Boers, called Kaffa Wars. Gave a splendid account of themselves. One group was almost destroyed. 
but they did give a good account of themselves. It's before the Zulu Wars, the Zulu Wars of consolidation, then the Zulu Wars of resistance. Chaka was fighting the Zulu Wars of consolidation, trying to bring all Africans together to save them from the domination of the whites. Dingong started the Zulu Wars of resistance. It must be very clear on these wars. And as a result of the Zulu Wars of resistance, the British tightened things in South Africa. All right, after 1906, the stringent laws, the beginning of past laws, was so hard on people in South Africa. The trade union movement, the white trade union movement in South Africa began to bar Africans, still do. Now the Africans had to take on a new organizational structure. A great Zulu, John L. Dubé, the grand uncle of the Ernest Fred Dubé, who's having the problem at Stony Brook. At Westwater Strand, this Dutch university, he now with frock tails on and coat and a bowler hat and in the summertime, looking like a fool. And he was so taken by this white acceptance he wrote a scurrilous book called The Black Man is His Own Worst Enemy. Came and studied at Oberlin for a little while. Finally someone talked some sense in his head. And to his everlasting credit, he spent the rest of his natural life setting the record straight and building. It was John L. Dubay also of Zulu descent, that began to build the ANC and branches of the ANC in every part of South Africa. The foundation builder of the ANC was this Zulu, John L. Dubé. And once that, after his passing, a great Bantu editor John Tingo Jabeview began to build, and a young man from Nyasaland came down into South Africa and began to build a great trade union movement. And this frightened the whites, especially the white laborers, to the point where they had to turn against him. He made a mistake, asked Ramsey MacDonald of London to send people from the British Labour Party to help him administer his union. Ramsey MacDonald used this as an excuse to dump all the sorehead communists out of the movement fighting among themselves to go in South Africa and fight among themselves and wrecking a, and wrecking a black union. And they did. They wrecked the union and almost destroyed its uh, founder, Clement Kadele. Clement Kadele turned to the World Trade Union movement, got some help, but got his best help from A. Philip Randolph. Got published in A. Philip Randolph's paper, The Old Messenger. And if you read the old files of the, of the messenger, read a long article by Clement Kadele on the growth of South African trade union movement. We have just begun to do our research. Now we have gone hurriedly over a large body of information and in trying to set straight some misconceptions of one of the finest military people in all Southern Africa. The Zulus seem confused today and some seem conservative. And there's too much fighting between one 
in the other. But there was a time the Zulu projected the possibility of Africans being the military masters of Africa, being the masters of that destiny and controlling it to the point where there would be no debate about what white people come in or out because those who came in would have to come under African rule and those who could not take African rule would have to go. And what they were projecting is what Africa had before, the concept of the nation state. They were pointing the same kind of direction that Booker T. Washington pointed to, Du Bois pointed to, Marcus Garvey pointed to. The true container for a people's culture, the true container for a people's hopes, the true container for a people's growth and their dreams and their future is a nation state where they control everything. And other people can come in the state and can live in the state if they're willing to live on terms laid down by that people. They pointed to what we would have to do if we would ever be a whole people other than protracted beggars begging for entry into other people's houses, all the Zulu people were saying in their walls, it's the same thing Washington was saying, same thing Du Bois was saying, same thing Garvey was saying. If your soul is ever gonna be peaceful, if your freedom is ever gonna be secure, build your own house. For Southern Africa in the 20th century. That'd be March the 2nd. I'm, by then, I will make up a basic reading list about the Zulu people and about Southern Africa in the 20th century. I will leave it here at the church for reproduction and distribution as they see fit so that you will have before you the basic information about this subject and you can read for yourself and draw conclusions uh, uh, for yourself. I don't know what else I can do. I, I know that sometime in March I have to have um, the one thing I've been trying to avoid is, a, is an eye operation and um, one eye, I'm going to just try one at a time. I ain't going to gamble on losing both of them. <laughs> if that's successful, then I might try the other one. I, I ain't no fool now. I want to stay. <laughs> I want to see, see as long as I can. All right, you can start. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'd like your opinion of now, Butelezi um, started out to be a, a strategist. In fact, I met him earlier when he said that he was going to accept the homeland concept. He's going to accept it as face value, and he's going to see how much sovereignty they're going to permit him to have. And so... He, he even said he's going to invite me to come over and, and help to set up the teaching, this, the educational system. Uh, he hadn't spoken to me about it since. I must have seen him six times since then. But I think he's now a rather conservative puppet. No appreciable value to African people anymore. He's a compromise and but an unnecessary compromise. He could rally and solidify the Zulu people if he would, but he is, uh, I don't see why he contributes anything in a forward way. He's a container and he caters to white conservatism and containment and Zulu conservatism. I don't see him as having anything remotely resembling a revolutionary fervor.
I regret this because I happen to know Butelezi personally. And I happen to talk to him nearly every time he comes to the United States. The last time I talked to him, it was in the armory right here in Brooklyn. We had a long discussion. I came all the way over to make a special point of it, you know, of seeing if I could dialogue with him. Clark, is there any study you've did about the amount of weapons that America supplied to the wars of the British, like the Gatling gun and the other weapons during that time of the war against the Zulus? Well, I know what I, the, the amount I, I do not know about, but I know that America has consistently supplied the weaponry they needed, both to the British and the and the Boers, and that um, South Africa now has atomic weaponry supplied by the United States through Israel. And that the United States really have no interest at all in South African freedom. Introducing killing. They said that prior to him, that they just they would fight, they would kill each other. War games. Yeah. Well, Chaka had a different territory and a different weaponry. While this is basically true in certain areas, but you know, in big battles in African wars, sometimes if if they had 12 casualties, that was a big battle and a big war. Africans had a way of spiring, you know, and sometimes it's almost like a practice campaign, but they, it, it was an actual killing in some cases. He did not introduce killing. There was killing in African wars before Chaka, but it was not massive killing. Chaka's wars probably had the largest amount of casualties in any single African against African war in Africa. I have never tried to cover up this fact, but Charka's mission is still a mission worthy of pursuit. And I think the whites who interpret this interpreted wrongly, he is not the fact he introduced killing, but this is the first time killing on, the, on that proportion has been in an African wars. There, were the, uh, there, were, there have been wars between African and African, but then some wars between African and African starts at sunset, and when it get dark, if you want to go home, you go home. Nobody didn't even notice you're going. <laughs> Africans have been very humane in combat, but they, but they have not tried to fight any people into total destruction. Never. No, he didn't receive it. The Nobel Peace Prize is not given uh, by the British. It's given by the Academy Sweetie. That's Chief uh, Nathule. Nathule. Huh? <laughs> Nathule. Chief Albert Nathule. Uh, I heard recently that the Japanese have been divesting in uh, South Africa. Since everybody, well, mostly American corporations have pulled out. Is that true? I hope it's true, but honorary white people sometimes are as devious as white people in business deals. And the Japanese in South Africa declared honorary whites. If the Japanese pulled out, it would be a great blow. 
it will help a lot in the fight toward freedom. If the Japanese were wise, they would understand that there would be no finer market in the world than a free, well-functioning African continent under its own steam, mastering itself. Because ultimately, Africans are not only going to assemble cars, ultimately they're going to make cars from scratch. They have the engineers, and they have the material right within Africa. And Japan is giving out of said raw material that Africa has in plentiful supply. So if they were wise, the Japanese would strike up a partnership, not just with South Africa, but with African nations in general. So, one more question, please. We as Afro-Americans, I know we spend a lot of money in this country. Are we hurting our brothers and sisters in Africa by spending so much money in the commercial market? We're not hurting them by spending so much money. We're hurting them by the way we are spending it without giving it direction. And actually, we can help the Africans because Africa needs so many things. We could buy for the Africans at certain prices and get it to the Africans so that the Africans will cut down on his outlay of money. But we're both going to have to trust each other a little more than we do right now. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Dr. Clark, mm -hmm. speak a little bit on the um, origins of the Pan-African Congress of Azania and people like uh, Davis and Beckham. Well, the Pan-African Congress of Azania was a young group that broke from the ANC because the ANC was moving too slow, and the ANC was like the NACP, a little on the integrationalist side. The Pan-Africanist Conference, Congress of Azania, said African land for African people, not we share. My country, my land. And they really did not believe in a whole lot of integration that was nothing but white rule in the name of integration. No, David was uh, no different from his party, and I knew him personally. And. Um, he was the best theoretician they had in their last, you know, 10 years. His death was a setback not just for the Pan-African Congress, it was a setback for, for African liberation. I have some misgivings about the ANC and their, some of their supporters. I think they're supporting ANC so that if ANC ever came to power, they could control ANC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One, was, one was more nationalist. Pan-African Congress was more nationalist. And uh, ANC is more left universalist. Whatever that means. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Who was historical documentation? I'm, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a advocate, perspective, uh, interpreter, perspective. But who uh, was historical documentation? Every year, a black man in two volumes, or so And even in the uh, interpretation of the history, you find that. Even when we interpret the history, we find that those issues are violent. I would like to know, uh, since history has been tampered with, you know, presumably, you know, actually it must have been tampered with because you know, the devil tells the truth. But what I, why, if the uh, history has been tampered with, how can we, let's say, find peace by interpreting the history without really, really analyzing the nature of the history? So I, I deal with logic. I say, logically speaking, there's no such thing as a white man being able to help us in a form or fashion. I live in that manner. But see, I don't, I don't hate the person because of this, because I don't hate snakes. But I do, I do believe that 
I'm saying we have to develop some of, some of logic that will make us understand the historical documentation that's being taught to us. And the things that are being taught to us, these are still anything but uh, violence in our solution. All I know is they have peaceful solution to our problems. You know, true interpretation of history because when I'm listening to you, I feel there's some uh, peaceful um, solution. But I can't see it because of the violence that exists in society. Does the peaceful solution to the interpretation of history, but there is not a peaceful solution to the interpretation and the obtaining of liberation. Department will be joining us uh, before the evening is over. I hope, I hope in his efforts to get here that he's all right. But he is not, in fact, here at the moment. And I'm going to extend to him because we've had continuing conversations about this effort and the ideas around this effort and the relationship between the community education effort and the formal education energies that's, that are going on. Um, we've been discussing this since Kemet this summer and when I first approached him with the idea. And Dr. Jeffries has been fully cooperative in this energy. I think, I think he recognizes the value and the relationship of uh, his position as an academician and uh, the relationship of these kinds of lectures in the community. And so I know that, that Dr. Jeffries um, is fully in agreement with our, with our energies and our efforts here, and I was hoping that he would be here to speak on that, but uh, if, if he should arrive at some point, uh, we would hope to have him do that uh, for himself. At this time, I want to talk about uh, the individual who has served as our guide on this 10-week uh, historical uh, and, anal and analysis of our time here in America and in uh, the Caribbean. Uh, each week when I take Dr. Clark home, we discuss one thing or another. Usually he talks, I listen. And um, in the course of our conversations, I actually ran across a book that this dear elder has not read. <laughs> um, and when I mentioned it to him, and he, he mentioned that someone else had, had mentioned the same book to him, and, uh, and he hadn't mentioned it, and I brought the book up, so naturally I rolled my shoulders a little bit, because now we're on ground that he doesn't know, right? So, <laughs> so I was taking full advantage of the fact that I had, in fact, found a volume critical to us as, as a people, or one that, that I am most assuredly impressed with, that this dear brother has not in fact read. And so by way of recognizing that by his having this volume, this man may in fact have read every volume there is everywhere, <laughs> it is with great pleasure that I present to our dear brother, Dr. Clark, the volume, Dry Long So, uh, so I know many of you know it, by uh, John Henry Gwaltney. And I am assuming that with this volume, and I'm sure I'm not far from wrong, that, uh, uh, that this, will, this will mean that this dear brother has read it all. And so I'll take this opportunity, one, 
to introduce and have Dr. Clark begin his lecture for this evening, but also by way of showing our appreciation for his efforts, for his willingness to come and be a part of our energies here, and just for the fact that this profound brother has walked among us and shared with us his very presence. Please welcome Dr. John Henry Clark. a lot of my books. If they pick up the mail before I can get to it, it's a good book that they want to read, they take it. And they give it back to me eventually when they finish with it. All right, just a few front things and we'll get underway. This is the last lecture in, in the two-part series and we become a kind of a family and don't think you're getting rid of me <laughs> because uh, I'll be coming back occasionally on Thursdays uh, depending on my teaching schedule and I'm seriously thinking about just giving up teaching for a while for writing, so that means that I might be a, a Thursday or a Wednesday, depending on what is needed. I promise you an in-depth lecture on the Zulu people. I haven't forgotten it and I won't forget it. <laughs> After the commercialization of but once it was a holy day, I guess we'll start arranging schedules and there'll be a time and I'll come back for that. This Saturday, by way of giving an account of myself, I'll be going to Senegal for a pre-colloquium for the Festide. I'll be delivering a lecture from an extensive paper that has kind of broke my back this last month, Pan-Africanism, a history of an idea in the African world. Because I'm a stickler for what is new and what is different and I wouldn't walk across the street just to do the ordinary. So if I can't write something exceptional about a theme, many times I leave the theme to amateurs and to students. But I looked at this word pan-Africanism because this is the only thing that's going to save us anyway, a world unity of African people. And I looked at some new information I have on the black untouchables of India, numbering more than a hundred million, and how they became untouchables. In the introduction of the concept of untouchability, 
and the large number of African people in the millions in the Pacific. And I looked again at my research file on the destruction of the African people in an island of Tasmania where every single man, woman, and child was put to death. I wondered again about the international position of African people. But in my approach to Pan-Africanism for Senegal, I did not start my approach to the subject with 1900 when H. Sylvester Williams of Trinidad called the first conference in London. I started it 500 years before when slaves on a ship learned what we, we seem to have forgotten, that though they came from different parts of Africa, different so-called tribes, spoke different languages, they all had the same problem and the same oppressor. This very evening, in a meeting at the Caribbean Cultural Center, we were discussing African culture, how to reclaim it. An Afro-American girl says she just beginning to understand her culture and she resent the fact that people just talk about slavery instead of culture. And a Nigerian student, lady, said that she has no culture problem. I'm from Nigeria and I'm acquainted with my culture. And I've had no cultural disruption which proves she's brainwashed by the West. A large number of the slaves who came to the West were Yorubas from Nigeria. Most of the revolts were set in motion by Yorubas, led by Akans from Ghana. Now let me illustrate this for a moment, then I'm going to go, go, into, the lesson, go into the lecture. Toussaint L. Overture was a can, but he didn't set the Haitian Revolution in motion. The person that set it in motion was a Yoruba, a bookman, a priest. The revolt in Guyana, led by Kofi, well led by Kofi. But the man that set it in motion was Ankara, a Yoruba. The Yorubas and their cans develop a partnership away from Africa that they never had in Africa. The same thing is true of the revolts in Brazil. It is the Yoruba culture that held it together. And they couldn't get to them until they broke through that strong Yoruba culture. The main staying power of the revolt in the Western world was Yoruba. When we look at Nat Turner, Denmark Vizek, Gabriel Prasa, we find the same kind of process. Then the young lady said that uh, she understands Thomas Sobel because he said other ethnic groups built stores, factories, and pulled themselves up and see no reason why blacks shouldn't do the same thing. A few years ago in a meeting in Washington, it was, a, it was really a meeting of anti-Zionist Jews and I happened to be one of the speakers. And afterward, some foreigner, a German, came over to me and says, you know, Professor Clark, other groups in America have pulled themselves up by their bootstrings. 
why haven't your people done the same thing? I lost my cool and I said this <laughs> because someone stole our boots, you racist. <laughs> People are expecting the impossible of us pull yourself up by your bootstring and you've got no boots. The neatest trick of the week if you manage to bring it off. <laughs> then this girl said, she said that why don't we, why don't blacks progress like other groups? It's a look. Every group came here looking for something. We were not brought here to be given democracy, citizenship. When the American dream was dreamed, it wasn't dreamed for us. When the American promise was made, it wasn't made to us. At the turn of the century, our family was less than 50 years old because during slavery, it was against the law to have a family. Now you expect our family to be the same as other people's family? We just put it together the day before yesterday? <laughs> now the same man who's judging you and writing the textbooks about you is the man that broke up your family in the first place and made it a law against the law for someone to teach you to read. That's the same man that's calling you dumb. And too many times we accept the blame for a lot of things. A lack of stimulation, a lack of black hero worship. Where are you going to see a black hero? You look at all the television you look at. Where are you going to see a black hero? Remember when Bill Crosby played in I Spy? He couldn't even get a black woman. And when he got one, he lost. <laughs> this is the other guy was knocking over blondes and brunettes all over the place. <laughs> oh no, they, they, then they, they said a black man is a criminal if he have feelings the other way, but the mass media has given him feelings the other way. Because the mass media in 20 minutes can do more educating than other people can do in 20 hours. Right. With our kids looking at all these misconceptions of the hero and never seeing themselves emerge as the hero. He has some misconceptions about himself and his ability to be a hero. In this evening's discussion, talking about culture and how to infuse our culture into the curricula, everybody forgot to emphasize that slavery was a wall on our culture. It was a war on the culture of all the non-European people of the whole world. And that the most cultured people in the world were told they had no culture. And also had no God that was worth worshiping. So the European not only gave you a new psyche, a new mentality, new clothes to wear, a new God to worship, then he didn't have to build jails. His building jails was redundant because he already had you in one and still have you in one. When I look at this beautiful Nigerian girl spouting all this conservative nonsense, but she knows her history already, 
And I just asked her a simple question. How did Nigeria get its name? It wasn't always named Nigeria. How did it get its name? All right, very simple. Near the end of the 19th century, Lord Lugard was governing all that territory for England and the chartered companies, these commercial companies, had their own armies governing each territory, all of them rapers, all of them gangsters. Same as the two gangsters in Washington now arguing over territory. You think you got a friend among them. It's like gangsters, you take the east side, I take the west side, don't you bother my territory, I won't bother yours. They ain't talking about socialism, and one's a socialist. They ain't talking about capitalism, and one's a capitalist. They ain't talking about Christianity, and one's a Christian. They ain't talking about democracy, and another one's supposed to believe in that. They're talking about territory, how to control it, and the fact that the white people of the world have dwindled to one-fifth of the world's population and if they don't watch themselves in bed or out of bed, they, we will discover they are the minority. So once they put it together, they're going to have to ask them for permission. And once we remember the one thing about power is the ability to include and exclude there's a whole lot of people they're going to have to deal with. All right, now back to the subject. Because we have a lot of miseducated African people around the world. And we've got a lot of African people who can be educated overnight. They're so hungry for it. When they had the difficulty in Fiji, and when they discovered that them, some American blacks were interested in that case and some African were inter interested in that case, they said, we thought we were alone in the world. We didn't know we had so many relatives. They had no problem becoming African people. They had no problem relating to the other relatives in the world. Glad to do it. But we're a big family. Now, My talk for tonight, and unfortunately the last in the series, will deal almost solely with the African Americans, the lonely nation away from home. Because the African American is the most misunderstood, most abused, most wounded of all the African people who live outside of Africa. And yet, he is the target for destruction by more forces than any other African people. He's the one African that the Western world won't destroy. Principally because he has grown insensitive to his oppressor and he more than any other Africans have fought in larger numbers for his oppressor and mastered his oppressor's modern war technique. He's also the most dangerous African on the face of the earth because he is the only African on the face of the earth trained in the modern warfare technique called 
combined operations. Combined operations is the art of striking a target, land, air, and sea. No other Africans on the face of the earth have enough training to move on a target with ships, aeroplanes, and infantry. And the black American has been trained to do all three. He wasn't trained to do this to liberate himself or to liberate anyone. He was trained to do this for someone else. But the training is still with him. But he has never converted his training into a liberation army for himself. After World War II, Africa could have picked up almost for nothing one of the finest black air forces on the face of the earth. But because Africa was not ready to do this, their talent deteriorated. Many of the men went busting dishes and clerking and lost all their skill. But I'm saying that the skill and the training to make a modern army was with the black America. And right now, right this very minute, there's been enough black Americans discharged from the U.S. Army with enough modern skill that they can train a modern army for every nation in Africa. This is what makes him the target for the colonialists because they realize if contact is ever made with him, and if he becomes aware of his skills and affect the wedding between his skills in Africa, he could change the world around. He could have stopped the Congo situation. He can revitalize any nation in Africa. Because of his training, he can learn faster than almost any other African on the face of the earth. The question is, why then do we have slums? If he can fix houses, why don't he fix them? Why then do we have dope? Why is his institution deteriorating? Why is he debating is integration instead of maintaining his, his institution because his mind has been trained into dependency. I'm saying that one thing about Jim Crow, one thing about that oppression, it was real. And you had something being built for him, by him, to sustain his institutions and sustain himself. And he had no illusion about the fact that he could depend on someone else to do it for him. There was a time you either went to a black college or you didn't go to no college at all. You went to a black church or you didn't go to no church at all because you were not then and still are not welcome in the white church. And blacks created not only a new church institution but a new religion and a new approach to God and preached as though the God that they were addressing their message to was totally different from the God the white folks were talking about and talking to. Right. They may well be true. Jimmy Swagger's God can't possibly be mine.
This was the survival of African culture. All right. Let's see how the mystery was set in motion and what makes the difference. The difference is not got anything to do with who's got the best brain. The difference has got nothing to do with personal bravery. The difference has got to do with the isolation and the nature of oppression and what each one had to react to. And the difference has got to do with what oppressor left you with illusions and what oppression oppressors did. Now, a few weeks ago, only three weeks ago, in the meeting on Marcus Garvey in Jamaica, I said, because I didn't want to disturb a lot of people by saying it in the public lecture, but in the private gathering, I said, now that the public is not here and we're just here having ourselves some nice Jamaican food and drink together, let's level with each other. <laughs> Marcus Garvey is 47 years dead. If Marcus Garvey were alive today walking in the streets of Jamaica, somebody might stone him to advocating the same thing. And yet what Marcus Garvey advocated is the most important thing that is needed not only in Jamaica, but in the whole of the African world. Now he rarely ever used the word Pan-Africa. And yet he was the ultimate Pan-Africanist, fighting for the unity of the whole of the African world. And as though it was planned, while I was in Jamaica, the very next day, they gave medals to the Jamaicans who participated in the invasion of Grenada. A contradiction to end all contradictions. I explained that he did not succeed in Jamaica principally because the Jamaicans then and now have the illusion of nation. And we in the United States then and now was never given the illusion of nation. They will let us know right now that they don't want us here. And they didn't let us dream that we were part of this nation. They let us know that we were brought to do a set labor. And once the labor was over, we were surplus population. A nation within a nation without a nationality. We were not brought to this country to be given a nationality. We were not brought to this country to be given a status. When they said liberty and justice for all, we were not a part of the all. No one let us dream or think that we were part of the all. When we look at the atrocities against us day by day, they keep saying again and again, not you. When I say American citizen, I don't mean you. <laughs> now, we have, this nation has mortgaged its soul and lived a lie and tells a lie to the world because they dare not face up to the fact 
that you've got a massive nation inside of the United States living in under a condition many times worse than Nazism. The United States can address itself to Russian jewelry, out of a human rights. Don't you think this girl, these cops, uh, rape has human rights? They won't address themselves to any issue of this kind, of this kind. Well, all right, because we have not examined the illusion that went into the original entry in the United States that wouldn't go away. We can't deal with the present because we think that maybe this country has betrayed us. This country has not betrayed us. Didn't promise you anything in the first place. Because they wasn't talking to you. If you're in an English country, they give they give you the illusion that they're talking to you. Read the Mansfield decision on slavery. He who break, touches British soil, breathes British air, becomes a free man. That sounds real good. <laughs> British kept slavery 100 years after that. Mass bill decision. <laughs> you think the British becoming liberal? Nothing. They were freeing the slaves in England because the slave was redundant in England. One didn't need it in England. And either he had to free the slaves or put in England or put down a revolt of the British working class who wanted their jobs. So he didn't free them out of benevolence. He freed them out of necessity. All right, now when we arrived in the country, the country had not worked out its racial pattern. 1619, one year before the Mayflower. And we won't talk about the Mayflower people because they're not exactly my favorite people anyway. And I often tell my students if someone say they come, they came over on the Mayflower, descended from those people, do not laugh directly in their face. <laughs> Cup your head and laugh to one side. <laughs> Have good manners. <laughs> Those were discards, degenerates, thrown out of Harlem, fornicating with the sisters and the mothers in the street. Then they came to America and began to oppress the Indians. Then the governor of the Massachusetts colony wrote back to England, you know, why did you send these people over here? But when we arrived, they had not worked out the pattern. They hadn't even worked out the color scheme. And there were so many poor whites who were indentured servants. And we became indentured servants, not, some, not chattel slaves at first. And so the the white indentured servant and the black indentured servant didn't see any difference in their status, so they got along well and married each other and with no eyebrows raised about it. Poor was poor. And they were all treated terribly in the, in the, in the filthy ships that they brought the, the British indentured servants over with no was about as filthy as the one that brought the Africans over. So now you had to create a color scheme to put the poor whites against the blacks. While when England 
had put the poor white, posed the poor whites against the blacks from the beginning by giving the whites job categories that always made them look above and better than the blacks. And most of these whites were poor Irish. You don't talk about the Irish not as really some of the first of the indentured servants. These poor Irish became the most ruthless slave drivers. Simon Legree and Uncle Tom's Cabin was Irish. We don't examine our literature on the subject because people beat on our head in order to impress someone else there, someone else. To understand what I'm talking about, you have to understand once more the design of the country. White male Protestant, middle class and up, those who agreed with the prevailing political status quo and who own property. Everybody in this country is trying to impress that group. The Jews are trying to impress that group. The Catholics are trying to impress that group. That's the, that is the big rooster in the, in the pecking order. And if you watch chickens in a yard, the big rooster can peck anybody. But instead of pecking him, you peck the next smallest one till you get down to the bitter. But you don't peck, you don't peck the first pecker, <coughs> which is the rooster. This is what you call the pecking order. You pass the peck down, but you don't pass it up. So the Gentile, white male Protestant, is the rooster in the barnyard. He has his way. And if you look at a book called 60 American Families, the richest people in this country falls into that category right now in the same 60 family and their descendants who control the major wealth in the country at the turn of the century still control the major wealth in the country all right now back to what happened to that original group 16, 19 group, about 20. They worked their way out of indenture. They became landowners. And one Anthony Johnson became a slave owner. And why we know so much about this is because Slaves could at that time take their master to court for brutal treatment and one of his slaves had to take him to court. This is why we got a record of it. Now, <coughs> I'm not proud of a black slaveholder, but as a matter of record, there were some black slaveholders. And Carter G. Woodson's um, book on the early black families is additional documentation for this. Now, our history in this country is working our way around all these illusions and assuming that certain promises were made to us that were not made to us taking handouts and crumbs from the table while other groups at other places fare a little better but do not assume that slavery was mild any place. Slavery was different 
And being different does not mean it is less harsh. I mean the slave owner was less crude in his administration of the system, but he still administered the system. He still killed. He still sold families from families. All right, now come the American Revolution. We hear all this talk about liberty and justice for all. We believe some of it. Now, again, we have to go over a neglected but well-documented part of our history. The presence of a large number of Caribbean activists in our movement before the American Revolution and after the American Revolution. Why Prince Hall of Barbados, founder of the Masons? Why Peter Ogden and Tegan, founder of the Odd Fellow? Why Russ Swam, one of the first to graduate from a college, one of the editors of Freedom's Journal? Why Robert Campbell, another Jamaican? who would go out with Delaney and search for a place for settlement. Why this harmony between two African people who don't seem to have much harmony now? Why did they display so much good sense in the 1880s, in the 1800s, and in the 1900s, and we play, and we're talking so much nonsense to each other in in the 1900s, going to the 21st century. What has happened to us? What made these visiting Caribbeans? have a certain kind of nerve and inject a certain kind of sparkle in our movement that wasn't there. They came from a system that gave them the illusion that a free man was free. These were free blacks as against slaves. But a free black in the United States were free in quotes and limited in what he could do. The free black from the Caribbeans were no freer. But he had the illusion that he was supposed to be freer and he acted accordingly. And yet they gave something to the whole movement that wasn't there. They would help set in motion the colonization society. Ruswan would go to Liberia, find the Liberian Herald, a newspaper still in, still in existence. In the 1850s, they stopped coming in any appreciable numbers. And the free black in the United States began to visit them. Because while there was still slavery in Jamaica, throughout the whole Caribbean island, they were free enough to invite black Americans in the struggle to come down and rest up a while. All right, now let's look at the scene they had and the scene we had. And the mental depression brought on by our scene 
in the slight relief brought on by their scene. They were on an island. They were the majority. When you are the majority, though you are a slave, you get the feeling that ultimately you're going to be the master of the land. And that's true because most of the time you are going to be the master of the land. They could go up in the hills of Jamaica and some down for months and almost a year they wouldn't see a white man. There was no place we could go for we, could, we didn't see him or reminded of his awesome power. Now look, look what is happening to that mentality. Willis N. Huggins would say years later, we rise each morning and petition for the right to live to the end of the day. And the next morning we have to petition all over again. Because this is where the phrase going to meet the man. Literally going to get permission to live one more day. But if you're way up in the hills, most of the time you don't see him. So the psychological impact of his presence on your mind is not there. And you know he owns the land, you know he's the master. But physically, you're not looking him in the face every day. So this relieves the mind of being reminded constantly. While in this country, the idea was to drive us stark, raving mad, and he damn near succeeded. You have to understand what happened to these two different people all African people now, one living under one set of people more brutal than the other, still white people, but one is more brutal than the other. One has no tack at all. The British understand slavery is a business, and they handled it as a business. The American was a sloppy businessman. And sometimes he would kill his investor, his investment, unnecessarily. I didn't say the British didn't kill. He killed sometimes to warn others that you better not revolt. Or you better not step out of line. But he didn't kill for frivolous reasons. He killed for control reasons. Kill one to control a thousand. That's thinking. Brutal thinking, but thinking. <laughs> America didn't think, didn't think that way then, don't think that way now. So we had this to contend with. After the American Revolution, now you can see why in the 1850s, we would not only need spokesmen, we would begin to create an intellectual atmosphere in the New England states different. We began to create a church atmosphere that was different. And we had to create it that was different. There were very few independent churches in the Caribbean. They're tied to some European church, Scottish church, British church. There were no need because the missionaries, the Moravians and other missionaries let you in their churches and administered too, but this didn't happen uh, to us. 
So we had no choice but to build the independent institutions because we were working with a different kind of psyche and relationship to the white people we had to deal with. See, more and more we've becoming isolated from the Africans and isolated from the Caribbean people. This is what I mean, the lonely African nation away from home. Still an African people, no different from any other African people when we left. The difference is the nature of oppression and the nature of the oppressor and our reaction to it. All right, slavery was hard in the Caribbean islands. Slavery was hard here. Why didn't the blues appear in the Caribbean islands? Why didn't the spirituals appear? It had nothing to do with the lack of culture. But the blues and the spirituals are part of our self-induced psychiatry. We had to have it. We had to have relief. We developed through our church and through our reading and misreading of the Bible a romance for Jewish, for Jewish people that we still have. We wanted to associate with a people <coughs> who escaped from something. Now you can see why we're saying, go down Moses, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> let your people go. When they become your people? <laughs> tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. <laughs> now who was the Pharaoh? The one your people. Now if you read the real history of the story, it comes out differently. They were collaborators with the invaders of Africa. When the Africans came to power, the Africans said that he if, who whosoever obeys African law may stay. And those who don't want to obey African law, now that the Africans are back in power, have to go. Those were the ones who decided they wasn't going to obey African law. How did they get to be your people? <laughs> go down, Moses. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. <laughs> now, because we do not dig deep enough into African folklore. We don't even know where they hold the first story is recorded about someone parting the sea. We don't know where the, where the Jews copied the story from. And it, they, they copied it and said it really happened. This is allegory. Allegory don't have to be true. Caesar B. the Mill made a fortune out of it. Died with so much money, his great grandchildren won't finish spending it. <laughs> Charleston Heston made a lot of money on it. But if you want to know one of the first African stories about parting the sea, a pharaoh was kind of despondent. And so, in order to cheer him up, he wanted to go on rowing on the Nile. So all the rowers, the lady rowing the boat were beautiful ladies. And so the chief lady rowing the boat up head was rowing. Then she leaned over and dropped her bracelet in the Nile. She stopped rowing. She got despondent. I ain't going to row no more. Lost my bracelet. <laughs> A necklace or something. So the, the magician... Remember, magic had a lot to do with creation of religions. There's a two-volume work, Religion and Magic. 
All right. And so the, the magician was wrong. She told him. She dropped her necklace or bracelet. He said, oh, right, right. So he stepped out, parted the oak, parted the knob. Then he got dry, reached down, picked up a bracelet, gave it to her. Water came down, and she rode the boat on, and everybody was happy. That's the first story. That story was 3,000 years before the Hebrew entry. <laughs> but if you look at African literature, you can find a duplication of all these stories. And I think some of our spirits will be changed around. Marilyn Anderson was singing a story in Egypt and the Egyptian asked her to stop. I mean the Arabs. There's no such thing as Egyptians. Egyptians don't rule Egypt. Arabs rule Egypt right now. The Arabs weren't even a people when all this was happening. So they had nothing to do with no, none of the greatness of Egypt. The Arabs didn't have nothing to do with it. He was the one that came in and robbed all those graves and stole all that gold. And, and took some of the stone and built mosques. Some of the mosques are still there. So you call the Arab and Egyptian, you're wrong. But uh, we got a whole lot of misconception. Another one is in the song, uh, Deep River, My Home is Over Jordan. How did your home get to be over Jordan? <laughs> Beautiful song. <laughs> you should have heard Marion Anderson in her great days. God, she could put you there. <laughs> that was a singer. Pity she didn't record more. Pity Roland Hayes didn't record more either. What I'm saying is that a circumstance of history shaped each one of us a separate way. And today, sometimes when we are boasting among ourselves, all we're saying is my slave master was better than your slave master, which is the most stupid argument that people can ever have. If you're against slavery, then no slave master is good. You get to a beige and would say that his slavery was mild and in Barbados in comparison to in Jamaica. So who in the hell cares? What difference did it make was still slavery? Slavery wasn't mild any place. Slavery was hard every place. All right. There was a time in Barbados when the rich planters took up all the good land and the poor planters slaves and all picked up and settled along the sea island of Georgia and, and the cheap land along the American coast of the south and the people that they brought with them spoke a combination of English and African this is the origin of the Geechee the Geechee is nothing but a Bayesian. <laughs> and I've had a Bayesian language check it out and prove it positively to be true. But it wasn't a mild situation there either. But I'm saying that that first half of the 19th century, the newspaper building period, the, 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 the magazine building period, the slave narrative building period, none of this happened in the Caribbean. And if none of this happened in the Caribbean, it had nothing to do with one person's mentality being different from the other. One's illusion and one's condition dictated one thing, and another condition dictated another. Because we were living under the most brutal of all oppressors, we would get an outlet in the spirituals and in the blues. 
we would sing our way out of it or try to pray our way out of it. Or we would adopt other people's folklore and fasten ourselves to it any place to soothe ourselves or to even pretend that ultimately we would be free. Now on the eve of the Civil War, it was the black abolitionists too often neglected Douglas and others that solidified the cause and made the issue of slavery an emotional issue on the eve of that war. Then you look at the Caribbean islands on the eve of emancipation and look at the United States on the eve of the Civil War in emancipation. You're looking at two different stories. You're looking at two different stories because two different people both Africans are acting, are reacting to oppression in a different way because they've got different oppressors and must act in a different way and have no choice but to do so. African Americans would go into that war and in one battle alone win 16 Congressional Medals of Honor. It had never been done before. Why did they fight so bravely for a nation that had betrayed them and that still betrayed them? They had the illusion that if they show their manhood, maybe someone will reward them with the concept of citizenship. It was a gamble. But the gamble didn't totally pay off, didn't totally lose either. Because after the Civil War, there was 11 years of pseudo-democracy. Blacks came to power briefly in the South, congressmen, two senators, Males, more, more males in the South than they've got right now. Males in cities in the South that have no black males now. Gather us to Texas and a whole lot of places. The position of male is one thing, but blacks had certain key state positions in the South during this period that they don't have now, like state position, state director of the state treasurer, head of the state parties, solicitor general on a state level. Now immediately after emancipation, you want to know where did all these educated blacks come from? Some of these blacks were mulattoes, in fact most of them were, whose white father had staked them to an education, even sent some of them to medical schools in Edinburgh, Scotland. They were the leaders mainly because they could read and write and this explained why most of the leadership that appeared in black America immediately after the Civil War were light complected. This was not a thing like design. Now if you look at Jamaica, it was a thing of design. In the United States, it was a thing of convenience. I'm not passing judgment on either one. I'm merely stating a fact. Mavis Campbell, who I talked to today, a brilliant Jamaican journalist, and researcher in her book, The Jamaican Colors, A Social Political History, done the best job on color manifestations in early 19th century Jamaica until the beginning of the 20th century. 
All right, the second half of that century, we faced some problems that we haven't dealt with and finished dealing with to this day. We had been betrayed. There had been an attempt to sell us back into slavery. The promises of the Reconstruction had been betrayed. And the white friends we had in Congress, it was really only two, one in Congress and one a senator, Thaddeus Stevens and Sumner, had been blocked off. Not much we could do. Liberia had been settled. The colonization movement was underway. A little known movement we need to study again, the Negro Convention Movement was meeting every year. We are the meetingest and the talkingest people in all the world. We call more meetings, pass more resolutions, and get less done than any people in the world. We will meet and vote and forget what we voted for. We were meeting then our lodges, women branch, men branch. But that last 25 years, we begin to face reality and shared illusions as we never done before. Bishop Turner on the scene, the fiery Georgia Presbyterian, back to Africa advocate the whole concept of back to Africa before Marcus Garvey the chief Sam movement another back to Africa movement that appeared in Oklahoma chief Sam was a Ghanaian who's gonna sh get some ships and take all of us back the ships never appeared a lot of people sold that material, gathered at Galvester, Texas, waiting for the ships to come to take them away. Ships never appeared. They had to go on back home, shame of face, and buy some more furniture and try to live in America. When I say that we are the loneliest nation, we are the lonely African away from home, we are the ones who were invited to the United States and when we finished laboring the labor the job became obsolete to this day no African nation has invited us to come home officially the same as Israel had a law that any Jew who wants to return can return. Africa has no such law. Not one nation in all Africa. And yet Africa has more space than Israel. One thousand times more. In fact, all black Americans fit into one corner of the Sudan and they wouldn't miss the space. Under proper cultivation, they, we feed ourselves there too. But the African has been brainwashed into not inviting us home. So we came into the 20th century with illusions. We came into the 20th century with hope. We came into the 20th century changing leadership and arguing about old leadership. It was the Booker T. Washington period. It's the beginning of the Du Bois period. It was a period of the radical black journalists, especially T. Thomas Fortune and Monroe Trotter. It was an outspoken period. It was also a period of riots. Until we 
entered the period of the First World War. Marcus Garvey would arrive soon after. He would challenge Du Bois as the center of leadership. And he would succeed where Du Bois had failed, principally because Marcus Garvey could reach an audience that Du Bois could not reach. Du Bois, with his Oxford accent, his Harvard accent, he was always correct, but he did not reach out in such a way to entice the masses of people. What Garvey brought was some illusions taken from his growth in Jamaica. The dream of ships, the dream of nation, the dream of wholeness and a concept that came out of his maroon background the idea of redemption and the idea of avenging old wrongs he was listened to by millions of people principally because he spoke a language and had a spirit that instantaneously communicated what many of the in other intellects did not. We're not dealing with right or wrong, we're dealing with appeal. There had been great men of appeal in this country, but none the equal of a God. Bishop Turner's Preaching was mostly in Georgia in the southern area. Du Bois was mostly among the intellect and the people he called the talented ten. A lot of blacks did not read Monroe Trotter's The Boston Guardian. Nor did they read The Age on another great journalist, T. Thomas Fortune, who many times wrote speeches for Booker T. Washington. Blacks entered the war and came out with more illusions. In the 20s, Marcus Garv is getting a massive organization underway. Now there's several political strings running side by side as a literary organization a movement called the Harlem Renaissance. Marcus Garvey is the political stimulants for that Renaissance. He's given the lonely nation away from home a reason for being. So they invest in his ships, in his schemes. And while they regret having lost a lot, they did not cry because he gives them a meaning, a stimulants for living different from anything they ever had in their life. It is a lie to say that Marcus Garvey found black America with a wishbone and gave them a backbone. They had a backbone before. They fought before and they fought hard. But he had a way of communicating, a charismatic way of communicating that made them think of things that they had never previously considered. And that was one of his great gifts. After his difficulty going to jail and being deported back to his native Jamaica, America would soon go into the depression. He would be forgotten until the Italian-Ethiopian War. During the Italian-Ethiopian War, he would remind us 
and we will remind ourselves we need to reconsider what he had been said about nation because no people can be whole without a concept of nation and nation formation and he understood something and this is why he was successful in building the largest mass organization ever right here in the United States he could never have built it in Jamaica couldn't build it in Jamaica of that day couldn't build it in Jamaica of this day because the Jamaicans had the illusion that they have a nation we had no illusion we had no illusion about being wanted in this country because the Americans have, have let us know we were not wanted so a drowning man when you throw him a rope he have no time to analyze who threw the rope he pulls on the rope you don't try to grab both ends of it either all we knew that we needed some form of rescue and we were desperate people now as we moved into the period of the depression the depression literally solidified our ranks but it was the Italian Ethiopian war that made us think of nation again made us think of wholeness the protection of nation made us relive some of Marcus Garvey's teachings about nation and nation structure and it was with this and with all the misgivings that we entered another war with doubts and wondering what we would get out of it but we had no enthusiasm for the Second World War and didn't suspect that we would get anything out of it. This is why after the war when the Supreme Court decision about segregation 1954 we were rather cynical. We didn't believe it because we thought that some hidden thing behind the whole thing and really wasn't going to work. We were right, it didn't. They haven't integrated the school and not going to. In all places, they're not completely integrated and not going to be. And we were so happy, we let so many of our institutions go but as the freedom rides got on the way the civil rights movement got on the way the African independence explosion got on the way this was about nation and here is what we needed to make a reassessment March the 7th 1957 when Nkrumah announcing the independence of Ghana said at last the long night is over Ghana our beloved country is free forever we needed all of us needed to sit down and reassess our approach we need to reassess pan-Africanism pan-Africanism a motherless child wandering away from home had found a mother, had found a geography. Pan-Africanism now could be tied to geography. It became now a meaningful ideology for the survival of African people everywhere. We did not make the reassessment. We did not see the connection. And yet a brilliant Trinidadian saw the connection George Padmore and he couldn't get this connection 
couldn't get his idea across. He became advisor to Kwame Nkrumah. Really, he was advisor to him for, from about 45 on. 49, 59, he was dead. When we look at the ideals that went into the African Freedom Movement and the ideals that, uh, that, that, that mashed with the Civil Rights Movement, the ideals that went into the Caribbean Federation, part of the same ideals came from the fertile mind of George Padmore. The tr Trinidadian aristocrat, really, even changed his name so his other family, the rest of the family wouldn't get confused and get put upon because of his radical activity. Came from the nurse family in, um, in Trinidad. My main point here is that we have to think now where all of us will go, but principally we have to think of what's going to happen to the loneliest African nation away from home. Numbering about 40 million people with the best technical training of any African people living outside of Africa. The target for dope, all kind of crack, all kind of crack and wise crack and everything. <coughs> Jimmy Carter wanted to reduce their population. AIDS is another way of reducing their population. I'm saying that of all the African people in the world, the ones in the United States is the greatest and most tragic target. The ones in the United States presents the greatest problem to those who wish to control the mineral wealth of Africa, which to control African people everywhere. You ain't gonna have no problem with any African people who announce in the headlines that they're giving medals to those who invade Grenada and not one word of protest about it. You ain't gonna have no problem with that. You ain't got no problem there. You got no problem with people who would boast that England is no longer part of the, our protection, but America's here with our flat tops and our sh aeroplanes, so you mess with us, America will do you in. Always done is sla change slave masters. You ain't got no problem with people like that. In the United States, you have a group of people with enough technical knowledge to change a continent around, but their mind is so full of misconceptions, and sometimes their body is so full of dope, they can't do what they need to do. And this is all on a purpose to set them up so that they cannot make that connection with Africa. Once that people straighten themselves out, develop an internal force to police the action in their own communities, clear up for themselves, because nobody else is going to do it for them, even if we have to have a, an internal police force, whether we did admit it or not, charge the church with the role of getting across a new message to the people other than just praying. There's some spirituality in the revitalization of a community and opening up boarded up houses and fixing them and taking welfare people out of hotels and giving their children a healthy environment 
Once we discover what we can do ourselves, study Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Marcus Garvey, and the concept of nation, <coughs> the one thing that they do not want to catch on among us is the concept of nation. They have trained us into dependency. We keep worrying about what other people will do for us. We need to stop thinking. And once we begin to do things for ourselves, we can force these other things. We have to have everything that goes into the making of a nation. We should have the equivalent of it. There's enough of us. 40 million people. We should have at least three symphony orchestras, seven theater groups, national, 30 clothing factories, all kind of farms. If you're going to wear wool, then you should have some sheep. <laughs> when you wear cotton, you should have a cotton field. A lot of them own it. I don't mean work on it, own it. <laughs> And we will have all of these things once we began to see ourselves as an African people who must protect ourselves as an African people. I call this the essential selfishness of survival. All people on the face of this earth practice this. And we are late in learning it. That's tomorrow's work and today's work too. If we are tomorrow's people, then we must prepare ourselves to sustain ourselves. And we cannot go into another century asking other people to do for us. In one of her last speeches, before she died, Mary Clyde Mathum said, we must change from a people begging and pleading to a people insisting and demanding. If our peoplehood is to emerge and to be part of the humanity of the world, if we are to build nations again and to project ourselves again on the world, there's no one to do it but ourselves for ourselves. We are not only capable of building a new humanity for ourselves, we are capable of building a new humanity for the world. But let's start with ourselves. You can change the world if at first you change yourself. Thank you very much.
more than 10 weeks, but doing these 10 lectures. The importance of knowledge is exemplified by the importance of the effort made to keep us aware, unaware of our own history. And even if we are not, um, by our very understanding, knowing this, it is true that the effort that has been put forward and continues to be put forward to keep us from ourselves uh, speaks of the importance of our knowing ourselves. And so the message that is Dr. Clark's, the message that is um, consistent with so many of the scholars in our, in our communities is doubly important because of our need for it. 